Greetings from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and Happy New Year to all our brothers and sisters and our email recipients in Australia, South Africa, Germany, Lebanon, Canada, Alaska, and of course, the lower 48. By the grace of God, we will begin this year, 2014, to introduce a number of lectures from the book of Daniel. And this out of obedience to our brothers and sisters from Manhasset, New York, who requested some studies from the Old Testament, and uh, more specifically from a prophetic book. The Old Testament is a great gold mine, little known to most of us. Many of us gravitate towards the New Testament, but unfortunately, a lot of us are unfamiliar with the books of the Old Testament. It is a little bit more difficult to understand. Uh, we do need to have some uh, feedback from our church fathers, and also we have to use some commentaries now and then. But it would be good to at least just read it at least once in our lifetime. The book of Genesis, Exodus, the Psalms of David, Proverbs, Wisdom of Solomon, the books of the prophets, these are real jewels of the Holy Spirit, real gold, more precious than gold, according to King David, who teaches us that the gold of this age is limited. It's less precious than the gold called the Word of God. The Word of God is more precious than the earthly gold, which is not available to everyone, only to the very rich, and it changes in value every so often. The Word of God is full of life. It includes the recipe for the good life. And this is the reason why our reincarnate Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity, took flesh. He came so we can begin to acquire the true life, the life that he gave us. I came so that you may have life, not just any life, the Lord says, but abundant life. In a zoin echosi, I came so the works of my hands, my rational sheep, can have abundant life. Now, some of our fellow citizens and neighbors mean well when they say that they want to live life to the fullest. And that's understandable because life is a precious gift. But the truth is that we do not know how to live this thing called life. Without the knowledge of God, Living life to the fullest usually means indiscriminate pleasure, lawful or unlawful, loose living, a life of passions, a life that leads to eternal death and separation from the author of life, a life of bondage, according to St. Siloan. St. Siloan teaches that we can only have true freedom when we are united with God. A young man visited St. Siloan and he was speaking about freedom, you know, the type of freedom that, uh, you know, we hear about in, on college campuses, politically motivated type of freedom. And the saint told this young man, who doesn't want freedom? Everyone wants it, but you must know where and how to find it. To become free, you must bind yourself. The more you bind yourself, the more free you will become in spirit. You must first bind your passions so they don't rule over you, thus harming yourself and those around you. Usually people want to be free to do whatever pleases them momentarily. But this is not freedom, but slavery and bondage to sin. Sin becomes the cruel master. The freedom to sin to fornicate, to be loose, to get drunk, to despise and blackmail and kill and maim and the like. All these things do not describe freedom, but bondage and slavery. As the Lord said, he who sins is a slave of sin. Sin and passions become the master. And much prayer is needed to be freed from this terrible bondage that's so widespread in our days. 
We believe that true freedom is achieved by avoiding sin and by loving the Lord and your neighbor with all your heart and all your strength. So once again, we will begin to offer a lecture series from the Old Testament. And I suggest that the book of Daniel, because it is a wonderful book, has so many great stories. It's familiar to most of our people because on Great Saturday, we read a number of uh, sections from the book of Daniel. Some of the readings have to do with King Nebuchadnezzar and also uh, the three youths in the fire, the song of the three youths. Most of you are familiar with uh, the service of Holy Saturday. I believe we will all be able to benefit from the resolve of Daniel and his companions, the three youths, and will not shy away from some of his amazing prophecies, which were fulfilled with astounding accuracy. Messianic prophecies, interpretations of dreams, and eschatological prophecies leading all the way to the appearance of the Antichrist and to the second coming of Christ. All this in the book of Daniel. Now, Daniel's life is not much different than the life of Moses, Joseph, the 11th son of Jacob, Tobias, the son of Tobit. All these Old Testament personalities excelled in captivity away from their country, in lands of idol worship, and outside of their natural talents, they all had a common secret, a common denominator, their unshakable faith in the true God of Israel. They loved God and his commandments to the point of death. They valued the laws of God more than their own life. The jail that Joseph chose over the favors of his master's adulterous wife was no different than a death sentence. Very few inmates made it out of that jail alive, but God was with Joseph. Likewise, 400 years later, Moses rejected the life of the palace, choosing rather to share in the sufferings of his people. He considered reproach, abused, suffered for Christ, a much greater treasure than the earthly pleasures of Egypt. Tobias and his father Tobit lived in Nineveh with the Assyrians, but God protected them because they chose the law of love. They risked their own lives by breaking the inhumane laws of the Assyrians. The Assyrians used to throw their own people, the Jews, they threw him outside of the uh, walls of the city uh, for the animals to eat. They refused them a burial. And Tobit and Tobias used to go secretly to bury these uh, poor people give them a, a decent burial according to the law of Moses. Of course, this was a great risk because they would have lost their lives if somebody uh, would betray them. In the same way, the life of Daniel offers us the same principles. The precise adherence to the first commandment of God, which is to love God more than ourselves. This was Daniel's secret to his great success in Babylon. He took God with him. God was constantly in his mind before him. And God who glorifies his servants, not only eternally, but very often in this life as well, has made Daniel a worthy role model for all people who want true success in their life. And especially for our teenagers, because Daniel was about 17 years old, you know, when he was first exiled into Babylon. Daniel's adventure began around 605 BC. The North Kingdom of Israel was dismantled and subdued by the Assyrians around 750 BC. 150 years later, the Assyrians were losing ground to the new superpower, Babylon, and the king responsible for the glory and expansion of Babylon 
is the new world leader for that time called Nebuchadnezzar. The book of Daniel is mainly concerned with the exile of the Jews and how they survived under foreign oppression. I think we will benefit if we uh, just take a look at what the historians say about the events around that time. In the year 605 BC, under the reign of Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar, the heir of the throne of Babylon, invaded Judah and forced Jehoiakim into submission. As part of training in the service of the empire, Daniel and his three companions were among the first noble captives to be taken back to Babylon. Now, we, in order to understand the significance of the 70-year captivity, we need to look back in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 25. The 70 years is a time period decreed by God because for almost five centuries, his people had failed to keep the Sabbath years set forth in Leviticus. Let's just read Leviticus 25 so we can understand what these Sabbath years were. And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest, you shall not reap nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is a year of rest for the land. Now, this might be a little bit difficult to understand, but on the sixth year, God would give his people a bumper crop. In other words, the harvest would be twice as much in the sixth year, so they would have enough crop and enough supplies to last and to be fed during the seventh year. Now, we see here this beautiful principle of detachment from material things. You know, this is God's pedagogical training. And we see this all through the Old Testament. God always keeps something for himself, according to our elder Athanasius Michelineus. Not because God needs anything. God needs absolutely nothing but to help us, to help his people, to have their trust in him and not on the works of their hands, not on their land or their crops or their bank accounts, so we can avoid the plight of the rich fool who needed to tear down his barns to build new ones, according to one of our gospel readings on one of the Sundays throughout the year. This man became an idolater because his gold, his crop, his barns was really, he became his God. So the problem with idolatry is that we stop trusting on God and we put our trust on our possessions, on our gold, on our belongings, on our land, and on our, on our trade or, you know, on our talents. And of course, this is idolatry and very dangerous for the human soul. So in the year 605 BC, God permitted Nebuchadnezzar to come up against Israel and force Jehoiakim into submission. Nebuchadnezzar then placed on the throne of David Jehoiakim's uncle, Zedekiah, the son of godly king Josiah. 
in the course of time, in spite of many warnings from the prophet Jeremiah, Zedekiah rebelled and the Babylonians laid siege to Jerusalem once again on January 10, 587 BC. This siege produced devastating famine and pestilence within the city, which finally fell to the Babylonians on July 9, 586 BC. They wrought terrible destruction to the city, burning down the temple several weeks later on August 1st, the ninth day of the Hebrew month of the same day of the same month that Titus destroyed the second temple 656 years later in 70 AD, as we will see uh, this being prophesied in the chapter, nine chapters of Daniel. Again, Zedekiah was listening to the false prophets who were telling him that, no, you can, uh, you can go up against uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and he failed to listen to Jeremiah, who told him that, no, uh, we will be captives for 70 years because we violated the law of the Sabbath year. King Zedekiah was eventually captured by Nebuchadnezzar, of course, and the last sight he had before having his eyes put out was to see his two sons executed. So it came to an end, the glorious reign of the sons of David. In the book of Daniel, the exile of the Jews in the Babylonian captivity and their return to the land of Judah under the Persians is the backdrop of the drama of a greater captivity and a greater deliverance. Through a series of visions, God proceeds to unfold his plan for his people. The 70 years of exile would come to an end with the fall of Babylon, but the true liberation of Israel and the restoration of the fallen house of David would take place not 70 years, but 70 times 7, 490 years later, as we will see in the ninth, ninth chapter of Daniel. And now we will read the biblical account of the fall of Jerusalem. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. And this is an amazing key to the theological interpretation of history. God intervenes in human history. The Lord gave Joachim, king of Judah, into the hand, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. So the Lord who had Archangel Michael watching over Jerusalem suddenly pulled away his protection. He handed the keys to the city to Nebuchadnezzar. Now this might be hard to understand. Why would the Lord allow a heathen to come and take over his holy city? and take some of the holy vessels all the way back to Babylon. God did this because his people walked away from him. They walked away from the true God. They were seduced by idol worship. This is a very heavy sin for a nation that experienced the powerful presence and benevolence of God like no other nation of that time. And in reality, the real purpose behind the empire of Babylon in the book on Ezra was to save the seed of Israel from corruption. The rulers were so corrupt, the priests of the people and the scribes were worshipping idols in the temple of Solomon, according to Ezekiel. In one of the visions of Ezekiel in chapter 9, Ezekiel saw the priests and their wives, and they were worshiping idols. Now, this should be very familiar to us because we saw the same thing in our country 
of, of Greece in the last 35 years where some of us were born. When people walk away from God, then God will allow the separation, even from one's country. The Babylonian captivity was really a great measure from God to save the pious seed of Israel. In the same way, when people walk away from God, God will use every measure possible to save his pious seed, the people who are going to continue the tradition of the true God. So Nebuchadnezzar took over 10,000 of the nobles and the higher echelon of uh, Jerusalem into Babylon. God sent prophets there, and of course, Daniel, because of the power of the God of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar now respects the God of Israel and allows some basic freedoms to the Israelites to worship their true God. When people are separated from their country, usually there are feelings of nostalgia for their early years, and uh, this makes the immigrants uh, when they go away to a different land, very zealous for their traditions, ethics, and religious beliefs. Something that we also witness here in America, Australia, and Canada, where some of our Greek Orthodox here are much more zealous and more pious than the Greeks in our mainland Greece. So God pulled his protection and grace from Jerusalem because its citizens walked away from the true God. Again, they were seduced by idol worship, a very heavy sin. And the three youths who accompanied Daniel to Babylon will offer this great prayer to the God of Israel while being thrown in a furnace for refusing to worship some golden image built by Nebuchadnezzar. They pray, Thou, Lord, hast executed true judgments in all that thou hast brought upon us and upon Jerusalem. For we have sinfully and lawlessly departed from thee and have not obeyed thy commandments. So God had warned the Israelites for years and centuries to repent. Prophet after prophet had warned them about captivity to other nations. They failed to believe that when a nation departs from God, when people live a hedonistic life, they hand the key of their safety over to their enemies. God allows or hands the key over to people or demons to afflict them so they can come to their senses. God had warned the Israelites 900 years before through Moses. He told them that a nation will come from the north and conquer them if they don't obey the commandments of God. Prophet Isaiah, Prophet Jeremiah, Ezekiel were considered traitors by the apostatizing Jews. They warned them repeatedly, unless you repent, God will give you over to the hands of of the Babylonians. So at 600 AD, God's forbearance was exhausted due to lack of repentance. And now I will quote Father Athanasios Mytilineos, who was teaching the high school students of Greece in Larissa. And this is what he said about 32 years ago. In the same way, my dear children, Christ himself is going to hand our land, our country of Greece, over to our enemies and foreigners. When? I don't know when. But it will happen if we don't repent. I pray that we repent because a nation that goes away from God faces a number of evils, enemy attacks, hunger, unrest. This is what the elder was saying in October 1981, the same year Greece entered the European Union, blinded by the promises of the Europeans. Along with the commerce and trade agreements, Father Athanasius told over and over again, along with the commerce and trade agreements, the ethics of Europe will slowly be imposed on the Orthodox country of Greece. The false promises, artificial wealth, and the material, materialistic European lifestyle quickly eroded the phronema of the average lukewarm Orthodox, and the average Greek became enslaved to a hedonistic lifestyle. 
30 years later, the yoke of the Europeans has become unbearable for thousands of Greeks who committed suicide in the last several years of the so-called economic crisis. This is the, the bitter fruit of apostasy. Hundreds of thousands of our educated youth have abandoned their country to find work all over the world. And now I think it would be good to show that the prophetic gift is still in the Orthodox Church. Prophecy is a great tool because only God knows the future. And it is an indication that a church has the Spirit of God and the church is alive when we still have prophets in that church who prophesy things that will happen 20, 30, and 50 years later, just like with Father Paisios and uh, Saint Porfirios now, who was just uh, sanctified a few weeks ago. And of course, so many of the other elders you know, that we met and read and were fed with their uh, teachings. Father Paisios of the Holy Mountain saw the economic crisis that the Greeks are uh, living right now, 30 years before, if not more. And this is what has been published in his book, Vessel of Election. This book was published, published in 1996 by monk Christodoulos, monk of the Holy Mountain Christodoulos. I don't know if this book uh, has been translated in English. I know the first one was, but this is the second volume. And on page 421, this is what the elder says. The Europeans imposed on our country of Greece a huge public debt, so immense, which not only we will not be able to pay, but we will be unable to keep up with the interest payments. After this, they are seemingly justified to impose draconian economic restrictions to snuff out the life of our people until the end. They will continue to impose new economic sanctions, unbearable taxes, and many other restrictions to make our people indignant and to the brink of despair. Our people, under this unbearable pressure, will be seeking some relief, but this time the Europeans will be relentless until our people bow down their heads all the way to the ground, declaring total submission to their new European system. Our European bosses will be saying, yes, we understand your dilemma, but you have such a huge debt and your wealthy are guilty of tax evasion. So you must accept our new electronic system, our new police system, so we can police your over-economic activities, so we can begin to wipe out tax evasion. So 600 years before Christ, Nebuchadnezzar emptied all the treasury of Israel, and he took all the gold back to Babylon. And today, the new Nebuchadnezzars, called the European Monetary Fund or the International Money Changers, they will devise all kinds of artificial debts on nation after nation to extract their lifeblood and their natural resources in a seemingly legal an acceptable way, of course. So Nebuchadnezzar was a mastermind. Uh, his methods having been copied by many future emperors and dynasts. When he entered a country, and this was the case with Israel, he searched and found and apprehended the most intelligent, good-looking, and healthy young men from the upper classes, and he carried them back to the university of Babylon, so to speak, to educate them with the philosophy of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans were quite advanced in philosophy, poetry, philology, astronomy, and mathematics, and the Chaldeans used the heptatic numeric system. We find glimpses of this in, uh, in the Revelation and even in uh, Leviticus, where we have uh, cycles of seven. 
even the Lord used the 70 times 7, 70 heptads. This would be the number of times that we're supposed to forgive our brother. 70 times 7. In chapter 9, Daniel will write the prophecy of the 70 weeks as we read in English, but it is not 70 weeks. It is 70 heptads. It's 70 times 7, 490 years, where Daniel will point, pinpoint with mathematical accuracy the birth and crucifixion of Christ like no other prophet has been able to do in the Old Testament. So the British uh, use a numeric system based on the dozen where we get 12 inches uh, or a foot. And of course, the metric system uses cycles of 10. The Romans prefer cycles of 5, 5, 10, 15, 20, and so forth. The Pythagoreans, the number 12, and we see that in the book of the Revelation where 12 times 12 144,000 becomes uh, a number of perfection or a symbolic number. So the Chaldeans developed much scientific knowledge in their day. And this needed to be adopted by the higher echelon of the conquered nations under the auspices of Nebuchadnezzar. Once the elite of a conquered nation was educated and trained in the Chaldean mindset, then they would be sent back to govern their own country under the Babylonian Union. And of course, they would collect the necessary taxes imposed upon them by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Egypt would be governed by Egyptian youth, Palestine by Palestinian youth, and this paradigm was followed by the Romans, the Turks, and even Hitler during World War II. He had Greek citizens trained in Germany to come back and help him govern Greece during the years of German occupation. So this sort of university training took place in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar, in the royal complex. And the king appointed these young people his new trainees, a daily provision of the king's menu, the foods that they thought would be best for them, and also the best wine, which uh, the king also drank from. So nourishing them for three years, and of course educating them, and after three years they would present themselves in front of the king so they would be tested. So they would be schooled daily in the knowledge of, and the ways of the Chaldeans, and they would partake of the royal nourishment, the best of foods, the best of meat, fish, proper exercise. So once again, they would become very successful young men and worthy to serve the king of Babylon. Now, out of all the Jewish children captured during the siege, they chose Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to be brought up in this royal university. Once they were led into the palace, they changed their names. Now, this may sound insignificant. Of course, they were in a different country, different language, so they needed to have Babylonian names. But their Jewish names were based on faith. Daniel in Hebrew means, God is my judge. The name Balthazar, his Babylonian name, was meaningless, and most likely was one of the names of the idols of Babylon. So uh, this kind of rings a bell because we do the same thing as Greek Orthodox. I don't know about, you know, the other uh, ethnic uh, Orthodox in this country, but, uh, you know, we're very guilty of this where Angeliki becomes Jean, Demetrius becomes Jimmy, uh, Constantine becomes Gus, Penelope becomes Penny. We take on meaningless names to replace the names of our great saints. Saints that, you know, gave their body and blood for Christ. Names that we received during our baptism. So along with the change of their names, they also needed to change their food intake. They had to eat meats sacrificed to idols 
which violated the Mosaic Law. They were required to eat uh, meats from certain animals that were forbidden by the law of Moses, such, like, uh, such as rabbit or pork. Now, the Jewish tradition also had certain days of fasting that needed to be abandoned in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. This presented a dilemma for Daniel and his three companions, who could have easily rationalized and compromised what some of us would easily do today. Well, what can we do? We're hundreds of miles away from our home. Uh, we need to work. We need to be obedient to the king. We are captive, so let's just do what they tell us and not rock the boat. Well, not a chance, not for these four glorious youths who had the phronima, the mindset of the seven Maccabees. Their heart was given over to God and their main concern was to stay pure from the defilement of the Babylonians, as we read in the text. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. And this reminds us of, uh, of King David, who says, Lord, because of thy word, because of the word of your lips, I followed a hard and treacherous road. Now, this is immense. The foundation of Daniel's success is the law of fasting, the eternal law of fasting. Daniel purposed in his heart to uphold the law of God, even under the most difficult conditions. Fasting is the first commandment of God in paradise. From this tree, you shall not eat. Again, we see this principle where God holds something back to train us. You can eat from hundreds, from hundreds of the trees that are created for you. But from this one tree, you shall not eat. And Daniel does not compromise. Had he compromised, then Daniel would have joined the ranks of his countrymen who remain anonymous. Fasting strengthens their willpower and they maintain the grace of God. And had they given in to the king's law, then they would be defiled by the king's delicacies. But even from a purely physical perspective, they would give in to the passion of gluttony the desire to satisfy themselves with scrumptions and rich foods. And as we know, gluttony and consumption of rich foods and wine fans the flames of carnal passions. They wake up the lower instincts, which stir up thoughts of the flesh and also fornication. So Daniel chose obedience to the law of God over the delicacies of the king. This reminds us of Moses who chose the reproof, the reproach of Christ, rather than the pleasures of Egypt. Daniel chose the will of the heavenly king over the will of the earthly king. And the grace of the heavenly king followed Daniel for the rest of his life. Much like Joseph in Egypt, Daniel became the prime minister of Babylon, second in command to Nebuchadnezzar, and to Balthazar, his son, and to Darius of the Middle Persian Empire and to Cyrus, Daniel kept his position under four different kings. Daniel's secret of success was his steadfast faith on the God of his fathers and the obedience to his commandments. Sure, at the time, the other youths and the other students, they were probably made fun of Daniel and his three friends. Why are you guys refusing pork chops and shish kebab? You don't know what you're missing. But God softens the heart of the palace chef. Now we see the grace of God. When we make our resolve, when we decide to suffer for Christ, to be obedient, after that, the Spirit of God comes in. And now God comes in and softens the heart of the palace chef, the chief eunuch called Asphenas, so when Daniel made his holy request, the text says, now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of 
the chief of the units of the eunuchs. God prepared the way for Daniel because of Daniel's free will and resolve. This reminds us of Lydia in Philippi, the first European Christian. St. Paul was preaching, but the Holy Spirit was opening the heart of Lydia. So the Holy Spirit prepared the heart of the chief of the eunuchs to accept Daniel's holy proposal. Let us eat vegetables for 10 days and give us water instead of wine. And if we don't look better than all the other young men, who live on the delicacies of Nebuchadnezzar, then do as you please. And the grace of God helped the palace chief to accept Daniel's proposal. A decision with a great risk. If this plan would backfire, the palace chief could have been easily executed. A king's laws during those times were not something to take lightly. Daniel and the three youths would also be executed as well. But God knows how to protect and seal and shield all those who place their trust in him. Ten days passed and the results came in. Daniel and the three youths were radiant, more robust and better in appearance than all the young men who were daily fed with the delicacies of Babylonians. Of course, they had the grace of God all over them. Thus, the steward permitted them to continue their fasting with water and vegetables, while God blessed them with knowledge and wisdom. And to Daniel, he gave understanding in all visions and dreams as we will see in the future lectures. We saw last week that Daniel's resolve to stay obedient to God's law pleased God who loves to honor and glorify his saints. And we read towards the end of the first chapter of Daniel. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all letters and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding concerning which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. So once again, God glorifies those who glorify him, and he honors those who honor him. And this godly wisdom of Daniel will become manifest very quickly in an incident that was not included in the main part of this book. In the Septuagint and some of the Greek texts, it serves as an introduction to the book of Daniel, and in some other texts, it gets placed at the very end of the book. It has to do with the amazing and most didactic story of Susanna. Susanna was one of the thousands of Jews that were deported to Babylon. By some accounts, over 10,000 Jews, the most affluent, the most intellectual, the artisans, they were all sent, deported to Babylon, and they were permitted to develop workshops, businesses, plant trees, and they quickly established a parish, synagogues, schools, always under the providence of God. In a short period of time, the Jews bought homes, planted trees, gardens, and many of them became well off financially, which is a strong national trait that follows the Jewish people throughout the world and throughout the centuries. They organized their social and cultural life as best as they could as Jewish diaspora of Babylon. 
they developed their own judicial system according to the law of Moses. They refused to assimilate as a people with the Babylonians, always keeping in mind that this exile was not going to last very long. Now, let's keep in mind that most of the nations... Uh, most nations usually become extinct under similar circ circumstances. The Jews were chosen by God to bring the Messiah into the world. And quite miraculously, many of their oppressors, like the Edomites, the Philistines, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Malachites, they disappear from the annals of history, while the nation of Israel has been kept intact by God. So one of the first Jews to become very successful in Babylon was a man by the name of Joachim. Now, Joachim was a God-fearing man, a patriot, and devoted to the law of Moses. He married a very beautiful young woman by the name of Shoshana in Hebrew, which means lily, and she was really a beautiful lily. In English, we call her Susanna. Susanna was not only beautiful on the outside, but more importantly, she was very beautiful on the inside. She loved God with all her heart. External beauty is certainly a privilege, but quite often very dangerous, especially if the woman or the man who possesses this beauty lacks fear of God. External beauty can become a temptation as we will see in the course of this dramatic story. Now, her parents were very virtuous and taught their daughter to live according to the law of Moses. They gave their daughter the best possible inheritance, not just money, but faith, reverence, and fear of God. Joachim was very young, very wealthy, and as it usually happens, he enjoyed a high status among the Jewish captives. He had some kind of important position, perhaps a parish council member. And as a kind-hearted person, he opened his home for community events, community gatherings, and meetings. He also offered a large room in his house to be used as a temporary courtroom. People who violated the laws of Moses, people who had disagreements among them, they needed to be judged, penalized, and brought back to order by using elected judges. So every day, a number of cases were heard by two older men who were assigned as judges by the people of Israel by the captives. It seems, however, that these two older men were not very careful with their eyes and emotions, and the external beauty of Joachim's young wife was becoming a great temptation to them. Now, this did not happen overnight. It seems that they harbored these sinful thoughts for weeks and months because now these annoying thoughts had matured and sin inside them was taking flesh and bones. According to St. Yaakovos, the brother of God, a person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And we know that the wages of sin is death especially in the Old Testament, where some carnal sins were punishable with death by stoning. So both of these unholy grandfathers, the judges of the people, allowed the demon of fornication to enter their heart. And this was not the first time, as we will see in the story. They initially began to admire Susanna's beauty, the way she walked, smiled, and a feeling of attraction began to develop in their mind and heart. Now, all sins begin with an initial thought, a logismo, as we say in Greek. 
It is not a sin to look at a person, even an attractive person. There are three, four stages that we pass through before we can begin to commit a sin. Initially, we have the state of intrusion. Now, we are not sinning if the intrusion takes place inadvertently. Let's say we are at a bank or, you know, at a gathering, and someone comes and begins a conversation. You have very captivating eyes. I love your hair. Uh, I like your outfit. Now, immediately, we must put up our spiritual shield called either Jesus Prayer or begin to eliminate this thought by thinking humble thoughts so we can extinguish that thought which can begin to initiate a feeling of pride. This we will do when we have fear of God, when we are governed by the law of God. If we are not experienced fighters, we will most likely begin to enjoy that compliment. We will become puffed up and continue to dialogue and converse and enjoy this thought. So the first stage of sin is the intrusion, the initial assault. If this is not combated properly, then we move into the second stage, which is the dialogue. We begin to hold a conversation with the idea of this desire, this tempting thought. Then we progress to the third stage, which is the acceptance. That sounds pretty good. You know, uh, I should try this. Why not? And then the fourth stage is the stage of consent. And at this point, sin has already been conceived. Now, when sin is conceived in the heart, it hardens the heart. All fear of God, fear of shame, fear of retribution, this all vanishes because of the illicit desire. That's why St. Paul says, be careful not to put out the Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit of God is like a little sensitive candle and uh, that can be blown out. And this means that, you know, of course, God is not pushed out, but because God respects our free will, you know, God will surrender his will to our own free will. And God is so humble that if we ask him to exit our heart, he will leave. Because God does not want to touch anything unclean, unlike us. So these two men, old enough to be Susanna's grandfathers, were soon filled with a spirit of lust. The power of authority went to their head, perhaps. They were filled with egotism and pride, which is the mother of all passions. Both of them now wanted to act upon their evil desire with a very young, happily married woman. They were both possessed by the same desire, but they did not disclose it to each other. Every noon, each one of them would leave through the back door, through the gardens, in hopes that they would have a private moment or two with Susanna to disclose their desire, to seduce her, and to entice her with this evil proposal. So it happened that one of them, one day, one day they both pretended that they were going home for lunch, but each one of them, burning with lust, came back to the garden doors, and at the same time, their eyes met, and they asked each other, why did you come back? And the other one says, why did you come back? So initially, they were ashamed to confess their dilemma, but evil people can easily see through each other, and they revealed each other their secret and their plan. From that day on, they were both looking for the first opportunity to entrap Susanna in their evil scheme. What a terrible demon lust can be. It knows no age, no friendship, no position. It paralyzes its victims. As we know, last year, the Penn State football program was rocked by a horrible scandal. A coach was jailed for molesting young boys. We hear stories of teachers risk 
their entire career from moment of pleasure with a 12, 13 year old student. Are these people not intelligent? Not aware of the consequences? Why do they risk it all? The desire of fornication becomes so addictive, so menacing that it paralyzes the willpower. It darkens the noose and enslaves the heart. In some rare cases, it turns men into real beasts. So these elders of Israel were most likely married. Otherwise, they would not be chosen for this position. Uh, they probably had grandchildren the age of Susanna. But all this did not matter to them. Adultery with a young married woman with children? Married to a man who gave them hospitality every day. So one very hot summer day, these two men put to action their long-awaited plan. They pretended that they were leaving through the back doors, but instead they hid in the garden bushes. Joachim had a beautiful garden with uh, many types of trees and evergreens near the fence. As we said earlier, the captives were instructed through Jeremiah, the prophet, to plant trees, build homes. Some of the optimists thought that in a few years, uh, in a year or two, they would be returning home, according to the false prophets, who always want to please the crowd. But God told Jeremiah, not two, three years, but 70 years. So go ahead and plant gardens, trees, make yourselves comfortable. For six, seven centuries, they refused to observe the sabbatical years of the land. And God added all these years up and they turn out to be 70 years. God had specified for them in the law of Moses that for six years you will use the land that I will give you, the promised land. The sixth year I will bless your land and you will harvest twice as much crop. And the seventh year you must rest the land, you will plant nothing. And whatever grows, you will not harvest it. You will give the land a sabbatical. Now, this was not only good for the land, but the main purpose of this was to maintain people's trust in the providence of God. Our livelihood originates from God and not the land or the sea or our place of business. Most people believe in God one way or the other, but very few people believe and trust in the providence of God. So Joachim was blessed by God and had a beautiful property with springs, plenty of water, and some sort of a swimming pool, as we would call it today. When everyone was out of sight, Susanna instructed her maids to lock the doors, including the garden doors, to enjoy some privacy in her fenced uh, backyard. She asked her maids to bring uh, some ointments and bath oils so she could bathe. So the maids brought the necessary items and went about their work in the house. Susanna was left all alone with the two elders who were hiding behind some bushes. Immediately, these two old servants of the evil one rose and ran to her and said, Look, the garden doors are shut. No one sees us and we desire you exceedingly, so give your consent and lie with us. Desire has blinded the mind of these two elders to such an extent where they had no regard for God or men. Jesus said a parable about such an unrighteous judge in the New Testament. This judge told about himself, I am not afraid of God and I am not ashamed of men. A total perversion of the human nature. So these men had seared their conscience and surrendered to their passion of lust, which became their idol, and all this 2,600 years ago. The same idol is flooding the gates of Hades today. It is a $12 billion industry, a revenue larger than all U.S. professional sports combined. According to some statistics, 47% of today's American Christians 
admit that porn is a problem in their home. 17% of women are addicted to chat rooms and pornography. And 72% of men visit sites regularly. The number of men who attend church regularly in the U.S. has dropped to about 20% by some accounts. So lust seems to be the most popular deity today in Americans' Babylonian pantheon. Lust dries up the fear, faith, and love for God and men. It turns men into a slave. Now let's see how the God-fearing, pure, and most pious Susanna, a true daughter of Judah, dealt with this initial demonic attack, this initial assault. These two pitiful men enthroned the spirit of fornication in their heart, and they were obedient to its desires. On the contrary, Susanna had enthroned the spirit of God in her heart and chose to suffer personal harm than betray the God of her fathers. So they asked her consent. If you refuse, we will testify in court that we saw a young man with you. We will say that we saw you committing adultery, the penalty for adultery 2,600 years ago, and in today's Pakistan, Afghanistan, and all Sharia law Muslim states, the penalty for adultery for women is death by stoning. There are a number of videos on YouTube uh, for those who are interested to, to see, who have, this, who have the stomach for this, to actually see Muslim men stoning poor women. And I think this would be kind of rough, but it would be good to show to some of your young friends, some Orthodox young women in colleges who date Muslims. I spoke to a few of them uh, this past year alone. One, once Sharia law takes over a city, a woman becomes the property of the husband. So Susanna, 2,600 years ago, sighed deeply. I am between a rock and a hard place. If I do what you ask me, I will lose my soul. If I refuse you and obey God, I will lose my body, my earthly life. You will kill me. What a temptation. And this is the eternal temptation of the evil serpent who went as far to ask Christ to worship him. As a daughter of Judah, she's in the lineage of Christ and she will give a worthy answer obeying to the same Holy Spirit that spoke through Christ. Christ says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. Rather be afraid of the one who has authority to throw your body and soul in hell. Susanna in the Old Testament was a great martyr, much like Joseph and Moses and the seven Maccabees and the three youths in the fire in the furnace, as we will see in the book of Daniel. Susanna bravely spoke to them and said, I choose not to comply with your demands. I choose death of my body rather than to sin in the sight of my Lord. What a beautiful, brave, free, heroic woman. She's the female counterpart of Joseph in Egypt, who excelled in the same virtue. And this virtue was constant memory of God, the constant awareness that God is present in front of us and watching us, and God permitted this. Now let's compare her answer with the answer of Joseph to his adulterous female employer back in Genesis 39, 9. Joseph said, how can I do this sin before my God? So Joseph had constant memory of God and he chose to please God and not the lust of Potiphar's wife. Having said this, Susanna screamed for help from the top of her lungs, and the shocked elders ran and opened the garden doors. Immediately, the servants rushed to her aid, and the slithery creatures told their side of the story. 
As we were leaving, we walked through the back door as we usually do, and to our great surprise, we found Susanna in a very sinful state with a young man. We tried to grab him, we tried to hold him, but he was too strong for us and he took off. Now Joachim's house servants and all people in general had great respect for the old age of these two elders and there's no indication in the text that anyone had suspected their iniquity. Sometimes demonic minds orchestrate their plans so well that many innocent victims rot in jails all over the world. So the next day, the Joachim residence was packed. Joachim is very confused. Now he's well aware of his wife's fidelity. But what if? He's 99.9% .9 sure. But that one half a percent, what if? That one percent begins to poison his existence. Feelings of betrayal, injustice, anger, jealousy, shame. Now Joachim was a good man, but certainly not as righteous as Joseph, the guardian of the Most Holy Theotokos, who faced a similar temptation at his old age. The devil began to tempt Joseph with doubts and confusion when the ever-virgin returned from Elizabeth with a rounded belly. Joseph suffered for months and the Panagia countered these accusations with a golden silence, not a word. Her mind and heart was totally surrendered to the providence of her Lord. Joseph remained confused until Archangel Gabriel came to put his mind at ease. In the same way, the entire community and Joachim's family were they were confused and in disbelief when the following day the two elders repeated their slanderous accusations against Susanna. They did this in front of her parents, her children, and all her relatives and friends. The text includes a detail that truly shows how disgusting the spirit of fornic fornication can be, how ruthless and heartless. Susanna came in veiled preparing for a, de a death sentence, more or less her own funeral. And these two wicked victims of Satan order her to remove her veil. Why do you think? So they might feast upon her beauty one more time. The epitome of human depravity. In a few moments, the, uh, the court was called in session. The judges and only eyewitnesses presented their case. And after they took an oath by placing their hands on the head of Susanna, the assembly believed them because they were the elders of the people and judges. And Susanna was condemned to death by stoning. At this very moment, Susanna cried out with a loud voice and prayed, O eternal God who sees everything done in secret, who knows all things before they come to be, you know that these men have borne false witness against me, and now I am to die. Yet I have done none of the things that they have wickedly invented against me. Unfortunately, no one believed her, and they all joined the procession leading Susanna to her death. And as she was being led away, God aroused the Holy Spirit of a young lad named Daniel, and he cried with a loud voice. Daniel, who at this point was basically unknown to the people, and I believe this is how God reveals the special gifts found in Daniel. And this is Daniel's introduction uh, to the people, the people of Israel. And after this, they will revere him as a prophet. So the Holy, the Holy Spirit of God aroused the Holy Spirit of a young lad named Daniel. And he cried with a loud voice, I am innocent of the blood of this woman. What a beautiful thing. The Holy Spirit of God 
informed Daniel's pure heart to leave his home and to walk towards this procession. Illumined by God and full of the Holy Spirit, he said, Are you such fools, you sons of Israel? Have you condemned a daughter of Israel without cross-examination and without an investigation? Now return to the place of judgment, for these men have borne false witness against her. Then all the people sighed out of relief, and they returned in a haste. Suddenly, a ray of hope began to fill this solemn procession, especially Susanna and her relatives. The only ones disturbed by this were the two elders who resorted to cynicism and irony. What else could they do? They said to Daniel, who was probably not more than 20 years old, trying to use his youth youthfulness against him, Come, come, you are a mere teenager now. You're going to sit among us and show us how it's done. So they res resorted to cynicism. Then you ignored them. And after they returned to the home, he said, separate these two. Separate them from each other and I will examine them. This is a standard procedure used to this day to make sure that the two eyewitnesses saw the same thing, make sure that there's no conflicting evidence. So he summoned one of them and said, You old relic of wicked days, your sins have now come home. It is time for you to pay for all the unjust judgments, for all the bribes and extortions, for condemning the innocent and letting the wicked go. And later on, the Spirit of God will reveal all their wickedness. What a terrible ordeal. Remember, when they tempted Susanna, they told, they told her, Look, the doors are shut. No one is watching us. No one sees us. No one sees you. David will tell you, The one who created the, one who created the eye, can he not see? The one who created the ear, can he not hear? So the things done in secret will be brought out in the open. So Daniel, now the newly appointed judge, judge of this assembly, begins his cross-examination. And he brings the first evil judge. Now then, if you really saw her, tell me this. Under what tree did you see them sin? And the first judge says, under a mastic tree. A mastic tree. Very well. You have lied against your own head, for the angel of God has received the sentence from above and will immediately split you in two. Now, the Septuagint here uses a poetic wordplay with the mastic tree. The Greek word is schinos, and this bush called schinos sounds extremely close to the Greek verb schizo, I split in two. So Daniel says, you saw her under a schinos tree. Very well. God will schizo you, will split you in two. Then Daniel sends this judge away and summons the other one. And he says to him, you offspring of Canaan, and not of Judah. Beauty has deceived you, and lust has perverted your heart. Now, that's pretty strong language, but why offspring of Canaan? Canaan. Canaan was cursed by Noah, if you remember, when Ham, his youngest son, saw the nakedness of his father. Noah, after the flood, uh, planted a vineyard. It's probably the first time they made wine. He had a little bit too much to drink. And uh, he tasted this wine probably for the first time and got drunk. So he forgot to dress himself and Ham laughed at his father's nakedness. Now, this is one of the interpretations. But there's some other interpreters who posit that Hebrew idiomatic speech suggests that something far worse took place. The expression uncovered his nakedness 
is found many times in the scriptures, and it has to do with lying with another man's wife, adultery. So according to this interpretation, Ham was full of lust, and after Noah, his own father, became drunk, he somehow violated his own mother, and Canaan was born out of incest. And that's why he was called the father of Canaanites. Canaan became the father of Canaanites who lived very depraved lives, worshipped idols, and always fought the people of God. So Canaan's name is associated with lust, and this is probably why Daniel calls the second judge, and actually both of them, children of Canaan, because they dared to violate a young daughter of Israel, and not the only one. And Daniel now reveals to the assembly, this is how you both have been dealing with the daughters of Israel, and they were intimate with you through fear. But a daughter of Judah would not endure your wickedness. Now then, tell me, under what tree did you catch them being intimate with each other? And the second one, the second evil judge, says, Oh, under an evergreen oak. Very well. You are also a liar, and the angel of the Lord will saw you in two. Now, again, the Septuagint makes use of uh, an ironic wordplay because evergreen oak in Greek is prinos, prinos, and phonetically, prinos is very close to the word prioni or uh, a saw. So you saw her under a prinos tree. Very well. The angel will prionisi you, will saw you in two, will cut you in two with a hand saw that he may destroy you both. So both of them served as judge and jury, which is uncalled for. But we need to keep in mind that they were just deported in Babylon two or three years before, and they were not very well organized. So Daniel proved the innocence of Susanna by the conflicting testimony of these two wicked elders. And the entire assembly Shout it loudly and bless God who saves those who hope in him. And they rose against the two elders and exercised their law eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. The stones they were planning to use against Susanna were now used to end the criminal life of these two wicked judges. And Susanna was saved that day. Now God could have let her die as I am certain many innocent victims are not always exonerated in this life. Human justice is very limited. In this life, we might not become justified. So if we're ever falsely accused or condemned by a human court, it is not so terminal. Let's not become bitter and cynical because God does not act like an ever-present policeman. God sees it all and will justify us. He will proclaim us innocent on the day of judgment. His judgment is flawless and unwavering without a trace of favoritism. So you're called to trust in God and accept his holy will, even if earthly judges attempt to cut our life short, as we will see in the amazing story of the three youths in the furnace in a future talk. And from that day onward, Daniel had a great reputation among his people because God loves to honor those who honor him even in his life. We have once again been blessed by God to live through the beautiful season of our Lord's incarnation, his nativity, and our souls rejoiced with the beautiful hymns of Christ's birth, his humble entrance inside human history. In the royal hours of nativity, one of the most beautiful services of our church, we read prophecy after prophecy about the child of Bethlehem. We heard a plethora of very clear, unquestionable prophecies in the Old Testament 
about the coming of the Messiah, proving the truth of our faith. There is no other faith on earth that can make this claim. The fulfillment of prophecy is the privilege of the Christian faith only, and prophecy cements our faith. Years ago, when St. Gregory Palamas was abducted by Muslims for ransom, and they kept him a captive for over a year, much like one of our bishops in Syria today, when asked by the Agarines, the followers of Islam, if he loves Muhammad, his answer was worthy of a true bishop of the church. No, I don't love your Muhammad. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because there are hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament about the life of Christ and not a single one about Muhammad, a statement that nearly cost him his life if they didn't love gold more than their prophet, at least back then. The religions of this world, my friends, are man-made, the works of man's intellect. Only the faith of Christ is a heavenly apocalypse, God's revelation to the hearts of men. In the past, we presented a number of prophecies about Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. Amazing prophecies about the cross, the nails, the tomb, the vinegar, the sponge, the darkness of Holy Friday, the scattering of the apostles, the thief on the cross. All these events are described in the Psalms and the books of the prophets. No one in this world can accurately pinpoint events that will occur 50, 100 years from now, let alone centuries and even thousands of years. Only God and his true servants can do this. Isaiah 9.2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And in the same book 9.6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. He'll be full of signs and wonders, Counselor, Paracletos, one who will bring hope and consolation to his people. He will be called Mighty God. He will do mighty deeds, supernatural deeds, like the resurrection of the dead people, walking on the sea, defying gravity. Everlasting Father, this child of Bethlehem, is the Father of eternity. He's co-eternal with God the Father. This child is the infinite God, and he is the source of eternity, so only he can bring us into eternity. He is the Prince of Peace, peace between man and God, earth and heaven. But unlike all other prophecies which capture different aspects and attributes and characteristics from the life of the Messiah, in a book of Daniel, we will see and try to study today an amazing prophecy that pinpoints the time of the presence of the Messiah, the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He includes the number of years in this amazing prophecy of 70 weeks, which is found in the ninth chapter of Daniel. And it would be good to read it very quickly even though it's quite a long prophecy and a little bit dense. I will use the you know, New King James Version, which most of you are familiar with, but then I will use the Septuagint to do the interpretation. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and profit, and to anoint the Most Holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. 
the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Then after the sixty two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined. But let's examine the events that brought about this prophecy. Now, Daniel went to Babylon about 17 years old, and he's been in captivity along with his people for over 50 years. 50 years have gone by, and it seems like his people do not have a lot of repentance. Some are beginning to become confused with the idolatry of the Babylonians, and Daniel's loving heart is becoming very concerned. Even though he lived very well, he was always in palaces, he's not very happy because he's agonizing about the faith of his people. So at this point, he's studying the prophets, and especially Jeremiah, to find out uh, how long is this captivity going to last. And he realized through Jeremiah that this captivity could go as long as 70 years. And Daniel's a, uh, Daniel's a little bit concerned, thinking that this could go, go on for even longer if people do not repent. So now he begins to intensify his prayer, a prayer that I'm sure has been copied by many of our bishops and saints, a prayer full of humility and self-criticism, contrition, this thing that we call aftomemsia, Daniel will assume the sins of his people. He will become one of his people. He will not say, Lord, I have been faithful to you, but please forgive some of our people who have not been as faithful. This is not the way of the prayer of the saints. So here, Daniel in chapter 9, he will begin to really beseech the Lord. And he will say, Lord, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we listened to the prophets and even Moses. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face to our kings, our princes, and our fathers because we have sinned against you. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name. As it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, Archangel Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening sacrifice. Now you can imagine the fire of this prayer, the intensity of this prayer, the prayer of Daniel that brings Archangel Gabriel to him. Gabriel receives a command to go to Daniel. And while I was yet speaking during my prayer, behold, the Archangel Gabriel, and this is what the angel tells him. Daniel, I came to impart to the understanding and wisdom, heavenly wisdom. At the beginning of your prayer, I received a command 
from above. I have received their words, so I have come to speak to you, for you are a man of desires. Ania epithymion. You're a man with the most holy desires. So I, Gabriel, came to explain to you the words of this prophecy, the secrets of heaven. Daniel was most beloved by God because he also loved God much more than his own life. He was very pure, most likely one of the most pure prophets of the Old Testament. And our loving God treats his most devoted souls and servants, not as servants, but as friends, as he sends angels to announce the secrets of heaven to his friends. Christ told his disciples uh, 450 some years later the same thing. I don't call you servants, but friends. So Gabriel tells Daniel, be attentive to my words so you can gain full understanding of the vision. So even prophets are asked for their undivided attention when heaven speaks. How much more must we pay attention when we study the word of God? Now, a prophet of Daniel's stature and wisdom needs help from heaven to understand the words of the scriptures and prophecy. And some of our contemporary Christians write book after book about prophecy without the prophetic gift and without the necessary presuppositions, only to confuse the masses, often because their prophecies miss the mark. This happens time after time again. And they don't give up after a few years. They'll simply say nothing about their false prophecies, but begin to do new books. The Holy Scripture is not an easy book. There are some simple and easy areas, but some very difficult and obscure areas. And we really need the help of heaven and also the commentary from saying the people of the church. So then you loved his people in the holy city of Jerusalem. He always prayed uh, facing west because the point of reference was Zion, the holy mountain, the holy city of God, and more specifically, the temple of Solomon. And towards Vesper's time, he was doing his evening sacrifice. And this reminds us of the beautiful pre-sanctified uh, pray, prayer, the uh, prayer in the pre-sanctified service when we, when we chant. Let my prayer arise as incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. So he prayed for his countrymen and he was very concerned about the extent of their captivity. He was rightly concerned because the weak souls could easily lose their faith and fall prey to the idolatry of the Babylonians or the Persians. So he's studying the prophecy of Jeremiah and other prophets about the 70 years of captivity. And in the midst of his prayer and his loving concern, God sends Archangel Gabriel to console him and reveal to him a much bigger prophecy, a huge prophecy about the true liberation of his people. Daniel was thinking about their physical liberation from the hands of the Babylonians or Persians. And God gives him something so huge. God gives him so much more. He reveals to him the time of their spiritual and eternal liberation through the incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection of the Messiah. And the same archangel who will visit the ever-virgin four, four and a half centuries later, the same archangel is now announcing to Daniel about the first coming of Christ. Seventy weeks have been determined for your people and the holy city for sin to be ended and to seal up transgressions and to blot out iniquities and to make atonement for iniquities and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal vision and profit and to anoint the holiest of holies. Again, I am paraphrasing a little bit by using the Septuagint. I will break this prophecy in uh, a few sections because it is uh, not only long, but very dense. So we will attempt to analyze and interpret each section of this prophecy, guided by some prominent Orthodox theologians who have worked on this prophecy in the past. 
Once again, Daniel is in prayer and his mind is on the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. And after they were transferred to Babylon, about 10,000 uh, people, they hire Ashelon of Jerusalem. Now maybe 40, 50 years have gone by and uh, again, Daniel is becoming very concerned. And now Archangel Gabriel announces this great news to him. He makes known to him the time of the coming of the Messiah. Seventy weeks of years, often translated 70 weeks, evdomada in Greek. Yes, it does mean a week, but in ancient Greek, evdomada is a cycle of seven. Today, for example, we say six dozen of eggs. We have uh, the cycles of 12. Uh, the Babylonians, they used in their numerical system, the heptad, cycle of seven. The Romans favor number five. Today we have the metric system, so we have cycles of 10. So Archangel Gabriel announces to Daniel that your holy city and your people will see their Messiah, and he's using the Babylonian numeric system, and he says 70 weeks, not 70 weeks, but 70 hebdomades, 70 heptads of years. In other words, 70 times 7, 490 years is the time that your Messiah will become manifest. Again, Daniel was concerned about the Babylonian captivity, and God now reminds him something immense about a far worse captivity, the spiritual captivity of his people. The Babylonian captivity may be over in 70 years, but the spiritual captivity will continue for about 490 years until the coming of the liberator, liberator the Messiah. 490 years have been determined for sin to be ended and to seal up transgressions and to blot out iniquities and to make atonement for iniquities for synonymous phrases in Daniel chapter 9, 24. Now, how can sin be ended? People all of a sudden will stop sinning? Some believers will become sinless? None of that. Scripture is very clear when it says that no one can live even one day without sinning. This phrase is referring to the forgiveness of sin. The Lamb of God will lift and erase the sin of the world. The debt, the debt of the 10,000 talents, as uh, we read uh, and we hear in the, uh, in the Gospels of Sundays, the 10,000 talents will be forgiven by the merciful Master. And in John, the first epistle of John 1.7, we read, The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from every sin, from every stain. In 490 years, transgressions will be sealed up and iniquities will be covered. And we chant this after the third immersion of baptism when we baptize our brothers and sisters today. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And this is Psalm 31 of David. And God says, I will remember your sins no more, says the Lord. I will seal your transgressions and to blot out your iniquities. This suggests that our sins and all sins and transgressions are written on the heavenly chalkboard. And now God says in this prophecy that there will become a time for God to erase all these sins. This reminds us of David's psalm of repentance after his sin with his general's wife, Bathsheba. Lord, according to your great mercy, blot out my transgression. Get rid of it. Erase it. The same concept is repeated with a fourth phrase, and to make atonement for iniquities. St. John the Theologian says that Christ is our propitiation, our exilasmos. Christ is the atoning sacrifice who cleanses our sin with his blood. Many other prophets talk about the cleansing of sins by the Messiah. Isaiah says, and the Lord will wash the impurity, the mire of our hearts. In his suffering servant, Isaiah says, he will 
carry our sins and he will suffer for us. He will be bruised on account of us. We will be healed by his stripes. Ezekiel says, I will pour on you pure water and I will wash you clean. The scripture at times speaks about cleansing through the sprinkling of blood and at times through the sprinkling of water. Blood refers to the sacrifice on Golgotha and to the bloodless sacrifice in our divine liturgy. And cleansing with water refers to the sacrament of holy baptism. These prophecies are clearly pointing to the coming of the Messiah. So 70 weeks have been determined for God to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal vision and prophet and to anoint the Holy of Holies. The coming of the Messiah will bring everlasting justification. Justification takes place by the sacrifice of Christ, according to St. Paul in the, in the fifth chapter of Romans. Then we read, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And in the same chapter, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace. Justification was absent in the Old Testament. No one in the Old Testament went to paradise. Abraham wanted to see one of my days, the Lord said in John 8:56. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and he was glad. So eternal justification will be given by Christ. Eternal forgiveness of all human death. No matter how heavy, how sinister. Peter asked, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? Not seven times, Peter, but 70 times seven. 490 times. So the gates of forgiveness are forever open from God's side. And this represents the objective side of salvation. And here is one of our irreconcilable differences with the Protestants, the sectarians, the born again, and again, most Protestants who interpret scripture according to their intellect. They believe that justification equates salvation. Christ has done it all. So, I believed, I accepted Christ, I believe in his death and his resurrection. I did this at some campus crusade, at some church a few years ago. I became a Christian, and now I am saved, and I cannot lose that salvation. This is a blatant misunderstanding of the gospel of Christ. About sanctification, we also hear about that in our baptism. After the child or the catechumen is baptized, the priest says that you believed, you were sanctified, you were baptized, you were justified. So at that moment, you are justified. If you happen to die a couple hours after that, the same day, for a baby a couple years later, of course you're a saint because Christ reconciled us to God the Father. He's the mediator. And in Romans 5.1, we read, since we have been justified through faith, but there's another chapter here, the principle of synergy, something that St. Augustine talks about when he says, the one who created you without your will cannot save you without your will. The principle of free will. Salvation is guaranteed to any human being from the side of Christ. And yet most people did not believe because their works were dark. And Christ says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times did I want to gather you, gather your children like a hen gathers her chicks, but you did not want to. And this is the key, free will. So justification is not the end of the story, but the beginning. Holy baptism or chrismation is the beginning of our salvation and our introduction to the faith of Christ. Sure, he justified us. But St. Paul also talks about the most graphic example of the graft. During baptism, we are grafted on the distinct body of Christ. In a very organic way, 
How organic? Just like a branch is connected on a tree. A branch can only live if it stays connected on a tree, on a tree called Christ. And Christ says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now, I live as long as I receive the necessary nutrients from the tree called Christ. As a church member, I am alive. I don't do sins unto death. And as long as I am nourished with a medicine of immortality, Holy Communion and Holy Confession are two sacraments that are very necessary to stay alive as Orthodox Christians. So I need to place myself in the right position to have access to God's eternal justification. I believe in His one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, His distinct body, and I live the sacramental life of the Church to strive to develop the mind of Christ to expel all idols out of my heart so I can enthrone the Holy Trinity in the very living room of my heart. And this not for a few days, not for a year or two, not during Great Lent, but every day, on a daily basis, until the day I die. So salvation takes place through this organic connection with His body, His Holy Church, the only dispenser of His grace. Only the Church can provide us with the washing of regeneration and with His body and blood. Furthermore, we are given all the necessary spiritual gifts at our baptism to complete the journey from the image to the likeness of Christ, which is the purpose of our life. Many of us like the idea of being with God, but few of us choose to imitate Him in His sufferings. And Archangel Gabriel now reveals to Daniel that there will be a time of eternal salvation, continuous forgiveness, continuous access to repentance and salvation. And God will seal vision and profit at that time. A seal is usually placed at the very end of an ofi official document or decree. So Christ said the visions and prophecies were necessary up to St. John the Baptist. Now the kind of prophecy that Christ is speaking about here, he's speaking about messianic prophecy. In other words, the prophets of the Old Testament, the Psalms of the Old Testament that were pointing to the coming of the Messiah, these are called messianic prophecies. These prophecies are now fulfilled and the final messianic prophet, the prophet of the present and the culmination of all the messianic prophets is Saint John the Baptizer. He identified the Messiah, fulfilled all righteousness after baptizing the Lord, and all messianic prophets about the birth, baptism, healing ministry, transfiguration, passion, all these have been sealed. There's no need for any more of these prophecies because the Messiah has come. The Jewish people are still searching for their 12 tribes that have been scattered all over the world. And they're still expecting, those who believe, they're still expecting their Messiah. Yet they have seen not a single prophet for the last 2,000 years. For centuries before the coming of the Messiah, from 2,000 years before, we had amazing personalities and prophets almost every century. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Isaiah, David, Solomon, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jonah, Malachi, dozens of great prophets, and world-renowned personalities glorified the nation of Israel century after century, up to St. John the Baptist. Not a single prophet after the nation of Israel crucified and killed its Messiah. And now this prophecy revealed to Daniel sets a time frame for the appearance of the Messiah. Seventy weeks have been determined to anoint the Holy of Holies, the person with absolute holiness. Seventy weeks, 490 years for the Anointed One, the Christ, the Most Holy Son of God, to appear. The Most Holy is christened by God to save the world. Jesus, in His human nature, was not christened with oil, 
but with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove to christen the Son of Man, the Messiah. And at verse 25, we have the second paragraph of this prophecy, which breaks down the time into two, 62 heptads of years and seven heptads of years, from the command to allow Jerusalem to be rebuilt. Until Christ the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So this command to restore Jerusalem and the temple, to rebuild Jerusalem, this command historically took place during the 20th year of the reign of the king of Persia, Artaxerxes the Long Manus. 49 years after this prophecy, permission was given to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem, and the funds were collected by the Persians. Now, during the 62 weeks, the second time frame, after that, 434 years, there's really nothing of Christological significance, but the end of the 62 weeks will carve history in two, before Christ and after Christ. The second person of the Holy Trinity becomes the Holy Infant of Bethlehem. And in the third paragraph, and after the 62 week, after, after those 434 years, the Christ, the Anointed One, shall be cut off. The King James says, the Septuagint says, the Christ shall be destroyed. And there is no judgment in him. Incredibly amazing. Now, who can doubt that this prophecy is clearly foretelling the unjust death of the Son of God, the Christ. And there's no judgment in him. Pilate said it. This man has done nothing deserving death. And his wife, Procla, one of the saints of our church, told him, have nothing to do with this innocent man. Christ also said, the prince of this world is coming and he has nothing on me. The evil one was searching to find a sin, some kind of a flaw on Christ. Now he did this previously with Moses. He was fighting over the body of Moses with another archangel, Archangel Michael, perhaps because Moses killed the Egyptian and, and buried his body in the sand before he escaped from Egypt. But Christ was flawless, sinless, guiltless in all things. So the devil left empty-handed and returned to his friends, the scribes and the Pharisees, to inspire them to kill the Lord of glory, to hang their Messiah. And the devil put some horrible words in their mouths in their vicious attempt to convince Pilate who washed his hands to show that he's innocent of this man's blood. Yet these poor, pitiful people spelled out their own judgment at that very moment. His blood on our heads and on our children's head. And now the rest of this paragraph prophesies God's judgment on these wicked servants who put to death the king's son. And we have a prophecy about this in Matthew chapter 21, I believe, about the landowner who rented his vineyard to some wicked vine dressers. The landowner wanted his fruit, and the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Uh, I believe we read this uh, this parable. Um, or this gospel, actually, in the um, during the Feast of St. Stephen, the first martyr. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. The last of all, and la then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Prophecy about the death of the Messiah. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And again, the answer came from the very lips of the Pharisees and the scribes. They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably 
and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. And here's Daniel's prophecy 450 years before. And after the 62 weeks, the anointed one, the Messiah, shall be destroyed and there is no judgment in him. And God shall destroy the city and the sanctuary with the prince, prince that is coming, meaning Titus, the prince from the Romans. So since they killed their Messiah, now God will destroy these people along with the temple of the Jews. Since most of them did not repent after Pentecost, about 10,000 repented initially, and perhaps 5 to 10 percent. We have accounts of about 40, 50,000 Christians in Jerusalem at that time. And because most of them did not repent, however, the vast majority not only failed to repent, but they continued to persecute the gospel with a vengeance. And now the prophet says that they shall be cut down by a flood, by cataclysmic conditions, a powerful statement to show the unprecedented destruction that awaited Jerusalem at 70 AD. Christ also said, do you see this temple? Stone will not be left upon stone. This is so graphic. Titus literally leveled the entire city, turned it into a farm. And now the archangel turns to the 70 weeks again, and he talks about the last week from the 70 weeks. And one week he shall establish a covenant with many. God will establish a new covenant with many people. And this is reminiscent of the mystical supper. This is my blood of the New Testament, new covenant. And the covenant was established by the death of the coming Messiah. And in the midst of the week, sacrifice and drink offering shall be taken away. The sacrifices of bulls and oxen and sheep shall come to a halt in the midst of the week. Three and a half years, three and a half years of the last week, Christ was crucified after three and a half years of public ministry. And after the true sacrifice, there's no need for all the symbolisms and prefigurements and typologies. The Old sacrifices will be replaced by the bloodless sacrifice, and that is our divine liturgy, Holy Eucharist. And we have a wonderful prophecy in Malachi, where the Spirit of God says in the first chapter, And I will not accept a sacrifice from your hands, he tells the Jews, because from the east to the west my name will be great among the nations. This is telling the Jews that the Messiah is not just for you. Through you, the Messiah will reach all nations. My, my name will be great among the nations, and at every place, incense will be offered in my name. Incense and a pure sacrifice, says the Lord Pandukato. The pure sacrifice is the bloodless sacrifice of the New Testament, our divine liturgy. And now Gabriel turns again to the destruction of Jerusalem. The Roman soldiers were not only hated by the Jews, but they were considered unclean and infidels. They will, uh, if they would enter and desecrate and destroy the temple, uh, they would call this desolation. And the desolation will go on for centuries up until the very end of time. At this point, I believe the prophet speaks about the hope of Israel. A little before the end, many Israelites who are now unbelievers will believe in Christ. This is one of the signs of the end call a mystery by St. Paul in Romans eleven twenty six. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the nations has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. In other words, all faithful Jews, all repented Jews who now are believing on the Messiah, all those who believe in Christ and the gospel will be saved at the very end. And this is the end of this amazing prophecy informing Daniel that in 490 years, the Messiah will enter human history to consecrate a new covenant with the fallen children of Adam and all of us. 
This prophecy was fulfilled to the fullest. Now, it is not important to exhaust our energy on the chronological details and, and months and dates. We'll leave that kind of work to the chronologists. We mentioned earlier that prophecy cements our faith. And since this prophecy of Daniel and all the prophecies about the first coming of Christ have been fulfilled by mathematical accuracy, then all the prophecies about the second coming, the tribulation, and the final judgment will also be fulfilled. When? We don't know when because a time was designated for the first coming of Christ, but we don't have such a time for the second coming of Christ, although we were given many, many signs. And according to St. Andrew of Caesarea, we will be able to understand these signs if we stay vigilant. The saint said, time and experience will reveal to those who have their vigil lamps lit all the time. Let us pray for much repentance and more obedience to the Word, word of God this new year, 2014. Amen. In the first chapter of the book of Daniel, we saw how Daniel's faithful observance of the law of God is rewarded by God, our Creator. Daniel and the three youths were trained for three years to be royal pages in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. And we saw that these four young men were Israel's elect. They were living in the palace with hundreds of other youths of the surrounding international community. These young people were brought in by Nebuchadnezzar to become future ambassadors and governors of their uh, corresponding countries, the country of their origin. Now, these four Hebrew lads were exposed to different ethics, different customs, a different diet, and an assortment of foreign gods from the pantheon of the surrounding world community. Youths from Egypt, Persia, Sidon, Tyre, Edom, Elam, Media, with different backgrounds and faith. The important thing here is that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were not influenced by the loose ethics of their colleagues. They studied together, they uh, trained together in all things, but they remained steadfast to the law of Moses. They were not shaken because they were living their faith. They had experiential knowledge of God. They were so much more advanced than a lot of our college-bound Orthodox today, who often become unrecognizable after four years at uh, today's catalytic university campuses. We have some statistics that about 51% of Christian children lose even their minimal faith that they took to college during their beginning semester. But not all of them, thank God. Those who were seriously catechized by their parents who lived the life of the church, they, they prayed in the house, they lived the divine liturgy and the sacramental life of the church, and they stay close to a spiritual father, then they don't surrender. They hold on, and these young people will not be any different uh, than some of the martyrs of the past. These few Daniel-like young men and women will be considered martyrs, just like Joseph of Egypt, Susanna, Daniel, and his three companions. And God will give them wisdom and grace as well, because God does not show favoritism from century to century. They will be compensated, much like Daniel, who was full of wisdom and understanding. Three years after his palace training, he was more wise than all the wise men and the Chaldeans of his uh, country that he was living in, Babylon. His initial self-control, obedience, and resolve to adhere to the commandments of God until the point of blood will elevate Daniel into one of the great and major prophets, regardless of today's unbiblical and unchurch and even atheist scholars. Last week, we presented Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks, an amazing prophecy 
of the first coming of Christ. And yet academic scholars will teach in universities today in theological courses that the book contains no genuine prophecies and that the book was written in the second century BC and Daniel didn't really exist as a person and Jonah never really existed as a person and Adam and Eve were not a real person. And fairly soon they will be saying that, well, Christ was also a mythical person. Much like the Chaldeans during Daniel's age, these biblical scholars are representatives of worldly wisdom. And they are not orthodox. They do not have godly wisdom. They conjecture based on their intellect, intellectual knowledge. And according to St. James, such knowledge can be very demonic. Nine truths, one lie. A hundred truths, ten lies, much like our news media today. This is why it is extremely important today to stay connected to a traditional spiritual father, not only when you're at a university, but all throughout our lives. And we need to maintain a rule of daily prayer because the days are evil. The Orthodox Church and Christ himself acknowledges Daniel was one of the major prophets along with Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. They're called major prophets because their books are much lengthier than the 12 minor prophets who are not of a lesser significance because their message is of equal value. Now, Christ himself makes several references from the apocalyptic work of prophet Daniel regarding the abomination of desolation, standing in a holy place, meaning the work of the Antichrist, as we will see, towards the end of this series, and Christ will not be referring to a person that never existed. Today's topic includes a prophecy regarding thousands of years of world history. Daniel will reveal to the amazed king of Babylon that the main three empires that will follow his Neo-Babylonian empire. Sometimes we may get the impression that God is somehow outside of world history, or at least limited inside the things of the church. God is not limited at all, and he often uses sinful and godly and even depraved people to bring his plan to fruition. In the final analysis, everything serves the plan of God. In our present talk, we will see how God revealed a dream to Nebuchadnezzar with a prophetic dimension, and a real prophet was needed to interpret this dream. This dream needed to be recorded in history because it was not a dream concerning a year or two, but at least 600 years of world history. Here in this dream, it becomes obvious once again that prophecy and the future belongs to God and to those who receive the prophetic gift, the gift of prophecy. This formidable, fearless king who made everyone tremble in front of him was now terrified by a dream, a nightmare. Now, dreams are often the continuation of our daily or evening thoughts, and that's why it's a good idea to read something very positive and avoid any kind of bad pictures or uh, a lot of dramatic pictures right before you go to sleep because, you know, some of our dreams will be influenced by those pictures. So this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he went to sleep wondering what would happen to his vast dynasty after he dies. Now, this is, he, he must not be very old because this is happening in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, the second year of his reign. So he's having these thoughts, who would be able to succeed him and uh, who would be able to replace him? And of course, this is very human. We can wonder what will happen to our children and grandchildren, what would happen to our flock if we happen to be a priest or in a position of ecclesiastical authority. Who would take our place and how well will they do? So Nebuchadnezzar went to sleep with these thoughts 
And in the course of the night, he had a nightmare that shook him up, took his sleep away. So the next day, he was still shaken by that experience, but somehow God erased the content of the, of the dream from his memory. So being quite demanding and arrogant as a despot, as a king of kings, as Daniel will call him, he immediately called all his magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, all the wise men, the Chaldeans to appear in front of him at once. And he began to relate to them that he had this terrible dream the night before. He says, last night I had a dream and my spirit was troubled, but I somehow can't remember it. Its content is gone from me. Well, the Chaldeans and the wise men of his time, the intellectual and spiritual echelon, told the king, king, Please try to remember this dream. You must remember your dream. And once you tell us what the dream is, then we will begin to interpret it for you. Not knowing your dream, it is humanly impossible to be able to help you. Now the Chaldeans and the priests of the idols answer correctly and logically. And they farther said, there's not a single man upon the earth that can fulfill this request. You see, their experience is limited. They have no idea about the true God either. And in order to kind of protect themselves, they also said, and dear king, no such demand has been made of anyone else in the whole world. No king, lord, nor ruler asked such a thing of any magician or astrologer, or Chaldean. The king requires something extremely rare, and the answer cannot be provided by any human, but only by gods who dwell in heaven. It sounded reasonable, but not, to, but not very convincing to a king who was very much used to having his way. He became furious, irate, and immediately he began to threaten them with their life. He said, if you cannot comply with this request, I have no use for you as king's advisor. Well, they were subsidized by the national treasury, so the king felt that he had the right to be demanding. And he said, I will cut you in pieces and your houses will be made a dunghill. The king was furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Unfortunately, this included Daniel, Hananiah, Meshel, and Azariah, because they were also included in the wise men of uh, Babylon. And they were also supported by the national treasury. The decree was final, and when Daniel became informed, he approached Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, who was already beginning to slay the wise men of Babylon. It seems that Daniel was absent during this entire ordeal because the captain of the guard had to make the, this thing known to Daniel in chapter 2, verse 15. And Daniel asked, why is the, is the decree of the king so severe? Then Ariok made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and besought the king to appoint him a time that he might show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went home and shared the uh, information with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy of of the God of heaven, because their very life was at stake. So after a night's fervent prayer, the secret of the king was revealed to Daniel, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. 
He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. After this Thanksgiving prayer, Daniel rushed to Ariok, the king's ex executioner, and his first words were not, I got it, or we have the answer, or take me to the king. His first words were, destroy not the wise men of Babylon. This, this was what was in Daniel's heart. His primary concern was these people who were going to be executed. This shows the caliber of Daniel's heart. His heart was full of love for people who were not of the same faith, people who would later even become jealous of him. But his heart and soul was out for them and their families. Their well-being was a priority to him. This is so characteristic of the people of God of all ages. They are genuine children of the God of love. So he says, please stop the killing. I'm ready to give the king the interpretation. Now, someone can rightfully ask, why did God have to reveal his future plan to a ruthless and arrogant idolater like Nebuchadnezzar? Why not reveal his plan through Daniel, who was a prophet and so much holier than Nebuchadnezzar. The plan of God is often served by sinful and ungodly people, as already mentioned, because a prophecy can be made even by the mouth of a sinful person. Pharaoh of Egypt is also a type of the devil and an antichrist who persecuted the people of God. Yet God gave him the dreams with the seven fat cows and the seven thin cows and the seven wheats, the heads of wheat. And if these dreams were given to Joseph instead, who would believe Joseph, who was in the darkest jail of that time? And if the dream of Nebuchadnezzar were given to Daniel, a mere captive in uh, Babylon, how would this be of any significance? These events would not go any farther than a couple thousand people, perhaps, the company of Daniel and the, uh, and the Jewish community. But now, because these dreams terrified Nebuchadnezzar, the king of kings, now the whole world is going to be informed because the king's palace will publicize these dreams. We had a similar incident with Balaam, the magician, the sorcerer who uh, was invited by Balak to use sorcery and witchcraft uh, against, against the Israelites. So uh, the Midianite king wanted him to cast a spell on the Jews to curse them. We'll find this in the book of Numbers. Yet Balaam, who did not become godly by this uh, prophecy, eventually was killed by the Jews. And regardless of that, he spoke amazing Christological prophecies about the star of Bethlehem, the, uh, about the dawning of a bright star from a tribe of Judah. So this is uh, a tradition that the, Ma the Magi, who came from Mes Mesopotamia, received perhaps uh, hundreds of years before Daniel. But I also believe, you know, it seems probable that these Magi who were in Persia were also aware of the book uh, and the Messianic prophecy of Daniel about the 70 weeks. And they were able, and of course, by the uh, illumination of God to come and bring the three gifts to the Messiah. In a final analysis, it's important to understand that everything serves the plan of God. In our days, most of us have been convinced by our media uh, which is often in the service of the evil one, that Assad, the president of Syria, is a 
supposedly a criminal and a terrorist, a monster, a killer who hates his people, much like the propaganda that we heard a decade ago about Iraq and, um, you know, chemical weapons, etc. Now, according to our local Syrian priest, Father Anthony, Assad of Syria knows the abbess of a nearby monastery. I am not sure of the name of that monastery, and I would not reveal it if I knew anyway, because of obvious reasons. And one night, two summers ago, the abbess heard a persistent knock on her door at one o'clock in the morning. And she heard a man's voice asking her to open. She reluctantly opened the door and the president of Syria was standing in front of her. She knows him well. So she asked, Mr. President, uh, is there a problem? Where's your chauffeur? Uh, how did you get here all by yourself? He said, no, there's no problem. I drove here all by myself because this is a private matter between me and God. I heard a voice inside of me telling me to come here at your monastery to pray. So I will go to the chapel. I will stay for one hour and please let me know when that hour is up so I can go back before anyone notices that I am gone. I want this to stay very private. Again, this story was told to me by Father Anthony Sabat, our neighbor uh, Antiochian priest here in uh, the Allentown, Pennsylvania area, who knows the abbess extremely well and visits her quite often. I mention this story to help us understand that not a leaf drops without the full knowledge of God. And we need to, uh, to, to help ourselves to expel our rationalism and stop believing everything we hear on the worldwide, worldwide deception on the screens called television and internet. Daniel reveals to us in his prayer that God is the one who changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. So much about climate warming and all these things. You know, we that's not so dangerous. The most dangerous thing in this world is our sinfulness against God, our sins, and not because God controls and changes times and seasons. He changes presidents and dictators if necessary. But let's get back to Daniel now, who tells the king, my king, may you live forever. Of course, this was idiomatic speech of that time. And he tells Nebuchadnezzar that, the one who reveals mysteries is God and God alone. I must also tell you, my king, that I don't have any special wisdom more so than your other wise men. This knowledge does not come from me, but God has revealed to me this knowledge so I can share it with you. Again, we see the modesty and humility and meekness of Daniel honesty, modesty, and humility that brought Nebuchadnezzar to bow down to venerate this 20-year-old youth of Israel at their meeting, at the end of this meeting. The builder of the Babylonian Empire, the king of kings of that time, fell down prostrate at the feet of this young captive Judean. So Daniel is not phased by anything, but he insists that I don't have anything more to offer you, more than my contemporaries. Everything that I will tell you comes from God. So Daniel's humility attracted the grace of God. God opposes the proud, but gives more grace to the humble. Daniel has a pure heart. He's not an opportunist. He does not use this event, this incident, to have the king's favor. He doesn't ask for it. And now he begins to interpret the dream. You, a king, saw a great statue, 
and the face of this statue was glorious and formidable. The head of this statue was composed of the highest quality of gold. The hands and the chest and the shoulders were made of silver. The waist, the stomach, and the upper legs were made of bronze. The lower legs were made of iron, and the feet were partly iron and partly clay. Now let's pay attention here to the downgrade of materials. We go from gold, silver, bronze, the waist, iron, and clay. And Daniel continues. You were seeing this great image, and suddenly a stone was cut without hands from a nearby mountain. It propelled itself toward the statue. It struck the statue at the feet of clay and iron and turned the feet into dust first. And then the entire statue fell with such a great force that the iron, bronze, silver, gold turned into fine dust and vanished. Subsequently, the stone that struck the statue grew into a huge mountain and filled the entire earth. And now we will reveal the interpretation of this dream before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. You are this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar was truly an amazing king. He conquered every other king of that era. And everybody trembled in front of him. He was a great warrior and God has given all these things into his hands. So as we can see, God is part of world history. He's part of the Asian history, European history, American history, of course. And we need a very pure heart to come close to the volitions of God to understand that God is the Lord of history. But God is righteous. And God is the Lord of time and space. And now Daniel continues that, yes, you're a great king. You're the golden king. But after you, there will be another kingdom inferior to yours. After that, there will be another kingdom. And that king will conquer the entire earth. There will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. And it will crush the others. So these are the three successive kingdoms uh, after the fall of Babylon. The uh, Middle Persians, and that's where we get the two hands, silver, the Greeks, the bronze, and the Romans. And during, during the king of the fourth kingdom, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. What an amazing prophecy, 600 years before Christ. This is the prophecy. During the Roman kingdom, during the fourth kingdom after the fall of Babylon, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom during the reign of a Roman king. Now, let's listen to the scripture account that fulfills this prophecy. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and Lysanias the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. So we can see how the evangelist writes down all this historical evidence. The Spirit of God is behind all this. All these real governors and real people to solidify our faith about this event that was prophesied 600 years before Christ. No other faith can do this. And Daniel continues in his chapter 2 of his book. You watched the king while a stone 
A rock was cut out without hands. A rock broke off, was hewn off a nearby mountain without human hands. All of our church fathers agree that the spontaneous breakage of the rock from the mountain symbolize, symbolizes the virgin birth of Christ. Christ's birth without the intervention of a man. The rock Christ came forth from the unhewn mountain called the Most Holy Theotokos and Ever Virgin Mary. You watched the king while a stone, a rock, was cut out without hands. And the rock is Christ, according to St. Paul. This is the rock that got placed on Mount Zion, which is another prophecy. This is the rock that will crush all those who get in the way. It crushed the Roman Empire in less than 300 years. The new Babylon, goddess Rome, was drowned by the blood of the martyrs who followed the rock. In less than four centuries, the heathen Roman Empire was miraculously transformed into the Rome, the Roman Christian Empire. The Nazarene prevailed as Julian the Apostate confessed when he was desperately trying to revive his pagan gods. Julian said while he was dying, the Nazarene has defeated me. And the rock Christ will defeat Marxism, communism, Zionism, all the isms. All these will be pulverized according to the prophecy of Daniel. Christ himself said, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone in Psalm 118, 22. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes, in Matthew 21, 42. And Peter said, you are the rock and on this rock, Christ rather said to Peter, Peter, you are the rock and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Christ is the rock, and that rock became a mountain and filled the entire earth. The gospel has been translated to over 1,400 languages, because Christ told his disciples to go out and make disciples of all nations, regardless of the merciless persecution in Egypt, in Turkey, in Indonesia, in Albania, and the entire world, the gospel is winning souls. And the prophecy of Daniel tells us that the mountain, the rock, will turn all the enemies into chaff, all the persecutors. And the final persecution will be the greatest. When the evil one, the opposer of Christ, who failed in heaven, he will now attempt to raise his throne upon the earth because his pride is incurable. He tried to place his throne in heaven and there he failed miserably and now he wants to be worshipped on earth. He failed with Christ, but in the end he will succeed to be worshipped by the Antichrist and most of the people on this earth. So at the end of this meeting, King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. And the king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. So Nebuchadnezzar is amazed. He believes that the God of Daniel is a most powerful God, but of course he does not have the revelation that he is the only God. So he simply places the God of Daniel a bit higher than his own gods, Marduk and the Pantheon of Babylon. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Of course, and he saved their lives, so they should be uh, very appreciative at this point. 
Also, Daniel petitioned the king. And again, here is the greatness of Daniel. He doesn't forget. He doesn't forget his three companions. He asked the king to also give them a position. So the king set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, now these are their Babylonian names, over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. He stayed in the palace as one of the king's chief advisors. In a future talk, we will, we will be able to, uh, to see details about these three vast empires, these empires that will subdue Judea for a span of 600 years, the empire of the Persians, the, the Middle Persians, the empire of the Greeks, the Romans, and their leaders. Daniel saw all this in an amazing vision, in his vision of the four beasts. At the end of chapter 2, in the book of Daniel, we left an overwhelmingly impressed King Nebuchadnezzar by Daniel's wisdom, and we saw him actually making a confession of faith. Of a truth, your God is a God of gods and Lord of kings who reveals mysteries, for thou hast been able to reveal this mystery of the statue with a golden head. Now, 18 years later, according to Septuagint, this monarch wished to thank his favorite god Marduk. He seems like he forgot all about the greatness of Daniel, and he wishes to thank his favorite god Marduk, who happens to be the patron of Babylon. So he used a huge quantity of gold, the gold that he plundered from all the neighboring nations, which he subdued during his military operations. And he constructed a huge gold statue about 90 feet tall and about 10 feet wide. And all this with the highest grade of gold. Now let's read the text in the beginning of chapter 3. In his 18th year, Nebuchadnezzar the king made a golden image. Its height was 60 cubits, its breadth 6 cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And he sent forth to gather the governors and the captains and the heads of provinces, chiefs and princes, and those who were in authority, and all the rulers of districts to come to the dedication of the image. Interestingly enough, Herodotus, the historian, the Greek historian, writes about a gold statue of mythical worth, about 800 talents. Now, I'm not sure if this was the same statue here in chapter 3 of Daniel. But why pure gold and why all this expense? It seems that Nebuchadnezzar, was very much impressed about the vision and him being the golden head of that very high and grotesque statue that he saw 18 years before. He was already an egomaniac to begin with, but now after Daniel told him that he was the golden king, the golden head, it seems that this may have escalated his uh, egotism even more. So, this pushed him to construct such a multi-billion dollar statue by today's standards. So he erected this great golden image outside of Babylon in the plain of Dura, and then he commanded all his subjects, thousands of people from all over the neighboring nations, and there's an interesting statement here, all peoples, nations, and languages to come and worship at the feet of this golden image, the work of the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, this would honor the God of the king, but at the same time, it would also glorify the owner or the erector of this magnificent statue, His Highness King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the great Colossus of Rhodes was only 70 feet tall, and here, Nebuchadnezzar surpasses that height. His statue is at least 90 feet high. 
Incidentally, these are not stories to make our day a little bit more interesting. These are realities and prefigurements of events that we ourselves may have to face. The statement, you are commanded or people's nation and languages, these are words that we find in the book of the Revelation around the topic of the mark of the beast and this golden image that needed to be worshipped if one wished to live is a prefigurement of the Antichrist and his totalitarian regime perfectly served and prefigured by the king of Babylon in the book on Ezra 2600 years ago. Not to mention that the very dimensions of this statue was 60 cubits and 6 cubits. So the number 66 six here is prevalent. And number 6 is the number of a man as opposed to number 7, which is a perfect number or a holy number. And I think this may have something to do with the 666 number, which would be the number of the beast, the number of the name of the beast in the final days. Now, outside of the fact that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to glorify himself by all this, the purpose was also to create a religious unity. At the dedication ceremony of this image, he was to invite all the satraps, all the officials, all the governors, the representatives of all his subservient states, all his taxed satellite nations, to come and worship his God. Now, he did not try to abolish the gods of his conquered nations. The Assyrians could have their own gods, the Medes, the Persians. Uh, they could all hold on to their own beliefs, but along with their gods, they needed to include his god, Marduk. This very principle was practiced by New Babylon, Rome as well, 70, seven centuries later, which also practiced pantheism. Now, this may help us understand why Christians were uh, such misfits in Roman society. They didn't belong. This was the accusation of the Roman masses. You don't belong. Because according to Cicero, it was Rome that chose which gods were valid or not. Your god needed to meet the approval of goddess Rome and or god Caesar. So you could worship Christ as much as you would like, but along with Christ, you also needed to worship Caesar once or twice a year. Then you could maintain your freedom, your property and your lifestyle. By burning some incense to the altar of Caesar, you were free for the rest of the year. So some Christians, the Lapsi, bought this idea and they were excommunicated by the Christian community. The church saw this as spiritual adultery and rightly so because there can only be one bridegroom for the Christian soul. What bridegroom would permit his beloved bride to have adulterous relations with another man once or twice a year. This would be inconceivable in a healthy marital relationship. The God of Israel, and now the same God of the new Israel, the church, does not do well with such relativisms, Gnosticisms, syncretisms, and ecumenisms. The treacherous idea that we don't need to have one specific faith. We can unite all the faiths, pick and choose what we like from each one, and we can enrich ourselves with each other's traditions is the very basis of the worst heresy ever for the Christian church, the heresy of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is this philosophy called knowledge from the Greek, word, the Greek letter G, gnosis which characterizes all the followers of Lucifer, including the modern-day Masons who are self-admitted Luciferians. The people of God use true knowledge and live by faith. They don't exclude knowledge, but they don't stop at the principle knowledge. Knowledge is a stepping stone to help us know the true God, our Creator, and develop a relationship of love with Him. So this mystery is not revealed to the clay-bound Christians who rationalize that all religions are divisive. So if we set aside our dogmatic differences and worship God under one roof, then we can enjoy years of peace. 
In the 70s, there was uh, much talk about building a temple to house all major religions, one house uh, of worship with four or five different wings, one for the Roman Catholics, one for the Protestants, Orthodox, the Jews, and the Muslims, all five religions under the same roof. The purpose? To enhance unity, understanding, and love between all peoples, to eliminate religious friction. This is the great delusion of false ecumenism propagated by Zionism. This is highly utopic because, if I remember correctly, Europe was predominantly Christian last century. Now, did the peoples of Europe enjoy peace and tranquility on account of their common Christian values and religion? I think not. World War I, World War II, the English against the Irish, the Greeks against the Bulgarians, the Serbs against the Croatians, they mutilated each other for decades and they were supposedly Christian. So a common religious ideology does not suffice to bring world peace. Only a decade ago, we saw our predominant Protestant and Papist uh, American nations using mostly Christian pilots to bomb our brothers in Serbia, killing thousands of innocent souls. On Eastern Sunday, they were dropping huge bombs on our brothers after they wrote on them, Happy Easter. False ecumenism is not the answer. The church is ecumenical. She embraces every human soul regardless of a national origin that wishes to enter through the mystery of repentance and regeneration. But as the pillar and foundation of the truth, she cannot violate her commission by accepting groups of people who do not wish to abandon their heretical beliefs. False ecumenism has now infected a great number of priests and bishops who never really tasted the spiritual fruit called true love. This is the highest fruit of the Holy Spirit, which does not come without asceticism, prayer, and fasting. In the absence of true spiritual love, people become enslaved to the whims of emotional, humanistic, and ecumenistic love purpose to help us live well upon this earth. So 600 years before Christ, Nebuchadnezzar wished to promote this type of religious ecumenism for the purpose of national unity by forcing the leaders of his subjugated kingdoms to share in his faith. He thought this would be a great way to cement his sovereignty. Once people embraced Marduk, then it would be very difficult for them to attack Babylon because they would have the wrath of her god. And it seems that history repeats itself because the great king Solomon attempted this very strategy. So, According to him, there's nothing new under the sun. Today's European Union started out 30, 40 years ago as an economic treaty. The purpose was to enhance the economies of the neighboring nations. That was the promise initially. 30, 40, 40 years later, it tells these nations what laws to have, what to believe. It imposes its polity on member nations, and it superimposes its ethics over and above the religious beliefs of each member nation. The demonic masterminds of the New World Order have succeeded in the removal of all Christian symbols from the public sector of all these Christian nations. The cross, the Ten Commandments, the Bible, and the Christmas tree have vanished from the streets, parks, and plazas of Christian nations, areas built and repaired and maintained by Christian tax dollars. The ACLU and its high-paid attorneys who litigated away all Christian symbols based on the lame excuse of separation of church and state have no problem with Talmudic rabbis erecting a 40-foot-high menorah at the lawn of the White House every December. And of course, these rabbis are accompanied by a prominent head of state, according to monk Brother Nathaniel, a rather interesting convert to orthodoxy from Judaism. Again, this is nothing new. 
It is not very different than the plan of Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, you can be a Jew, be a Christian, but don't need to be so absolute. Yes, believe in a higher power, but you don't need to be so dogmatic. Yes, go to church, go to the synagogue, but join the Masons, the Lions, the Rosicrucians, practice a little Hinduism or yoga. These are all expressions of the one God. But 2,600 years ago, three pious children, uke son, they did not go along with this mentality. These three glorious young men who inspire every hymnographer of our church, these three eternal youths inspired St. Basil, St. John the Chrysostom, St. Cosmas the Melodist, Rom Romanos the Melodist, St. Andrew of Crete. These three young people were anti-cumanists. They believed in absolute truth, in an absolute God because their spirit was imbued by the Holy Spirit of the Holy Trinity, the God of their fathers, who is a jealous God and does not unite with souls that flirt with idols and refuse to detach themselves from the pollution of this age. These three dynamic youths stood up to the most powerful men of the world under the worst possible conditions. Anyone who does not bow down to this statue will be cast into the burning fiery furnace that was right next to them. As the king's orchestra began to play with all these different instruments, thousands of people bowed down and only three young people stood tall. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah did not feel that it was harmless to worship at the feet of this golden image. Then came near certain Chaldeans and accused the Jews to the king, saying, O king, live forever. Thou, king, has made a decree that every man who shall hear the sound of the trumpet and pipe and harp and sackbut and psaltery and all kinds of music and shall not fall down and worship the golden image shall be cast into the burning fiery furnace. Well, guess what, O king? There are certain Jews whom thou hast appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Sedrach, Mesach, and Abdenago, who have not obeyed thy decree, O king. They serve not thy gods and worship not the golden image which thou hast set up. After these three youths were brought in front of him, full of wrath, he asked them, and who's going to save you from me? What God can save you from my hands? Is it true that you serve not my gods and worship not the golden image which I have set up? Now, I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to do this one more time for you. And if you don't obey, if you don't fall down, then you will be thrown in a furnace. And who's going to save you? What God is going to save you? The answer of the three youths is astounding. Your Majesty, if our God wants to save us, that's up to him. But if he wants to incinerate us because of the multitude of our sins, praise be his name. Nebuchadnezzar now is full of wrath. This is incredulous. You cannot believe this. He's furious. After all, he developed these young people in his own palace. He fed them from his own food, his own menu, his own wine. He educated them. He promoted them to governors. He gave them everything. How dare they to disobey him in front of his international staff? Nebuchadnezzar saw this as an unforgivable sin. Bind them up all together with strong ropes and throw them in the furnace. How quickly did he forget about the God of Daniel, who revealed those amazing dreams to him 18 years prior to this event. Again, the three youths were betrayed by their colleagues, perhaps the ones that helped save years ago with their prayers. Now, Daniel is not to be found anywhere in this chapter. He was probably away on Kings on the king's business, so he was not cast in a furnace, but his envious colleagues will cast him into the uh, lion den years later. St. John the Chrysostom, the golden mouth of the church, comments, the anger of the king worked in the favor of the three youths. By increasing the temperature sevenfold, this is what the uh, 
the anger in the book on Ezra said, you know, increase the fire, the, the temperature of the furnace, throw in more asphalt, throw in more tar and more petroleum and get the temperature as high as possible. That's what seven times means. So after this, by doing this, he was doing him a favor because he would be reducing their martyrdom. If he really wanted to torture them, he would have he would have them sizzle slowly with a slow fire. But now by making the furnace burn seven times higher, this would reduce their martyrdom to less than a minute or so. So they tied them up with ropes and they threw threw them in a furnace fully dressed. Nebuchadnezzar had asked them, and who is your God who will save you from my hands? Poor pitiful Nebuchadnezzar, the same God that made the oxygen that you breathe, the same God you fell down and worshipped 18 years ago, the same God who created all natural laws, the same God who created fire, the same God created all these things with his uncreated creational energy. The presence of his uncreated energy neutralizes all physical, biological, and chemical reactions. The uncreated light of God created a beautiful paradise, a space capsule around young Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The earthly fire burned what did not belong to them. It burned the ropes of the king. The heavenly fire protected every stitch of their clothing, even their Jewish caps. Who is as great a God as our God? Where God intervenes, when the kingdom of God manifests itself, all corruption ceases. Nature reverses and returns to its our charitable beauty. The kingdom of God, Christ himself, the angel of the Lord, appeared in the midst of the furnace, and the flames became incorrupt. The holy fire was soothing and exhilarating. The three youths were full of grace, and Azariah's fully inspired began to compose one of the greatest hymns of our church. Our church savors this hymn in the service of the first resurrection during the Matins of Holy Saturday, and we'll try to include it at the end of this talk. So the angel of the Lord, Christ before the incarnation, the Lord of glory, humbled the arrogance of the Chaldeans and their king. Our God is consuming fire, and he needed to empty himself. So natural creation would not be incinerated, according to St. Isaac the Syrian. This historical event that took place 26 centuries ago prefigures the mystery of God's incarnation. Just like the three youths and even their robes, their clothing did not burn in the same way the Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity, he would enter the universe he would be contained in a tiny place and space without burning and incinerating creation. The uncontainable logos of the Father would contain himself in the womb of the most holy Theotokos. All these mysteries are being prefigured here 2,600 years ago. This is the only thing new under the sun, according to Solomon. The three youths are also symbolic of the Holy Trinity, according to the Katavasias of Pentecost. The gods of Nebuchadnezzar and the nations are powerless demons who sizzled at the presence of God's glory. But the angel of the Lord, our God himself, came to save his three most faithful servants. This prefigures how God the Logos will enter natural creation redeem it and save it just like it saved these three amazing and pious youths. The same mystery was made manifest on Mount Sinai when Moses beheld the burning bush. The angel of the Lord was the messenger of the great council, God's plan of redemption. The bush was the most holy Theotokos who stayed incorrupt by the fire of divinity. When and where God's glory manifests itself, 
it does so perfectly without change and without corruption. The clothing of the three youths remained unchanged, untouched. In the same way, the virginal membrane of the Most Holy Theotokos remained untouched. The body of St. Isaac of Shanghai in San Francisco is incorrupt because God's glory is overshadowing it. The Holy Spirit is permanently dwelling in it. God's presence brings paradise on earth with all its attributes. The holy fire of resurrection in Jerusalem does not burn in the first few minutes, and holy water stays indefinitely fresh. And according to the text, then those men were bound with their coats and caps and hose and were cast into the midst of the burning fire furnace for as much as the king's word prevailed. And the furnace was made exceedingly hot. Then these three men, Shadrach, Mizak, and Abdenego, fell bound into the midst of the burning furnace and walked in the midst of the flame singing praise to God and blessing the Lord. And the book on Ezra heard them sing in praises. And he wondered and rose up in haste and said to his nobles, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they said to the king, Yes, O king. And the king said, But I see four men loose and walking in the midst of the fire, and there has no harm, there is no harm happened to them. And the appearance of the fourth is like the Son of God. The appearance of the fourth is like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar, the impious monarch, saw Christ 2,600 years before the Incarnation. Then Nebuchadnezzar drew near to the door of the burning fire furnace and said, Sedrach, Mizak and Abdenego, ye servants of the Most High God, proceed forth and come here. So Sadrach, Mizak, and Abdenego came forth out of the midst of the fire. Then were assembled the satraps and captains and heads of provinces and the royal princes, and they saw the men and perceived that the fire had not had power against their bodies, and the hair of their head was not burned and their coats were not scorched, nor was the smell of fire upon them. And King Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Sedrach, Mesach, and Abdenego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants because they trusted in him. And they have changed the king's word and delivered their bodies to be burned, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own God. Wherefore, I publish a decree, every people, tribe, or language that shall speak reproachfully against the God of Sadrach, Mizak, and Abdenego shall be destroyed, and their houses shall be plundered, because there is no other God who shall be able to deliver thus. Then the king promoted Sedrach, Mizak, and Abdenego in the province of Babylon and advanced them and gave them authority to rule over all the Jews who were in his kingdom. One thing that we see here is that Nebuchadnezzar is a lot more reasonable than the empire of clay that will come many years after him. Most of the Roman emperors who persecuted Christians they would see miracles time after time again. They would see amazing things, but they would not believe. Almost without fail, they would put the martyrs back in prison, behead them, even after they saw healing after healing. And this is a credit to Nebuchadnezzar, who hundreds of years before, he now humbles himself and bows down to the God of the three youths and the God of Daniel. And then he makes another confession of faith. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all nations, tribes, and tongues who dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It seemed good to me to declare to you the signs and wonders which the Most High God has wrought with me, how great and mighty they are. 
His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his power to all generations. What a great mystery served by the glorious Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. It combines a number of mysteries, the mystery of the Incarnation, the mystery of the Holy Trinity, the mystery of the Theotokos, the mystery of the resurrection of the dead and the restoration of all things. Who is as great a God as the God of the Orthodox faith, a God whose eternal delight was to live with the sons of men? Amen. In a fourth chapter of his book, Daniel once again helps Nebuchadnezzar with another troubling dream. The mighty king of Babylon saw a huge tree in the middle of the earth with great branches, its top reached heaven, and it was visible to the end of the earth. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was thriving in my house and prospering. I saw a vision, and it terrified me, and I was troubled on my bed, and a vision of my head troubled me. And I made a decree to bring in before me all the wise men of Babylon, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. So the enchanters, magicians, soothsayers, and Chaldeans came in, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known to me the interpretation thereof. Until Daniel came, whose name is Balthazar, according to the name of my God, who has within him the Holy Spirit of God, to whom I said. So again, the Chaldeans are clueless about the meaning of the king's vision. And the king calls in Daniel, who is saddened because he does not have the best news for the king. Daniel said, My lord, I wish this dream was for your enemies, but unfortunately, it is all about you. This awesome tree is you, and the tree will be cut down, and you shall be driven away from people. You will be likened to a beast until you humble yourself, until you realize that the kingdom is not the works of your hand, but the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And now Daniel begins to provide the therapeutic discipline to help the king. He says, break off your sins by practicing righteousness. Stop your iniquities and show mercy to the oppressed. Daniel here suggests almsgiving and philanthropy as a way to redeem the book and answer. These are very difficult words to understand for someone who's a Christian, let alone someone outside of Christianity altogether. Humility cannot be found outside of the true faith. It cannot be found even in Christian denominations, let alone outside of Christianity. St. John of the latter says, It is easier to have fire come out of snow than to find true humility in a heretical person. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had knowledge of the true God of Israel. He saw the power of the God of Daniel, but his knowledge remained cerebral, intellectual, not empirical. Pride and arrogance did not exit his heart. As the church fathers teach, humility enters the heart after much failure, humiliation, and pain. So Daniel suggests almsgiving, which is the practical side of love. The basis of all pride and egotism is self-centeredness, selfish love, philaftia in Greek, the excessive love of self. So when I look out for number one, and when I use the people around me to serve my needs, this is a terrible disease, and we all have this to a degree. And now Daniel provides the therapy. He says, King Nebuchadnezzar, In order to heal yourself, you need to exit your self-centeredness. You must turn your love outward towards your fellow man and not inward towards yourself. Feed the poor, show mercy to the homeless, the captives, to the oppressed, to the vulnerable. And as your heart empties of egotism, the God of love will shine his face upon you once again as you begin to humble yourself. Nebuchadnezzar was given a year to do some of these things, but the results were not that great. And after a year, 
Nebuchadnezzar became victimized again from the spirit of pride and conceit. He walked up to the roof of his royal palace and he began to glorify not the God of heaven, but himself. He believed the suggestion of the demonic spirit of pride and he uttered this terrible self-praise. Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the word was yet in the king's mouth, there came a voice from heaven saying, To thee, King Nebuchadnezzar, they say, The kingdom has departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy, thy dwelling shall be with the wild beasts of the field. And they shall feed thee with grass as an ox, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High is Lord of the kingdom of men, and he will give it to whomsoever he shall please. In that same hour the word was fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven forth from men, and he ate grass as an ox, and his body was bathed with the dew of heaven, and his hairs were grown like a lion's hairs, and his nails as bird's claws. So this most powerful king lost his mind. He ate grass like an ox, his hair grew as long as an eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. The scientific name for this disease is insania zoanthropia, a form of insanity where a man acts like a beast. This affliction lasted seven years. It, it more than humbled Nebuchadnezzar, who blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. So after this humbling event, Nebuchadnezzar returned to his kingdom with a full acknowledgement that those who walk in pride, the King of Heaven is able to abase. This was the end of Nebuchadnezzar's great career. It lasted a few decades, and all that glory and might faded into the annals of history. Little did he know that his mighty empire would be one of the shortest ones in history, about 70 years, about the same time as the Babylonian captivity of the Jews. In reality, the real purpose behind this empire was to save the seed of Israel from corruption. The rulers were so corrupt the priests of the people and the scribes who were worshiping idols, according to Ezekiel, who was also a captive in Babylon. He came to Babylon during uh, 586 the BC, the last siege of Nebuchadnezzar. So God's providence empowered Nebuchadnezzar to come and save the pious people, the pious seed of Israel, from their own corrupt rulers who lived in iniquity and idolatry. This should be very familiar to us as Greek Orthodox of Diaspora, the separation from one's country and the nostalgia for their early years make immigrants very zealous for their traditions, ethics, and also religious beliefs. So Nebuchadnezzar was heavily influenced by Daniel and the miracles of the three youths in the furnace, so he was very lenient with all the people who worshipped the God of Daniel. But now Nebuchadnezzar has passed away. And in chapter 5, Daniel tells the story of Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar. That's the name that we see in the Masoretic text. The Septuagint uses the name Balthazar. So Balthazar is the last king of the Babylonian Empire, according to this chapter. But in this chapter, his father, Nabodinus, who also co-reigns with his son, seems to be absent. So only the one king, the second in command, seems to be visible in this chapter 5 of Daniel. And again, a lot of the critics find faults in the Bible because they suppose, they believe that the Bible should really tell all the historical details. The Bible is not interested in the historical details. The Bible is not a book of history, is not a book of archaeology. It is the book of the Word of God. There will be plenty of historical details, so I think it is important to also study history. 
And by studying history, then we will be able to understand the events of that time much better. So again, the last king of the Babylonian Empire is Belshazzar, according to the Masoretic. Who could ever imagine that this formidable empire, who made everyone tremble, would collapse in one short night, only about 70 short years after its inception? And this because his successors did not learn very much from the dealings of Nebuchadnezzar with the God of Israel, as this most impressive story of the book of Daniel will reveal to us. Power and wealth mixed with the love of pleasure are the three major enemies of the human soul, and by extension, the demise of many nations, philodoxia, lust for power, philargeria, greed, philidonia, lust of the flesh and lust of pleasure in general. All these things are the mothers of all passions. Now chapter 5 begins with a royal banquet. Balthazar the king made a great supper for his thousand nobles and there was wine before the thousand. Now many of these rulers of that time, they had a number of feasts throughout the year to honor there are royal chieftains, lords, satraps, allies, nobles. This particular celebration was probably a state feast for the national god Marduk, although this is not very clear in the text. One thousand of his nobles, of his higher echelon, his staff, governors, satraps, top Chaldeans, they were all invited, present, and drinking plenty of wine. These feasts were not necessarily a one-day event. They could go on for days. And the favorite activity that propels these feasts is usually the consumption of alcohol. Of course, they had hors d'oeuvres and a constant supply of food, but the holy text here accentuates the wine because as people drink wine, they begin to lose control. So here the king drank wine in front of the thousand, and wine does gladden the heart of men, in moderation, but excessive drinking makes people lose their modesty, it loosens their tongue, and they usually lose all self-respect. Wine, lustful dancing, and the need to show off made King Herod promise up to half of the empire to the daughter of the adulteress Herodias, who demanded the head of Saint John the Baptizer. Belshazzar wished to entertain his esteemed guests, and in his stupor he thought of something very demonic, very horrible. Now during these festivities, small portions or libations were poured out to the pagan gods. Belshazzar remembered of all the vessels of gold and silver that his grandfather confiscated from the Temple of Solomon. He commanded that all these hundreds of uh, holy vessels made of gold and silver, something like our holy chalices today, be brought to him so he can use them to glorify the gods of silver and gold, his pagan gods. And the king and his staff, his wives and his concubines began to drink from these holy vessels. Such a terrible sacrilege was never even imagined by Nebuchadnezzar who kept them locked up in his treasury. And this is the importance of Daniel. Daniel was next to Nebuchadnezzar all the time. He was in the palace. And that's why Nebuchadnezzar revered the God of Daniel, regardless, in spite of the fact that he never really believed in the God of Daniel altogether. And along with the God of Daniel, he had his own gods. But now his intoxicated grandson does the unthinkable. He wants to use vessels of worship of the God of Israel to impress his wives, his concubines, and guests during a very sinful and prodigal feast. Now, this was a great sacrilege indeed. Imagine the degree of sacrilege to have sinful and impious people remove holy chalices from one of our churches to use them as wine cups while drinking with friends. This is the utmost sacrilege, much worse than stealing, lying, and killing even. The violation of the first four commandments is far worse because the violation is against God himself. The violation of the other six commandments, starting from honor your father and your mother, is simply a sin. But the violation of the first up to the fourth commandment refers to our relation with God himself. And it is not simply a sin 
but a great sacrilege or impiety. Now, God punishes impiety and sacrilege far worse than the common sin, as we see in many areas of the Holy Scripture. Remember the poor man Uzzah in the Old Testament who tried to put his hand on the Ark of the Covenant. At some point, the oxen tripped. He tried to put his hands on the Ark of the Covenant, and he was instantly struck dead. How about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who rebelled against the priesthood of Aaron and Moses. They were demanding that they also be allowed to celebrate as priests. The earth opened up and swallowed their entire clan, relatives, wives, friends, children, up to 200 people. You'll find this in Numbers chapter 16 and 17. And in the New Testament, for those who insist that God never punishes. Now, what happened to Sapphire and Ananias in the fifth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles when they lied to the Holy Spirit? Ananias, is this how much you sold your land for? Yes. Sapphire, is this true? Yes. They both lied. They were going to tell the church that they only sold their field for 5,000, let's say, give that to the church, and then they would pocket the rest because they did not trust in God. And immediately, St. Peter told them that the Holy Spirit of God is going to take your life at this moment. And these two poor people died instantly because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And how about Herod Agrippa, the grandson of Herod, when at some great event, one of his pitiful subjects flattered him during a public address. This is the voice of God and not of men. Herod apparently accepted this groveling instead of giving glory to God, and an angel of God struck him down, as we read in Acts 12, 20, and he was eaten by worms, by maggots. So Belshazzar and his guests were not simply drinking out of the holy vessels, but they were using these holy vessels of the true God to offer glory and honor to their idols, the gods of Babylon, the gods of silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And the true God of Israel does not do well with idols. He usually destroys them. So at that very moment, the forbearance of God was exhausted. God was patient for about 40 years. From a time that God answered, plunder the holy temple of Solomon from its holy vessels. This event that we are describing here took place about 20 years after Nebuchadnezzar was struck by insanity due to his immense pride. He ruled another 20 years before that. So for about 40 years, God does not show his wrath. He waits until the cup fills to the brim. The cup can fill even above the brim due to surface tension the very physical law that makes water drops look round on the hood of an automobile. So the cup can be full to the brim, and we can continue to carefully add many drops. But there comes a time when even one more drop, one more drop can make those hundreds of drops above the brim spill over. And even though we added one more drop, we don't lose just one drop out of the glass, but we use hundreds, a multitude of drops. So God's wrath spilled at that very moment when the king and his nobles did the unthinkable. Immediately, the fingers of a man's hand severed at the wrist appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand, opposite where the king was sitting. And the king saw this hand as it wrote. Then the king became as yellow as a lemon. He was struck by fear. His knees began to knock together and his limbs gave away. He was ready to faint from this metaphysical fear. The overall festive atmosphere of this sinful gala event changed into an atmosphere of a funeral. The king is looking for consolation. He cried out, bring in the enchanters, the magicians, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. Not a single one of them could make any sense out of those mysterious words written on the wall. And now the king became even more desperate, and his satraps and governors and allies are perplexed and worried. Now these poor nobles, all these participants in this great assembly, they were not godless. 
They believed in idols, but idol worship does not purify the heart, does not heal the soul from pride and vainglory. And now the God of Israel, the creator of these souls, comes to deflate them from their soul-killing spirit of pride, even if for a few hours before their death. This reminds us a similar sinful party with Herod Antipas, who beheaded St. John the Baptist. You all know the events that led to that beheading of the baptizer. But what you may not know is that when the head of the baptizer was served on a platter to Herodias, the evil woman who was sitting next to her adulterous husband, the severed head of St. John continued to speak and reprove Herod, who was guilty enough to begin with. The festive atmosphere turned to grief and deep sadness, according to the hymns of the church that tell us the story. Fear and trembling overtook the participants of that unholy assembly. Likewise, King Belshazzar was hysterical, and in his helplessness, he cried out, Anyone who can read this language and give me the meaning, give me the interpretation, will wear the royal gold necklace and he will be promoted third in command of the entire kingdom. No one was found to offer any relief to the fear-struck king. Now, what happened to the sorcerers, to the magicians, to the wizards, to the astrologers? They are more silent than fish. If our Greek Orthodox would only read the Bible, in the very least, they would save thousands, if not millions of dollars that line the pockets of these crooks, of these card readers, magicians, astrologers. To this day, these imposters and servants of the evil one dare to advertise on TV channels to help people, to supposedly help people with their finances, with their marriages, or with their luck or their future. And our baptized Orthodox run to them like flies on a fly trap. For the flies, that's understandable. They don't have much of a brain. But we would expect a little bit more out of our baptized Orthodox. Now, if these servants of the evil one could tell you your future, if they have knowledge of the future, then why don't they guess the winning number of the next $300 million lottery? Why can't they go to the casino and become rich overnight since they can supposedly read cards? Why can't they find all the hidden treasures in the world? But instead, they are sitting in their dark little rooms to rob you and all your poor friends that you sent to them. At some point, Nebuchadnezzar had the right idea. He was ready to exterminate all of them. But thanks to Daniel, they were spared. But now Daniel is forgotten. Nebuchadnezzar died quite a few years ago, and a number of new kings came and went. Some lasted a few months, some were poisoned, killed, some lasted a year or two, and Daniel was remembered no more. But Daniel was a man of faith. He did not advertise himself. He did not have an About Me page. Daniel overcame the passion of vainglory and the need to be in a limelight. He did not feel a need to be first. He was probably much happier this way because he had much more time to intensify his prayer for his people and the freedom of Jerusalem. But now the news of this shaking king reached his mother, the queen, who was in an adjacent room, and she ran to the rescue of the king, her son, and said, O king, live forever. And she begins to tell him about Daniel. Now, isn't it amazing that dozens of the Chaldeans and enchanters and wizards who knew Daniel, some of them were saved by him. They mentioned nothing to the king about Daniel. They were seeing their king suffering, ready to faint in sheer agony, but not a word about Daniel because of jealousy. And jealousy is a child of pride. No, we don't want anyone over our head. Daniel was the chief of the magicians long enough so the demonic poison of pride and jealousy. And we saw this with the scribes and the Pharisees. But why did you heal this woman on the Sabbath? Why did you heal the paralytic during the Sabbath? Why did you have to resurrect Lazarus? Pride and jealousy uproots all love from the heart. What a terrible disease, St. John the Chrysostom says. 
the one who fornicates gains some temporary pleasure. Okay, it's sinful. The one who steals receives some benefit from his sin. There's some justification. But the jealous person receives nothing, nothing at all. And quite often he self-destructs because this is terrible for his health. So the colleagues of Daniel were jealous of him. They did not want Daniel, a mere Hebrew captive, to be over their heads and more glorious than them. Then the queen came into the banquet house and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, and let not thy countenance be changed. His face kind of changed. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the Spirit of God. And in the days of thy father, watchfulness and understanding were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, made him chief of the enchanters, magicians, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. And here I need to clear up some of the confusion that usually ex exists among uh, the biblical scholars and uh, people who read the text literally. Here we see the word queen. So a lot of people are going to assume that well, the queen is the wife of Belshazzar. If she happens to be the wife of Belshazzar, then how come she has knowledge of Daniel while the king does not? This shows us that she's most likely his mother, the wife of his father, Nabodinus, because we have two kings here. Nabodinus happens to be away on some affairs. He's not present in his feast, and that's why Belshazzar will give the person that answers this puzzle the third place in the kingdom. His father, Nabodinus, is the first king. Belshazzar is vice king, second in command. And then if Daniel could answer and solve this puzzle, then Daniel would be third in command. So the queen is the mother of Belshazzar. And we have another problem here. The problem is that he's called the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Little do they know that in Aramaic, we don't have a word for grandfather. We don't have a word for grandson. So all the descendants of Nebuchadnezzar are called sons of Nebuchadnezzar. So somebody can be a great grandson of Nebuchadnezzar and he can be called a son. Just like all the Jews, the Israelites, they called Abraham their father. Abraham is our father, they told Jesus, they told Christ. And by this, they meant that they were descendants of Abraham and, of course, not literal sons. And according to Josephus, the Jewish historian, there were a number of kings after Nebuchadnezzar, the last being Nabodinus, who is the father of Belshazzar. This is also in agreement with Jeremiah's prophecy when he said about Nebuchadnezzar, all nations will serve him and his son and his grandson. Then many nations will subjugate him. So Belshazzar is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar and the final king of Babylon. So king, live forever. There is in your kingdom a man in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, according to the Masoretic. Your grandfather made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams and riddles were found in this Daniel. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show you the interpretation. So Daniel was called and came before the king. Can you read these three words and tell me what they mean? If you can do this, I will clothe you with purple and have a chain of gold about your neck and you shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered before the king, I don't really need your gifts, O king. I will give you the answer, regardless, irrespective of your gifts. Now what Daniel wanted to say by this, that I will not be blinded by your offers and gifts. I will tell you the truth 
and your gifts will not keep me from telling you the bitter truth. O King, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your grandfather, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. All peoples, nations, and tribes trembled and feared before him. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened, so that he dealt proudly, he lost it all. He was driven from among men, and his mind was like that of a beast. His dwelling was with the wild donkeys and foxes. He ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Until he knew that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and sets over it whom he will. At the end of last week's session, we left Daniel telling Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, that when his grandfather's heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he lost it all. He was driven from among men and his mind was like that of a beast. But Nebuchadnezzar repented. Not only did he repent, but he gave an amazing confession of faith at the end of chapter 4 after his repentance. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me, I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he's able to put down. Quite an amazing confession from a king who is basically still an idolater. Once again, Nebuchadnezzar believed in the God of Israel, but he did not stop worshiping all his other false gods. He simply put the God of Israel above uh, these other idols, and this for a short while, and in due time, he went back to his idol worship. Now, idols are organically connected to earthly human desires and passions. And this struggle affects all of us as we try to practice our faith. Because most of us, during the week, we have to deal with all kinds of things that take us away from God. Sometimes we're fixed on our careers, on the stock market, the Wall Street, uh, sports, and various other activities, uh, our favorite uh, entertainment, movies, and so on. And uh, on Sunday morning, of course, we go to church out of a sense of duty. We all fall short of the first commandment. We cannot possibly love God with all our heart and mind and strength if we do not detach ourselves from the constant preoccupation with our everyday modern idols and attach it to the constant memory of God like Joseph, Daniel, and Susanna. This is why the Lord offered this directive to the apostles who were concerned about the end times. Menistiti tis ginekos lot, remember Lot's wife and avoid her plight. She was more attracted and attached to her home and her property, and her heart was fixed on her possessions more so than on the first commandment of God. She believed in God, but her heart loved her earthly belongings more so than her creator. The home and her belongings became her master. And uh, this is very important because I believe that a lot of us today, a lot of us uh, in this 21st 
century Christianity, I believe, uh, were not much different than Lot's wife. And that's why we really need to begin to combat these dangerous intruders, these passions that enslave our souls and attempt to separate us from our Lord and Creator, Jesus Christ. And now Daniel proceeds to reprove uh, the king, Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And you, O king, his descendant, you have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, you knew about what happened to your grandfather, but you chose to lift up yourself against the Lord of heaven, against the Lord of Israel. You dared to use the holy vessels of his holy temple to entertain your lords, your concubines, your governors, and to offer praise to your gods of silver and gold, bronze, iron, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. Listen, listen to the confession of Daniel. He tells this king that your, your gods are basically worthless. They cannot see, they cannot hear. This is amazing. But the God in whose hand is your breath, you have not honored. What an amazing revelation through the Holy Spirit, through Daniel. Listen to this amazing revelation. Let us all listen to this again. But the God in whose hand is your breath, you have not honored. And we really need to study the scripture because sometimes we tend to forget that our breath is in the hand of God. Sometimes we think that if we just take the right vitamins, if we do the proper exercise, if we consume everything organic, watch our diet, do everything just properly, we will be vibrant for the rest of our lives. And we always forget the most important factor in all this, the will of God in our lives. And here Daniel comes to set us straight from 26 centuries ago. But the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you do not honor. How revealing. Again, most of us Orthodox today honor our dietitians, our doctors, and uh, our cardiologists much more than the voice of our God. We ignore the voice of the church that asks us to honor the fast, to abstain from meat and eggs and milk for half of the year. We ignore the fast until a cardiologist or our family doctor says, no more ham, no more cheese, no more whiskey. And then we obey immediately. The hand that made you tremble, O king, was sent by God to disclose his judgment against you with these three mysterious words, mane. Tekel Pares. Mane, God has numbered the days of your kingdom. God is doing away with your kingdom. Tekel, you have been placed on God's balance and you were found with no substance. God has found you very shallow. Pares, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Mane, Tekel, Pares. You were weighed, you were evaluated, you were found empty and wanting, and you will be placed aside. You will be punished. So God's philanthropy is not without limits. In our times, there's a tendency, even among our Orthodox writers, to overemphasize the love and philanthropy of God while eliminating any notion about God's justice. If you ask, why is it that some nations vanish from this earth and some nations continue to exist? The answer is not unrelated to the justice of God. When some of these nations went beyond and above the limits of God's philanthropy, they were doomed to extinction. Not only the Sodomites, the Edomites, the Canaanites, the Babylonians, the Philistines, the Medes, the Parthians, but even the Byzantines the longest empire in world history. The Christian Byzantine Empire existed over a thousand years. The Roman Empire, the fourth beast of Daniel, was not conquered by weapons. It was transformed 
by the Hellenic Christian spirit and developed into the Christian Roman Empire. Not to mention that, according to Father John of Romanides, the word Byzantine was not even used until the 15th or 16th century by Western writers and historians. No one knows this better than the alive tradition of the Syrians, Lebanese, Palestinians, and Egyptians, who to this day call themselves, and us, Vroom Orthodox, not Greek Orthodox, but Vroom Orthodox, meaning Romanos or Roman Orthodox. Vroom Orthodox is the fusion or the baptism of the Hellenic spirit into Christianity. The new symbol of Roman Orthodoxy was the cross of Christ, the flag used by Constantinople to conquer her adversaries. This empire lived with the uncreated energy of the precious cross and became glorious. The Christians of the so-called Byzantine Empire began to spread the spirit of the gospel all over the empire. At some point uh, around 1000 after Christ, we had about 300 monasteries just around Constantinople. But as time progressed, the Christians of the so-called Byzantine Empire began to lose their orthodox mindset. They began to sin exceedingly, and they surpassed the limits of God's tolerance. Why did Constantinople fall? And why does God tolerate to have dozens of the greatest churches of Christendom, like Hagia Sophia, the Church of the Apostles, St. Irene, to be mosques or museums? The true answer will not be given by the historians and the lukewarm Christians. The answer can be found in the history of Israel and right here in the book of Daniel. The same hand that appeared and petrified Belshazzar also appeared to Muhammad, the conqueror, who was sick from worry and fear. He called his imams, his mullahs, his muftis, and the Sufi mystics and dervishes, and none of them could interpret the presence of this fearful presence. He needed to bring a Christian Daniel-like monk from a nearby mountain who told him, Don't worry, your highness. This hand is telling you that you did not conquer the city by your mighty army. God handed the city over to you because the city had less than five true Christians. These five fingers that you saw on the wall are telling you that the prayer of five true Christians would have blocked you from entering the walls of the city. Not to mention that six months before the fall, we suffered from the fall uniatism of Flores and Ferrara, and the uniatists, along with Constantine Palaiologos, the last emperor of Byzantium, had the upper hand, so they permitted a joint liturgy with the Latins in the Church of St. Sophia. That was one of the conditions if we really uh, were to expect any kind of help from the Pope. Let the historians try to search for all kinds of reasons, the funniest one of all being that a little door, the Kirkoporta, was left open and somehow the Muslims uh, snuck through. No, the theological answer is that God pulled his protection. Muhammad was ready to retreat, to give up. But one of his generals approached him and convinced him to give him one more try, one more day, one more try. Why do you think? Because he saw a luminous cloud, a luminous haze move away from the city. He was illumined by God at that moment and told Muhammad, a few hours ago, I saw a luminous cloud travel away from the city. Your Highness, I believe their God has left them. Give me one more try, one more night, and the rest is history. The city fell on May 29th, 1453. And our Christian monuments and churches are in Muslim hands for over 500 years. Now, for those with a Greek nationality, May 29th remains a sad day in history. We lost the Hagia Sophia and the great city, the jewel of the Byzantine Empire. 
but the saints who can see beyond the historical and human criteria, they can provide us with a spiritual benefit behind these ethnic calamities. St. Cosmas the Atolian, a recent saint, monk, preacher, and prophet, saw the great benevolence of God behind the bitterness of our slavery to the Turks. The saint repeatedly taught that the enslavement to the Turks was much safer for our orthodoxy than the false union with the heresy of papism. It was more preferable, spiritually that is, to be under the yoke of the Agarines than under the tiara of the Pope. The Agarines would enslave, abuse, and possibly kill our body, but a false union with Rome would kill our souls. St. Cosmas the Atolian was a great patriot, a great missionary and preacher, who preached repentance during these difficult, dark years of Turkish occupation. His work was continued by St. Nicodemus and the Colivades, and this great spiritual awakening helped the Greeks to rebel during 1821 and gain back their independence. It was the understanding of St. Cosmas that independence could not be achieved without repentance. The desirable would not take place without much repentance. The prophets often used cryptic language so their teachings would not become plain and understood by their enemies, the Turkish rulers. So people would not ask, Holy Father, when are we going to get these Turks off our backs? There were Turkish soldiers in the same cities, in the same villages. So this would spell disaster. So they use cryptic language. When will the desirable take place? The word liberation was replaced by the cryptic word desirable. And St. Cosmas used to teach, the desirable will come after three generations. Your grandchildren will see it. Another time he said, the desirable will come when the Feast of Pascha and the Feast of the Annunciation fall on the same day. This amazing prophecy was fulfilled during 1912 when northern Greece, Thessaloniki, and Epirus were liberated from the Turks at that time. And this was about three generations after the martyrdom of St. Cosmas the Aetolian. There are about a hundred such prophecies in the book of St. Cosmas published by uh, Metropolitan Augustinos of Florina of blessed memory. Now, most of these prophecies, just like Old Testament prophecies, and New Testament, they are vague, they are cryptic. They often use cryptic language and they cannot be interpreted by the everyday person. A prophetic gift is needed to interpret the prophetic words of a prophet. Now, what about the prophecies about the liberation of Constantinople, which, by the way, St. Cosmas may have mentioned a few things about, and some contemporary elders speak about such a liberation, and some claim that St. Cosmas was influenced by the vision of Agathangelos, who had an apocalyptic oracle imbued with some ethnic overtones, which was circulating among the enslaved Greeks and uh, was cultivating some false hope and empty consolation. Now, this kind of mentality does not appear in the authentic teachings of St. Cosmas the Aetolian, or any of the Church Fathers and Holy Elders, as far as that goes. I believe the same thing may be true about Father Paisios, who may have said about 10 things about some of these things, and people may ascribe to him about 110 things. Now, the central teachings of St. Cosmas, Father Paisios, and all the Elders is repentance, forgiveness, almsgiving, church attendance, and partaking of the sacraments, you know, not show the salvation of our soul. St. Cosmas used to only use two, three sermons, very simple sermons from village to village, stop working on Sundays, worship the Holy Trinity, pray, forgive, and love your brother, and occasionally to console and strengthen the weak faith of his listeners, he would do a miracle, or he would use his prophetic gift to, again, strengthen their faith in God so they could begin their repentance. In our times, and especially in the last 25 years, we have witnessed much interest in eschatology, 
literature pertaining to future events and to the end times, mainly because we left the second millennium and entered the third. Now, this could be a positive thing because people who may have been indifferent up to now, indifferent about their spiritual life, they may feel compelled to search and uh, read about topics uh, starting with the book of the Revelation, but at the same time, the grace of God can lead them to a spiritual father and to a life of repentance. And I believe this is the main task of every prophet all through the centuries. Prophecy employs the element of enticement. It is God's spiritual bait, so to speak. Christ used miracles to entice Peter and some of his disciples. St. Cosmas the Atolian, Father Paisios, and other elders they use the element of miracles and prophecy as well to soften the hearts of the curious visitor to lead him to repentance. What can become problematic, however, is when we tend to isolate some of these future events out of mere curiosity. Events described in the book of the Revelation, such as the uh, mark of the beast, the Antichrist, the Great Tribulation. And we tend to focus on these things while ignoring our overall spiritual development. There's much commotion about the liberation of Constantinople on the internet nowadays. But my question is, what are we going to gain from the liberation of Constantinople if we don't go to Holy Confession, if we don't take Holy Communion, if we don't attend church, if we are not speaking to our brother, if we don't fight our passions, the central theme at the beginning of the gospel is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So let's not get caught up on past and present details about prophecies which can make us lose valuable time. It seems that God did not wish to provide us with much detail about the past or the future events, so we don't exhaust our efforts on the sidelines, so to speak. And I believe St. John of Chrysostom can be very helpful because he has said something very profound. All vague and veiled prophecies are clearly understood after the fact and never before. Do you see why? It is not important to waste precious time on details of future or past events. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis was revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, it is not important how man was created, how the angels were created, if there was a big bang during the creation, or if the world was created in seven 24-hour periods, or in 7,000 years, or a million years. These things are not central to our salvation. The central teaching in Genesis is that God is the creator and he created everything that exists. And he created men in his own image out of his great love. Now, how long Adam stayed in paradise? How old was he? How many children did he have altogether? What fruit did he disobey God with? All these are not central to our salvation. Christ, at some point, at the end of John's gospel, frowned on Peter when he displayed similar curiosity. Christ told Peter how he would stretch out his uh, arms when he's old, and he was trying to tell him that uh, he would die by crucifixion. Then Peter asks the Lord, how about John? What will happen to John? And the Lord said, if it is my will that he remain alive until I come, what is that to you? And now we can see ill curiosity in all its glory. And John explains, the saying spread that John was not going to die. This rumor became prevalent among the holy Christians of the first century. And now John wants to squash this rumor, and he records at the very end of his gospel, yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not going to die. But assuming that I want him to stay alive until I return, what is that to you? In other words, do not look for knowledge that God wishes to keep veiled, information that does not concern you. And once again, we're all aware of certain future prophecies about uh, rumors of wars and uh, a possible war around Constantinople, a possible future golden age of orthodoxy. Again, the way we treat these things is by the key of St. John the Chrysostom. Let's wait and see. These are all veiled 
and not up to us to interpret. And just like we have varying views in the area of Genesis, as we said, some church fathers can differ in their perceptions. We will also have varying views in the area of future apocalyptic prophecy and events. This should not surprise us because the church does not base doctrine on oracles, visions, or future prophecies. A doctrine must have its basis on the Holy Scripture, and holy tradition cannot teach anything that does not agree with Holy Scripture. The doctrine of the church is clearly spelled out in the creed that Christ shall come back again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom shall have no end. And St. Paul clearly teaches in 2 Thessalonians that we will have the teaching of the gospel, and after that, an apostasy of the Christian nations, the great rebellion against the true gospel of Christ, and after the great rebellion dechristianizes all peoples and nations, then after that the Antichrist will come, the man of lawlessness, and after the Antichrist we will have the second coming of Christ. Now, we don't have specifics on time periods. We don't know how long the rebellion will take place. We don't know if there will be some kind of a re-spark within the rebellion. All these things are silenced by the Holy Scriptures. And when things are not very clear in Holy Scripture, then we use the key of St. John the Chrysostom. Let's wait and see. At the same time, it's important that we don't criticize someone who wishes to have different views about some of these things, since they are accepted and taught by past and contemporary elders. Different views are not uncommon in areas that lack clear apocalyptic revelation. Now, someone who chooses not to believe in the liberation of Constantinople or the re spark of orthodoxy will not be accused by the Lord, any more than the one who accepts some of these pious expectations because they were taught by people in past centuries and also some of our contemporary elders. If we truly love God, if the Jesus prayer enters our heart, then there we can find a Yes Sophia, Jerusalem, Mount Sinai, and Mount Tabor. The kingdom of God is inside of us. So even though we can have different views on some of these possibilities, we cannot change an iota from the official and canonical teachings of the Church expressed by the Holy Fathers and the seven ecumenical synods. The virgin birth, the union of the two natures, Christology, ecclesiology, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, all these eternal truths cannot be altered or expressed any differently than they have been from the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church. The incarnation of God is central to our salvation. Now, if the Magi came to the cave on the day of Christmas, or two years later, that does not have a bearing on our salvation. Many saints, including St. John of Chrysostom and St. Theophilactus, they hold the first view that they left two years before, and they came to Bethlehem exactly on the same day that Christ was being born. Another set of 4th century saints, like St. Epiphanius and uh, many others, they hold the second view, which is that they left on the day that they saw the star, on the day of Christ's birth, and they reached Bethlehem two years later. And this seems to be more scripturally accurate, the second view. However, both of these views were taught in the church without any problem at all. All this secondary and peripheral knowledge, which does not pertain to our salvation, will be revealed to us in the kingdom of God, where God's mysteries will enthrall the saints until the ages of ages. Now, having said all this, we must also keep in mind that God can bypass or postpone a prophecy based on the overall repentance of his people. He can cut the day short for the sake of the elect. We find a classic example of this in the book of Jonah, another great book of the Old Testament with much Christology. And of course, today's average university biblical scholar is clueless about the deep heart and the hidden men of the heart of the ability of men to unite with God. They are religious intellectuals, agnostics almost, and they have no real knowledge or experience of God. Most of them cannot believe in miracles, so they call them myths. They cannot understand how a man can stay alive in the belly of a fish. So much like Porfiri, the, the Jew, 
who wrote all kinds of volumes against Christianity, they introduce all kinds of intellectual theories. They give up on the resurrection, Christ's miracles are inventions of his early church, or Jonah did not really exist, the book is a fable. Prophet Daniel gives them so much trouble in his seventh chapter. The prophecies are so amazing that they try to erase Daniel as well. Some pious Jew wrote that book in the third century BC. There's no other way to explain this because they don't believe that a prophet can see 300 years into the future. But to their great misfortune, Daniel's holiness and piety is proclaimed by his contemporary prophet Ezekiel, who also lived in Babylon from 586 AD and died in Babylon. There are dozens of undeniable proofs for the validity of the book of Daniel, but Google and all the other search engines and history channels serve the work of the highly anti-Christian agenda of the Zionists and their patron saint, the evil serpent. So you will not find a lot of authentic studies in these search engines. So God said to Jonah, in three days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now, this is a prophecy. Go tell them. So he told them very reluctantly. They repented on a national level, and God bypassed his prophecy of destruction. A hundred years later, they've returned to their evil ways. They've returned to the life of sin and corruption. This time, God did not send another Jonah. He simply informed Tobit, who was also a prophet, and who charged his son Tobias, My son, after you bury me and your mother, the minute we are both in the ground, you must pack up and leave Nineveh because God will destroy it. Its citizens return to their evil ways. America, Europe, and all Western Babylonian world is no different than old Nineveh and old Babylon. Whoever heard of homosexual marriage? Homosexuality always existed, I guess. But this is the first generation in world history that elects governors, prime ministers, and presidents who condone, bless, and legalize same-sex marriages. This is exactly why Daniel says that the Antichrist will change times and laws and we will spend more time on this in future talks. We are much worse than Belshazzar, who was using the vessels of God to entertain his guests. He was an idolater. He was not a Jew or a Christian. Today, we have so-called Christians, bishops, and pastors who defile the holy temples of God, the souls of their flock. Blinded by the carnality of this age, they refuse to preach repentance to these poor souls by blessing the most unlawful homosexual bond, condemning their soul to an eternal bondage in hell. Who would ever imagine that the Christian city of glorious Thessaloniki, the city of Alexander the Great, Saint Demetrius, and Saint Gregory Palamas would elect a self-admitted homosexual mayor fulfilling the wishes of the Switzerland-based New World Order to turn the Christian ethics upside down. In the very least, let's keep these pious possibilities in a back burner until we begin to burn our passions and have our hearts burn with the love of Christ. Only then God will reward us with some of these lost territories if and when His holy will allows it. Our baptized Christians curse horribly in Greece. They curse the name of God, the name of Christ, the Panagia. They make a mockery of our church, our saints, our elders. Television shows, and again, this is not the work of the Greeks. None of these television companies in Greece are owned by Greeks. The only thing that's wrong is our Greeks are going along with it and they're not rebelling. They don't pick up their television sets and throw them out in the trash like my good friend Vasilios Papadopoulos did quite a few years ago. Again, the Zionists who own all these TV stations, they were slandering priest after priest. And at some point, he was overtaken by the spirit of Marathias Maccabee. He took a hammer and he put his big screen television out of its misery. 
And I know that's extreme, of course, a little crazy. Not at all because in the last 15 years, he has copied over a million hours of the talks of Elder Athanasius Mytilineos and distributed them all over the world. So you can see what can be accomplished when we retire our eyes from the time bandit called television or internet. And again, the words of Elder Athanasius Mytilineos. My children, the wrath of God has not come yet, but it is hanging over us like the sword of Damocles, like a dark, heavy cloud, a few minutes before a cloud burst. Christ told us and reproached us to study the signs. Jerusalem failed to perceive the signs, and it was abandoned. It was made desolate. My children, do you see the spiritual signs? There's very much sin in the world today. If we don't repent, and it seems that we don't want to repent, the wrath of God will hover over us, and our beloved country will fall much like Babylon that came tumbling down in one night. Greece will fall, unfortunately. The Lord cried when he saw Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, when he saw the lack of repentance with his divine vision. We also lament, my children, we lament, we see the tempest, the approaching of the tsunami, but there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do because we see our people who cross themselves the same way we do, and they are clueless that in a few years we may be lost. But my children, let us not despair because the remnant will be saved. God seals his own. He places the sign, the seal of the Holy Cross on his children who agonize and suffer in the midst of all this apostasy. The uncreated energy of the Holy Cross will protect his truly faithful children who resist the wave of sin. God knows his own. His seal will protect his own to keep them from falling in the midst of this time of corruption and depravity. You will be most blessed and exalted when you stand upright. When you've refused the international Babylonian New Age ethics and mindset, when you've resolved in your head to stay grounded to the mindset, to the phronema of your church fathers, and to the godly patristic tradition, we will not betray our Lord. We will stay true to our Christian calling. Only then, we will abound with a blessed hope to enjoy God's protection from hunger, pestilence, and destruction, and above all, to hold on to our faith. Like Daniel and the three youths, Ezekiel and the remnant of Israel in Babylon. They were all in the center of idolatry and depravity, but they were protected by God all the days of their lives. If we desire to stand with God, he will protect us from hunger, fire, beasts, and lions, because the Word of God is trustworthy and does not show favoritism. Let us all stay mindful of the great example of Daniel and the three youths who stood alone in their time. Let us be prepared to stay alone and marginalized in our workplace, in our schools, in our parishes, and our churches even, because truth is not associated with high numbers. One in the truth is majority, according to St. Maximus the Confessor. The love for truth did not allow Daniel to compromise with human and unlawful human laws. And the God of truth will shut the mouth of lions, as we will see in our following session. Out of the 12 chapters of the book of Daniel, six are historical, the first six, and the other six are more prophetic, even though we had some prophetic dreams in the first six chapters. The dream of Nebuchadnezzar was a prophetic dream covering at least 600 years of world history, along with the prophecy of the fall of Babylon, which we saw last week. From chapter 7 up until 12, the visions of Daniel are so nebulous that archangels are sent to help Daniel with their interpretation. We saw this in the prophecy of the 70 weeks, which we included earlier in the series because we were celebrating the nativity of our Lord at that time, at the time of the recording. 
It is important to understand that the chapters do not follow a chronological order. In a first in the fifth chapter, we thought we were finished with Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. We were finished with Babylon, but all of a sudden, he shows up again in the seventh chapter, which begins with the words, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions. And there Daniel will see the same vision that terrified Nebuchadnezzar in the second chapter. Nebuchadnezzar saw the four dynasties from a humanistic, historical, material perspective, gold, silver, brass, iron, and clay. And now Daniel will see the same reality from a spiritual and godly perspective, how God in the heavenly realm looks at these dynasties as beasts devouring each other. It is the same vision with much more detail. In the 8th chapter, Daniel will isolate one of these beasts, the Greek kingdom of Alexander, and he will provide amazing details about Alexander and his descendants, especially Antiochus IV, the Epiphanes, who is a classic type of an antichrist who caused great affliction to the faithful people of God. In the ninth chapter, the vision or the appearance of of Archangel Gabriel and the prophecy of the 70 weeks takes place during the first year of King Darius of the Medes, immediately after the fall of Babylon around 536 BC. This was about 70 years after the initial siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar around 606 BC. In chapters 10 and 11, the visions and the prophecies were revealed to Daniel during the reign of Cyrus, the king of the Persians. Now, the 12th chapter is totally apocalyptic with a strong emphasis on the final judgment, the resurrection of the dead, and three and a half years before all of that, the great tribulation with the appearance of the Antichrist. Much like the book of the Revelation, the chapters of the prophetic book of Daniel do not follow a chronological order. And after this short introduction, we will now try to cover the central events of chapter 6, during which Daniel goes through the transition from the Babylonian to the Middle Persian Empire we saw that transition towards the end of chapter 5. And it would be good to for our listeners to read the end of that chapter. After those three mysterious words, Mene, Dekel, and Pares, and this is the interpretation of Daniel, Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Pares, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Of course, that only lasted a couple hours. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede, received the kingdom being about 62 years old. So the Chaldeans are now captives, and they are subdued by the Middle Persian Empire headed by King Darius. Darius began to reorganize his empire with the newly acquired territories. He chose 120 satraps, a network of governors with a military background to govern the 120 states of his newly expanded empire. These 120 satraps were under the direct command of a three-member committee, three prime ministers, let's say, and these three prime ministers filtered all the problems from the 120. They solved them, and only matters of very serious nature made it to the king Darius, so that the king might suffer no loss, according to the text. So the king only dealt with these three people, 
and his mind was at ease. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to promote him and set him over the entire kingdom. Isn't this amazing? Only a few months ago, Daniel was totally forgotten by a decadent Babylonian empire. And all of a sudden, he's on the top of the charts. God not only protected him through that fatal evening where 1,000 nobles and Belshazzar the king were slain, but now, in a matter of a few months, he's rising to the highest position next to the king because an excellent spirit was in him. What was this excellent spirit? What else but the grace of God? The grace of the Holy Spirit, divine wisdom, which accentuated all his human talents tenfold. What is truly amazing to me is the open-mindedness of these kings, both Nebuchadnezzar, the king of gold, and Darius, the king of silver, according to the vision in the second chapter, were much more open-minded than all the Roman emperors combined, perhaps with the exception of Constantine the Great. Nero, Trajan, Adrian, Decius, Maximinian, they had saints reveal all kinds of mysteries and miracles in front of them. They had great soldiers, such as St. George, St. Demetrius, St. Eustathius Placidas, St. Mercurius, the 40 martyrs, great men and women, but their hearts were hardened and rusted. Perhaps they were leaders likened to the iron and mud, according to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Mud and iron produces rust. While these two first kings were much more genuine as human beings, Sure, they were ruthless and ungodly, but they were much more genuine in their humanity, in their conscience, compared to the Romans who tortured 11 million Christians the first three centuries. Now, I'm sure there's much more involved here, but this is simply my own personal observation. These 5th century BC kings were not intolerant and small-minded as their satraps, who became exceedingly envious of Daniel and they sought to find a complaint, a fault, some sort of accusation to reduce Daniel's worth in Darius's eyes. Envy and jealousy are the ugly children of pride, which dries the heart from all trace of love. These are very serious passions that we have to combat every day. As Christians, we sin terribly when we criticize, gossip, and publicize the weaknesses, faults, and mistakes of our neighbors on Facebook for hundreds of people to see, if not thousands. Katakrisis, the act of judgmentalism, the act of reducing the worth of our brother is a heavy sin and almost always the result of egotism. The Word of God mandates that if I have something against my brother, I am to go meet him and discuss the matter on a personal level and not to expose the matter to the entire world. Well, 540 years BC, these satraps could not fight this great temptation to have a captive, a mere foreigner from the sons of Judah to be over their heads. So Daniel became the victim of their passion of extreme envy and jealousy. There's some envious individuals that will not relent until they see their opponent totally destroyed and in the tomb and even beyond the tomb. Remember the rulers of Israel, the Sanhedrin who crucified and killed the Lord? The scripture clearly and specifically tells us that they, they handed him over because of envy. And what envy? Even beyond the tomb. So the two presidents influenced a circle of satraps to create a front against Daniel. But to their misfortune, they could not find any accusation against this holy man of God, this holy prophet. His life was flawless by human standards. He was faithful to the king, trustworthy, and meticulous in his conduct. He was highly esteemed and loved by the king for these reasons. So now the ancient serpent whispers to them, find something to trap him with in connection with the law of God, in connection with his faith. 
the same demonic spirit of jealousy displayed by the demonic minds of Christ's contemporaries, the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, good teacher, must we pay taxes to the Roman government? Must we pay taxes to Caesar? And why do your disciples eat without washing their hands? And why do you dine with sinners like Zacchaeus? And why do you heal during the Sabbath? Why did you open the eyes of the blind men on the Sabbath? They constantly accused him based on their distorted perception of the Mosaic law. They interpreted the law according to their earthly mindset. And now these opponents of Daniel will create a law. They will introduce a bill and have it voted into law so they can destroy Daniel legally. How contemporary is this? In the last 50 years, the world community has seen the emergence of dozens of horribly anti-Christian laws conceived from the pantheon of the new world order. Legalization of abortion, separation of church and state, hate crime laws designed to stifle freedom of speech and the truth against homosexuality and certain other special groups, the legalization of marijuana in the state of Colorado, same-sex marriages, and dozens of other insidious laws aimed to destroy the faith of Christ worldwide. Only a few days ago, the poor Christians of Ohio are forced to remove uh, crosses from top of hills to remove the sign of the cross. Where at the same time, we can have all kinds of different religious symbols all over the country, but the ACLU only attacks the cross of Christ for obvious reasons. Likewise, Daniel was hated, and this hate pushed his co-workers to introduce a law to make him trip on account of his faith. They were certain that Daniel would choose the law of his God over their insidious law. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a decree that whoever petitions any god or men for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So all prayers must be referred to you only, and anyone who prays to another god will be tossed in a lion's den. Now, O king, sign this into an irrevocable law according to the law of Persians and Medes, which cannot be revoked. Look at the emphasis on this. See how they trap the king. Now a king signed this into an irrevocable law, according to the law of Persians and Medes, which cannot be revoked. What a horrible ordeal. They changed this into an irrevocable dogma, signed by a divine king. They just made him divine. Now how can a divine king possibly sign something and then retract it? Do you see the trap? This is how this mere man, King Darius, was entrapped by these insidious evil minds around him who could not stand the superiority of Daniel. By this decree, the king was declared divine and thus infallible. So he could not retract this law, even if he saw its evil consequences. Please forgive me, but I cannot resist the temptation to connect the plight of King Darius with the plight of the papist doctrine of infallibility. According to the false doctrine of infallibility, the Pope cannot err when he speaks ex cathedra. He is divine and the representative of God on earth. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, when in Australia, his followers had banners with the words, God on earth. This horrible doctrine changes the system of church governance from synodal and spiritual to dictatorial and humanistic. 
The church is nothing and the Pope is everything. The Latin doctrine of primacy and infallibility is the work of human minds who love to be first and not the work of the Holy Spirit, as we plainly see here in the life of Daniel. These presidents wished to place themselves above Daniel and they sought to take his life since they could not succeed otherwise. This is a classic example of humanity governed by beastly passions, the human nature after the fall. After St. Photios refused to bow down to Nicholas, Pope of Rome, and for over a thousand years, the infallible popes did not miss any opportunities to ensnare, subdue, and annihilate suffering orthodoxy, whether through crusaders or so-called missionaries like the Jesuits, or Uniatism, the introduction of Unia, the Trojan horse, their purpose has been supremacy and the subjugation of Eastern Orthodoxy, which they consider schismatic to this day. They're very good at pulling the wool over the eyes of our philopapist modernist bishops who love the world more than the truth of Orthodoxy. But the honesty of Cardinal B in 1963 is very sobering, in one of his talks uh, at Harvard University, he admitted openly that it would be simply dishonest to suggest that there's any likelihood that the dogma of the primacy and of the infallibility of the Pope will be revised. He did say it, it would be quite dishonest for Orthodox brothers to expect something like this. If they revise these doctrines, then the very authority of the Latin Church will collapse because the primacy of the Pope is the very foundation of papism for nearly 1,000 years. Now, do we see now why St. Justin Popovich likened the Pope with Caesar in his classic book, Men and Godmen? Now, Darius initially liked this law. It sounded good because it would reinforce his throne all over the kingdom. People were idolaters to begin with, so this would not create much unrest. This was a good political strategy, and the king had no reason to suspect any foul play. After this law went into effect, then they had their spies follow and watch Daniel on a daily basis to see if Daniel would pray to his God so they could indict him. The penalty for this offense would be an evening in the lion's den. Now here again we see the meekness and humility of Daniel, who did not run to defend himself against this great lie of the other two presidents. They lied when they said to the king, all presidents agreed. They left Daniel out of this. Daniel would not agree with something like this, obviously, but they most likely waited until Daniel was absent on king's business for several days, and they approached the king in his absence. And the king believed them. This is the work of evil minds to this day. If a law does not pass or it loses by two or three votes, these evil masterminds will wait about three, four days before Christmas or a national holiday, and they will present the same law knowing in advance that a number of senators or congressmen will be absent and on their way to their hometowns for these holidays. So once they return, they find out that the law has been passed. Now, Daniel found out after the fact, but he remained calm. And now the king is distraught because the spies came back with a report that Daniel continued to pray three times a day on his knees towards Jerusalem with his windows open. That was the custom of the Jews back then. Their point of reference was the Temple of Solomon. So Daniel did not want to change anything about his mode of prayer. What would we do? How would we deal with something like this? Would we not at least close our mini blinds so we could protect ourselves? Now, Daniel was not phased by such a law. Daniel was a prophet, and a prophet exercised exactitude and not economy. Today, we use economy to the point of compromise. Daniel was a prophet, and the first task of the prophet was the purity of the faith absolute obedience to the law of the heavenly king, regardless if it disagrees with the law of the earthly king. This is the common denominator of sainthood and martyrdom. The martyr will choose death over the violation of the first commandment and any commandment in general. 
Now, do we understand that in a few years, we may be persecuted as criminals? If we state in our public sermons that homosexuals are sinners, this is already happening in the country of Canada, where the word homosexuality is substituted by the word immorality by some of our clever and politically correct bishops. How about when some of our priests are compelled to bless same marriage unions? God forbid. Some will compromise, perhaps. But the people of God, the children of the Church of the Holy Apostles, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church will not compromise. They will follow the example of Daniel and Susanna and the seven Maccabees and the millions of martyrs of the New Testament. The punishment, as severe as it may be, it will be temporary, a mere split second compared to eternal bliss in paradise. The wintry freeze is bitter, but paradise will be sweet and eternal, to paraphrase the dying words of the glorious 40 martyrs of Sebastia who froze in the lake, refusing to deny Christ. And let's not forget that the rock that pulverized the feet of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar grew and filled the entire earth. This is your victory, your faith, according to St. John. The rock of our faith called Christ will crush all oppressors and all earthly political systems, all Babylons who oppress the people of God, whether communism or atheism or Zionism, all these will become chaff. The Lord of history, our Lord Jesus Christ, will crush all antichrists, including the final antichrist and his patron, the devil. All these things will come to pass, but we need to stay faithful. We need to stay faithful to the commandments of Christ. The more precisely we keep the commandments, the less we compromise, the less we sin, and the more we purify our heart, which is a condition for the vision of God and the possession of God's grace. Daniel trusted God with all his being, and God certainly knows how to protect his own from all his enemies. And now the enemies of Daniel are closing in. O king, did you not ordain that any man who makes a prayer request to a different person, either man or God besides you, within this period of 30 days, will be cast into the lion's den? Do you see how evil minds work? They do not mention Daniel's name, so that when the king has made a general answer as to the order that he gave, he may then be bound by his own words and not give Daniel any preferential treatment. Well, King, guess what? That Daniel, who is one of those captives, one of those Judeans, guess what, King? He has paid no heed to you. He ignored you. When the king heard this, he became highly grieved and distressed. Unlike Nebuchadnezzar, who became irate and angry against the three youths, King Darius became distressed because he saw the guile of these presidents. He realized that he had been tripped by his own reply to the question, and also that envy was the motive of their plot. So he was searching for a loophole to circumvent his law, and so earnestly did he labor to deliver Daniel that he refused to accept any food all day. The plotters were not fazed by the king's sadness or state of grief. On the contrary, they pressured him even more to move towards the execution of Daniel. Be it known to the O king that the laws of the Medes and Persians signed and enacted by the king are irrevocable and unchangeable. So the king, having no other choice, commanded and they brought Daniel to cast him into the lion's den. And the king told Daniel, Full of faith, thy God whom you serve ever so faithfully, Daniel, may he deliver you. In other words, what I could not manage as a mere man, I am sure your God can do. Now Darius speaks with boldness here, with full confidence in the God of Daniel. Not may your God save you, but the God whom you ever serve so faithfully shall himself deliver you. King Darius was well informed about the plight of Nebuchadnezzar, who asked the three youths 
and what God can save you from my hands? And King Darius realizes that Daniel is of a higher rank than the three youths who defeated the flames, and he's certain that Daniel will shut the mouths of the lions. Now a single stone was brought and placed over the opening of the pit, and the king sealed it with his ring. It is not very clear how the stone was sealed, but this seems to be a prefigurement of the entombment of Christ, if I'm not mistaken. The Sanhedrin also used a huge stone to close the opening of the tomb of Christ. And then they used a wax seal to seal the edges of the stone by stamping the wax with a special stamp and any movement of the stone would alter the shape of that stamp. That would be the way to know that nobody tampered with the stone. So there the enemies of Christ were afraid of the disciples stealing the body. And here, five and a half centuries before Christ, the King Darius is afraid of Daniel's enemies, more so than the lions, according to St. Jerome's commentary. And St. Jerome says, so that the enemies of Daniel might not make any attempt to harm him, for he had entrusted him to the power of God. And although not worried about the lions, he was fearful of men, according to St. Jerome. And the king departed to his own house and went to bed without partaking of any supper. And this king puts most of us Orthodox to shame. A king who knew not God did such a thing. The king spent the night fasting. He refused to eat and he stayed awake. This is how much Daniel meant to this king who did not know the true God but his conscience was very sharp and he was very responsive to the holiness of Daniel. So sympathetic was he of Daniel that he chose to suffer with him by refusing food. Now what can it be said for today's baptized Orthodox Christians that not only break the fast on Holy Friday, but they go and eat souvlaki or shish kebab in the most central spots of Athens to provoke the faithful on their way to church services on Holy Friday. How great is the forbearance of our crucified Lord, who is being forever crucified on a daily basis by our sins, the sins of his children, his Orthodox Christians. Then at the break of the day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of the lions. When he got near the pit, the king, overcome with emotion, broke down in tears and cried out, Daniel, O Daniel, speak to me, servant of the living God. Has your God, whom you serve so faithfully, has kept you safe from the mouths of the lions? And the king heard a beautiful voice. O king, live forever. O king, may you have eternal life. My God sent his angel and shut up the mouths of the lions, and they did not touch me. They did me no harm, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no wrong. Now who can speak like this? I was found blameless before God. Only a saint can say this, because Daniel said this having full acknowledgement of his spiritual state. According to St. Basil, humility is the virtue by which one can ascertain their true spiritual state. A humble man is not the man who always runs to a corner or stays silent. There comes a time where the meek will become a confessor. He will speak about the glorious things of God. And Daniel was such a saint. And God is wondrous in his saints. Thavmastos o theos and disagis avdu. Now, some simple soul can read this part of the book of Daniel and may think that an angel came down and placed a muzzle on the mouth of the starved lions so they couldn't eat Daniel. But he would also have to bind their feet so they couldn't tear him up with their claws. This is where the reading of the lives of the saints becomes our invaluable guide in the true understanding of the Holy Scriptures. The spirit of the scriptures is interpreted correctly and perfectly by the lives and the experience of our saints. The lives of the saints can help us understand. It is the lives of the saints that can help us understand the book of Daniel and the book of Genesis and all the other miraculous events in the pages of the scriptures. 
As we know, before the fall, Adam was the master of nature. He named the animals, and the animals behaved like house pets. They were not inimical towards men or toward each other. After the fall, after man rebelled against his God and master, the chain of grace was broken. And when the animals could not sense the presence of God on men, then they rebelled against men and against each other. They abandoned the spiritual law and they reverted to the law of the jungle. The purpose of the spiritual life is to find lost paradise, to regain the grace so we can have constant communion with God. When we have constant communion with God, then we will be in perfect harmony with nature. This is the purpose of the Christian life, to become holy. Because when a person becomes holy, he sanctifies his immediate environment as well. The uncreated energy of holy grace possessed by the saint turns his immediate environment into paradise. This is why when hundreds of visitors visited our modern day saints and elders, just by being next to them, they all confess that the minute I walked near him, I forgot all my problems, all my grievances, everything disappeared. I was overcome by a spirit of peace. I was overtaken by a state of euphoria. This state of euphoria is the result of the presence of the uncreated light of Christ, which turns everything into paradise. It is the light of the resurrection, the light of Mount Tabor, the light of God, which makes everything brand new. Perhaps now we can understand why snakes, mice, foxes, bears, and all kinds of beasts would eat from the hands of Father Paisios and other saints and contemporary elders. Now, how about the story of Iordanis, the pet lion of Saint Gerasimus? Is it true? Or might the lion be a graphic metaphor for the saint's ability to convert lion-like people who came to him? Asks a well-meaning modern-day Orthodox blogger, influenced by internet westernized rationalist theology and or his Protestant background. Well, that's really convenient. Whatever the gray matter between our ears cannot understand or accept, we change it into a metaphor, into an allegory. We are not unaware of the use of allegory, St. Basil says, but we cannot turn everything into a metaphor and an allegory simply because we suffer from rationalism. The lion in the life of St. Erasmus is as real as the lions in the life of Daniel. Daniel was at the state of illumination, just like St. Erasmus, Theosis, and the uncreated grace possessed by the saints and Daniel transformed the den into paradise. The lions recognized in Daniel their master Adam before the fall, and they stopped being carnivores. The lion of St. Gerasimus, having received the necessary medical treatment from the saint who extracted a very big splinter from its foot, followed the saint and lived with bread and vegetables like the monks, exactly how animals lived in paradise. Now, why do we disbelieve? Is there anything difficult for the God of Daniel? The lions acted as pets at the feet of Daniel as long as Daniel was present. They did not feel hungry. Why? Because when God's grace and will richly manifest, the order of natural things ceases. Moses stayed at the top of Mount Sinai for 40 days and nights without any food, without any provisions. No biological functions are needed in paradise. The lions forgot about their stomach when one like the pre-fallen Adam sat in their midst. But the next morning, the king was exceedingly glad and wanted Daniel next to him. As Daniel left, the transforming energy of God's grace went along with him. And it did not take long for the lions to return to their earthly reality. And the king commanded, and those men who had accused Daniel, were brought and cast into the lions. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the same lions grabbed them. They grabbed them midair, broke all their bones in pieces, and devoured them. At the end of the chapter, we have the amazing confession of faith of King Darius, who wrote, 
all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. By the grace of God, we covered eight topics from the book of Daniel, one of the most prophetic books of the Old Testament. So far, we gravitated towards the historical chapters of the book, with the exception of the 70 weeks of Daniel, which is in chapter 9. Chapter 7 up to 12 are quite difficult, and I believe an introduction will be helpful to help us understand the general purpose behind prophecy. Now, some prophecies seem to be more clear than others, but a prophecy does not always exhaust itself after one or two fulfillments. Some prophecies follow the cyclical method of interpretation, which means that they will continue their fulfillment all through the centuries with an increase of their cycles and a thickening of events as we reach the end of history. A classic example of this can be found in um, 2 Timothy, when St. Paul prophesies about the people of the end times. And he says, Timothy, my son, understand this, that in the last days there will be perilous, difficult times. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, inhuman, unholy. St. Paul uses about 18 different adjectives to describe the spiritual illness of the men of the last days. Now, this prophecy of St. Paul began to fulfill itself from the time of St. Paul, obviously, and will continue to fulfill itself until the very end. This seems to be the basis of a well-known Athenite prophecy of an ascetic who lived 600 years ago. This prophecy seems to be confirmed with transcripts from different monasteries at Mount Athos, but recently some claim that this might be a forgery or at least the work of uh, the disciple of St. Nilos from a century later. Now, I don't know, and I, I will let others decide on its authenticity, but one thing we cannot argue with is the accuracy of its content and its agreement with the biblical prophecy of St. Paul. I will only quote a few parts of this prophecy of St. Nilos, uh, as its content is readily available on uh, a lot of the search engines. After the year 1900, towards the middle of the 20th century, people will become unrecognizable. People's mind will be clouded with carnal passions. Well, that seems to be an understatement. People's appearances will change. It will be impossible to distinguish men from women. Well, we're headed that direction. There will be no respect for parents or elders. Love will disappear. Christian pastors, priests, and bishops will become vain men, not knowing their right hand from their left. Falsehood and greed will attain great proportions, lust, adultery, homosexuality, secret deeds, and murder will rule society. Only God knows if St. Nilos wrote this prophecy, but the fact is that it does not contradict the prophecy of St. Paul or scripture at all, and it certainly fits our society like a glove. So all prophecies must agree with the biblical models. Now, the general purpose of prophecy is to call people to repentance. The biblical prophet is not necessarily a fortune or a future teller. Many of our contemporaries used to visit clairvoyant elders to use them as fortune tellers, unfortunately. Of course, our prophets can reveal the future, but these revelations are usually connected to God's plan of salvation 
and they serve as a baited hook to lead people to repentance. According to Metropolitan Jeremiah Fundas, we have a mistaken idea about the work of the prophets. Prophimi in Greek does not only mean to speak ahead of time to tell the future, but it also means to speak before God or in the place of God. So the prophet loans his mouth to God at some distinct times of his life. A prophet was mainly the spokesman of God, and at some special occasion, he was the seer, the one who would see the will of God. So they see the evil of their times, they become the spiritual x-ray, so they can help people return to the right path, to the path of God. All prophets and saints, all through the centuries, they held sin as the cause of all evil. We saw this in our past talks. The sin of the Israelites brought forth the captivity to the Babylonians. The abominable actions of the last king of Babylon spilled over the tolerance of the wrath of God, and Babylon was destroyed and conquered by the Persians. The lack of repentance of Israel, with the exception of the remnant, kept Palestine captive to the Gentile nations for 600 years up until 70 AD, when Jerusalem was totally destroyed only after God's plan of salvation was fulfilled. Generally speaking, apocalyptic literature is primarily a literature of encouragement, aiming to encourage God's people during oppressive conditions, during persecutions or enslavements. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, three of the four major prophets, lived and ministered to the captive people of God in Babylon. People often become weary, doubtful, and despondent during oppressive regimes. The remnant of Israel is in Babylon for 70 years, and they are certainly enticed by idols and that kind of lifestyle. So they have feelings of abandonment. They think that God has forsaken them. So Daniel is given these apocalyptic revelations to stabilize the faith of the faithful. This is a very important key in the area of authentic biblical prophecy. Along with a huge prophecy, God will reinforce the prophet with a sign or a smaller prophecy so the authenticity of the prophet becomes established. In the book of Jeremiah, the false prophet Hananiah was challenging the words of Jeremiah the prophet. At some point, he almost had Jeremiah killed. Jeremiah was telling King Zedekiah to stay obedient to Nebuchadnezzar because this was the will of God. Hananiah, on the other hand, the false prophet, wishing to flatter the king, try to upstage prophet Jeremiah by saying that the Lord will bring back the vessels from Babylon in two years and not 70 years, like Jeremiah says. So the king and the palace staff believed the false prophet Hananiah. After this, they rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar with terrible consequences. Unfortunately, they failed to believe prophet Jeremiah, who provided them with a powerful sign of his authenticity. He told Hananiah, Hananiah, God has not sent you. Therefore, God will erase you from the face of this earth this year. Seven months later, Hananiah, the false prophet, died. We have one more example like this in the New Testament. False prophets began to announce that Christ is already at hand, or Christ already came, and all this created great unrest in the newly established church of Thessaloniki. St. Paul squashes these false rumors, and he gives the Thessalonians and all future Christians an invaluable key to the correct chronological placement of the events of the second coming of Christ. He says, do not be deceived by spirit, by word or letter, that they will not come, Christ will not come, until the great rebellion of the Christian nations against God, the apostasy of the Christians against God, will conceive the men of lawlessness. 
after the son of lawlessness is revealed, which means that he will show up suddenly, probably at the age of 30 years old, then Christ will appear three and a half years after that, actually seven years after that, because the first three and a half years, the man of lawlessness will appear to be a savior. He will appear to be the the most great, the greatest man that ever lived, claim that he's God. And after three and a half years, then Christ will appear and will destroy him with his word. In other words, very easily. So the small sign before the second coming is the great apostasy from Christianity. The apostates will be the Christian nations. Christians will be de-Christianized. They will be unrecognizable, according to St. Nilos. Their pastors and priests will not know their right hand from their left, and their own pastors will lead them to the arms of secularization first, and later to the acceptance of the Antichrist. So even though end time topics and prophecies can become the alarm clock that wake up the consciousness of many Christians, it is also very important that we use this knowledge in such a way to help people develop spiritually. We do not help people when we offer them the topic of the Antichrist isolated from the general orthodox spirituality. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, in his 15th Catechism, presented this topic at 350 AD in its overall context. He connected it with the second coming of Christ, the, the renewal of the universe, the resurrection of the dead, the last judgment, the enthronement of the saints, and the kingdom of God. All this edifying knowledge will eliminate harmful phobias and anxieties. This great teacher of the church used the book of Daniel extensively in his end time teachings. In fact, the seventh chapter of Daniel is parallel to the 13th chapter of the book of the Revelation. The imagery is almost identical. Here in his seventh chapter, Daniel will cover the first coming of Christ, the ascension of Christ, the persecution of the church, the God-opposing powers and the Antichrist, the second coming of Christ, the final judgment, all this in a few apocalyptic lines. And by the grace of God and with the help of our Orthodox interpreters, we will try as best as we can to shed some light on these most difficult topics. We will only use Orthodox interpreters because outside of Orthodoxy, much chaos is to be expected. From verses 1 to 9, we have the description of the four beasts and the final Antichrist. From verses 9 to 15, Daniel sees the thrones, the victory of the saints, the second coming of Christ, the destruction of the beast, the final judgment, and the reign of the saints in God's eternal kingdom. Now, Daniel sees all these events in a vision. He sees the four beasts coming out of the sea. Then in the same visual spectrum, he sees thrones in heaven and the Ancient of Days, the judgment seat of Christ and the destruction of the Antichrist. From verses 15 until 25, Daniel asks the assistance of one of the angels in a vision to help him understand the vision of the four beasts, and especially the fourth ferocious beast, which was much different than all the rest. Now, Daniel here does not put these images in a chronological order for us. He simply describes them as he sees them in his visions, on his vision screen. By the grace of God, once again, and the great help of St. Cyril of Jerusalem and Father Athanasius Mithilineus, we will attempt to disentangle some of these things to help our understanding. Now, the angel is synoptic. He simply tells Daniel, the four beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High will possess the kingdom forever and ever. The angel gives the beginning and the end, 
But Daniel desired to know the truth concerning the fourth beast, which was different from the rest. So for the rest of this session, we will inform ourselves mainly with the fourth beast and its descendants, its horns, as the symbolic language of the text says. And next week, we will return to the to verse 9, to the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. So Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. The great sea, in a context of the scriptures, is always the Mediterranean Sea. And the small sea is the Dead Sea. Four opposing winds from the north, the south, east, and west blew all at the same time, stirred up the sea, and four beasts emerged, not all at once, but successively, one after the other. We mentioned before, and we will repeat again, that the Mediterranean Sea is the most important sea of the world. The greatest cosmo historical events in history took place there and will continue to take place around the countries of the Mediterranean Sea. Not to mention that the major pages of civilization were written around the Great Sea, the Mediterranean. Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Greece, and the European countries are part of the Mediterranean world. The savior of the world appeared, lived, and worked out man's salvation in the center of the earth on Golgotha. Unfortunately, the great deceiver, the man of lawlessness, will also attempt to mimic the work of Christ in the same area by rebuilding the temple of Solomon, according to Saint Cyril. Now, the beasts are imaginary, obviously. They're not real. There's no lion with eagle's wings. The first was like a lion with eagle's wings. A second one, like a bear, which had three ribs in its mouth to devour much flesh. The third beast was like a leopard with four wings on its back. This beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. These are mythical animals, obviously. Each subsequent beast was more dreadful than the previous one. The second destroyed the first. The third destroyed the second. And the fourth, the most important one, is so terrible that it is most difficult to even describe. The events around the fourth beast will not stop, but they will continue un until the end of time. Now, let's read the interpretation of Saint Cyril for a moment on this passage. Now, these things we teach not out of our own invention, but having learned them out of the divine scriptures used in the church and chiefly from the prophecy of Daniel. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall surpass all kingdoms. And that this kingdom is that of the Romans has been the tradition of the church's interpreters. And we mentioned before that this vision is a parallel vision to the one in chapter 2 seen by Nebuchadnezzar. The only difference is at the end of that vision, Nebuchadnezzar saw the coming of the Messiah. Here in the seventh chapter, after the fourth beast, the Roman Empire, Daniel sees the Antichrist. And Gabriel goes on to interpret for Daniel, saying, His ten horns are ten kings that shall arise. And another king shall arise up after them, who shall surpass in wickedness all who were before him. And he shall subdue three kings out of the ten. And now we will have Father Miguelineos interpret and expand the words of Saint Cyril for us. The fourth beast was dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring anything and everything in its path. And the residue, it would break in pieces and trample with its feet. This is symbolic of the rare organizational skills of the Roman army. They have developed military highways like no one else in the past. Ignatia Avenue still exists today and it passes through Thessaloniki. From Rome, they could make it to the depth of Persia in record time. They had an impressive highway system, an impressive legal system, 
and an impressive military. It was truly the empire of iron. And Daniel continues, This beast had ten horns, and among the tenth an eleventh horn came up, a little one, and it immediately destroyed, plucked up three horns from their roots. So out of the ten kings, there were seven left. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of men, and a mouth speaking pompous words, whose appearance was greater than its fellows. The horn is a symbol of power. Animals use their horns to attack and sub subdue their enemies or to defend themselves. The center of their strength and power is the horn. So he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. He will plan to alter the order of natural things and the law of God. His authority or his power will last for a time, two times, and half a time. In other words, the reign of the Antichrist will be three and a half years. Daniel was greatly troubled by this awesome vision, and it took him a while to recover. As we said earlier, prophecies are very difficult. It is natural for each teacher and interpreter to try to see if the events during his time could possibly fit in the interpretation of the prophecy. The difficulty with St. Cyril and St. Jerome is that they are both citizens of the Roman Empire, so they could not exclude the possibility of a literal interpretation for the Ten Kings. Many interpreters during that time moved towards a literal interpretation. This does not mean that they were wrong. At the time, they followed the teachings of their predecessors and that prevailing thought was that the Antichrist would come at the end of the fourth beast, which was the Roman Empire. We should therefore concur with a traditional interpretation of all the commentators of the Christian church, there was only one church at that time, that at the end of the world, when the Roman Empire is destroyed, there shall be 10 kings who will partition the Roman world amongst themselves. And here St. Jerome makes a very valuable comment from 1600 years ago. And I quote, Let us not follow the opinion of some commentators and suppose him to be either the devil or some demon, but rather one of the human race in whom Satan will wholly take up his residence in bodily form. In other words, the Antichrist will be fully possessed by Satan. Saint Jerome and Saint Cyril were not wrong once again. They simply taught the prevailing interpretation of that time since God does not reveal the events of the second coming to anyone. Now, a literal interpretation seemed feasible during the years of the Roman Empire. We have another example in the book of the Revelation of similar difficulty. It has to do with the number of the soldiers in the War of Armageddon, if I'm not mistaken. It calls, I think that battle calls for an army of 200 million men. The interpreters of the fourth century could not possibly consider a literal interpretation being that that was much more than the population of the earth at that time. Today, however, we can definitely consider a literal interpretation since China alone has 1.7 billion people today. So here again, we see the importance of the words of St. John Chrysostom during the same century who said, all vague and veiled prophecies are clearly understood after they materialize and never before. And St. Andrew of Caesarea, during the 7th century, who had the advantage of a fallen Roman Empire, says some things are precursors of the prototype which is placed in an undetermined future time. And time and experience will reveal to those who have a vigilant heart. So the number 10 has been the subject of many books among the heterodox. 
who use the Procrustean method to interpret some of these prophecies. Recently, I heard an interesting interpretation from an Orthodox teacher, an Orthodox Archimandrite, who believes that these 10 kings are the 10 banking dynasties who control the financial system of the world, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, etc. This is interesting, but we cannot know for sure. Let's listen to the sober interpretation of Father Medellineos, who says, Initially, the number 10 is not a real number, but a symbolic number. The number 10 does not express 10 kings, but a multitude of successive kings. Now, there were definitely some historical forerunners who surpassed the other Roman kings in malice and harshness. Nero, for example, was so deranged that some church fathers, some Christians, tried to see if the number 666 could be applied to the name of, to the name of Nero. Nero was not the final Antichrist, but a type or a forerunner of the Antichrist. We will see in some of the following chapters that Daniel sees in a vision and prophesies about another Antichrist, Antiochus IV the Epiphanes, who was a classic type of an Antichrist in the Old Testament. If we take the number of the name of Antiochus, we will not come up with 666. Both Nero and Antiochus tortured the people of God exceedingly. But these are forerunners or precursors of the Antichrist that Daniel is characterizing in this chapter. And these types are no match for the prototype of the end times. Now, who's the Antichrist? We have no idea. He has not been revealed. But thanks to Daniel in the Old Testament, and to St. Paul and St. John in the New Testament, we have plenty of his characteristics. So the number 10, the 10 kings here, is a symbolic or conventional number. The scripture is full of these symbolic numbers, like the 10 virgins, 5 foolish, and 5 wise. 10 minus, 100 sheep, 1,000 years, 1 day is like 1,000 years, 10,000 talents, myriads of angels. These are all conventional numbers and not literal. The Jehovah Witnesses take the conventional number, 144,000, literally, and they claim that only 144,000 will go to heaven. The rest will stay here on earth. But 144,000 is simply 12 times 12,000, and it means a great undetermined multitude. So we no longer need to wait for 10 kings before the Antichrist comes. And we continue now with the description provided by Daniel. He shall speak great blasphemies against the Most High. He will speak pompous words. Now the Antichrist will make all the atheists, idolaters, and heretics pale by comparison. Nebuchadnezzar, Antiochus, the Roman emperors, they wished to be worshipped as God. Sure, they were proud and even insane. All the heretics through history blaspheme against the person of Christ. It is a great blasphemy to deny the divinity or the humanity of Christ, to say that Christ never resurrected, or he never really took on flesh, or that Christ was not sinless or he was vexed by temptations, like all of us. These are great blasphemies indeed, but no human ever dared to claim that he controls nature. He is the creator of heaven and the earth. Many other antichrists and blasphemers believed in their divinity, in their foolishness, but they never claim sovereignty. They accepted other gods to co-reign with their divinity. The Antichrist will claim that all the others who came before him, Buddha, Zoroaster, Jesus, and Muhammad, and Baha'i'Allah, they were all his servants. They are no longer needed because he is the final revelation of the only true God, and worship only belongs to him. And St. Paul tells us this in 2 Thessalonians 2.4, he will exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat 
in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be the only God. This is the eternal dream of his patron and his possessor, the devil. Where the devil failed with Christ, now he will succeed. He will be worshipped in the person of the Antichrist by the entire earth, with the exception of the saints of God. Because only saints will stay true to God and deny the worship of the Antichrist at that time. Unfortunately, most Christians will worship the Antichrist because they will be devoid of grace due to the widespread delusion, the mystery of lawlessness, which is already at work seducing Christians around us by the droves. And Daniel continues, He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, two times, and half a time. As you can see here, the scripture is very clear. He shall intend and the saints shall be given into his hand. The scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, is very clear that the Antichrist will be a real person, a human being, and not some system, not the computer, and not the incarnation of demons or the devil. The devil cannot incarnate. Demons cannot impregnate women as some biblically illiterate university professors have taught over the years. Daniel, St. Paul, and St. John see a person, a man born of a woman in a natural way, who shall persecute the Christians who will not bow down to him. Much like all his forerunners, Nebuchadnezzar, Antiochus IV, Herod, Nero, who gave the church a cloud of witnesses and a legion of martyrs. This is the reason why the saints will be given into his hand, not to be punished, but much like Job, to be crowned. Martyrdom is a great privilege and the highest gift of the Holy Spirit, the highest and purest form of love for God. And how is he going to justify this persecution? By changing the law to make the Christians seem lawless. The man of lawlessness will turn the law upside down so he can incriminate the sincere Christians. Christianity was considered illegal by the Roman legal system. A religion back then needed the approval of the Roman state. In our days, the demonic agents of the Antichrist, the servants of the mystery of lawlessness, are busy at work. They are changing the natural law and the law of the gospel, the ethical law. The Antichrist shall intend to change times and law. Times refers to the law of nature. Let's not forget that man was created to be in harmony with the laws of nature. Adam was in perfect harmony with the natural laws, which are also a creation of God. It is natural for men to sleep at night. Six, seven, eight nine hours. It is not natural to sleep 18 hours a day or work 18 hours a day. The natural function of the lung is to fill up with oxygen and to exhale carbon dioxide and not to breathe in smoke and tar and nicotine and all kinds of hallucinogenic gases. The violation of the natural law will have deadly consequences. Whenever we go outside of the boundaries of the natural laws, we destroy our health and our longevity. This is precisely why God intervened in history to save us from destroying ourselves. The passion of the sodomites was so pervasive, so addictive, homosexuality that is, that we are amazed by this little detail in Genesis 19 Five. Two angels appear as men to Lot, who house them. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the Sodomites, both young and old, all the people to the last men, surrounded the house, demanding to have relations with these two guests of Lot. So God intervened 
in a very powerful way to heal this plague because it threatened the population of the earth, just like he had to intervene to help the generation of Noah. So when people began to violate the natural law and go against their nature, God chose a people from the seed of Abraham to retrain and reveal to them his apocalyptic law with the purpose of restoring the natural law. So the written law would restore the natural law and eventually would exceed it in the New Testament. People who once acted against nature will now act according to nature and eventually act above nature. So a woman who had several abortions acted against nature. Cats, dogs, bears, tigers, and snakes will give their life to protect their young if they could. The mother of the animal kingdom loves her baby. But the woman of the 20th and the 21st century murders the fruit of her womb. Now, when she opens her heart to the law of God, she repents and not only keeps her child, but she may even go above nature and she may adopt two, three children from teenagers who were contemplating abortions. It was natural in the Old Testament to kill your enemy, even though God had already given the commandment against murder. St. Paul thought it was natural to persecute and stone the enemies of the law of Moses until the perfect law of love was revealed to him. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is the law of freedom that took St. Paul above nature. True Christians are above nature. St. Paul wished to die and go to hell if this could save his people, the enemies of the gospel. So we have the natural law in its undistorted state and the apocalyptic law, the written law of God. When the natural law becomes corrupt and distorted, then God intervenes with the written law to bring men back to the law of nature. So the law of Moses is the restoration of God's natural law written in the hearts of all men. St. John of Christum says that it is not to our credit that God had to give us a written law. This is because we violated the law of our conscience, the natural law of God. There are hymns of our church pertaining to this, and they say, Christ came into the world so we can move from being against nature to a life according to nature. According to nature is not subjective or undefined. I am most natural when I try to become like my creator. When I develop the characteristics of my prototype, which is Christ, then I become a natural man, the way God has created me. The natural man of this age is not harmonious at all with nature. He's ready to destroy nature. He's killing the environment precisely because he's at enmity with himself, God, and the environment. The Antichrist will be the man of lawlessness. He will intend to change times and law. He will destroy the natural law and he will destroy the faith of the people once called Christians or Muslims or Jews. But he will not succeed to destroy the faith of the sincere and pious Christians. Many of them will oppose him, just like the three youths in Babylon and Susanna and the Maccabees and our 11 million martyrs during the Roman Empire. The brave souls will stand up to him, strengthened by the power of God. And I close the words of Saint Cyril. I tend to believe that the martyrs of the end times, the final three and a half years of the Antichrist, will be the greatest martyrs of all ages. The past martyrs fought against mere servants of Satan, but the final martyrs will do battle with the Antichrist and Satan face to face. And we close with verse 26, but the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. 
His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Our Holy Father, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, taught us during our last session that Jesus Christ, who is now in heaven and sitting at the right hand of the Father, shall come again, not from earth, but from heaven. And I say not from earth, because there are many antichrists to come at this time from earth. For already, as you have seen, many have begun to say, I am the Christ, and the abomination of desolation of Daniel is yet to come, assuming to himself the title of Christ. All this from 350 AD, back in Jerusalem, when St. Cyril was teaching his catechumens. Daniel refers to this abomination of desolation in his great prophecy in chapters 927, chapters 11, chapter 11, verse 31, and chapter 12, verse 11. It is worth noting that our Lord Jesus Christ used the prophetic book of Daniel at least two times. The first in Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 to 16. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains, and so on. He used the book of Daniel for a second time during his interrogation in front of Caiaphas, the archpriest, to show his coming from heaven and his return in Matthew 26, verse 64. But I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. But what is this abomination of desolation or the abomination that makes desolate by some other accounts? In chapter 9, verse 27 of Daniel, we read in the LXX, And on the temple or in the holy place shall be the abomination of desolation. What is the meaning of this desolation or abominable desolations as we read in Daniel and in some of the evangelists where the Lord says Jerusalem will become desolate. Not desolate from people necessarily, although that can also be true, but desolate from the grace of God. A place where the grace of true God is replaced by falsehood by demonic spirits. Vdeligma in Greek means something unbearably detestable, like a detestable stench, and it specifically ref refers to idolatry and the presence of demonic spirits. As baptized Christians, we are temples of the Holy Spirit, and the more we purify our temple, an actual fragrance can exude from our bodies. We have many examples of very holy monks and holy elders and priests who hardly ever washed, yet they had a very pleasant fragrance, a fragrance like myrrh even. On the contrary, when someone becomes desolate from the grace of his or her baptism, they can become very odious, especially to very holy people. Years ago, a young Greek scientist who chose evolution over creation, went to Mount Athos and began to discuss his ideas with Elder Ephraim of Katunakia. The elder sat there and listened for a while. And then he said to his visitor, Listen, my son, I am not an educated man. You may want to go to Elder George Capsanis of Grigoriu, who was a university professor, and he will serve you much better than I. But now I want you to leave because from the moment you enter this room, there's so much stench coming out of your body that I can hardly breathe. I'm suffocating. Two weeks later, 
this young man returned and fell at the feet of the elder, thanking him for his truthfulness. This young man repented and brought the fragrance of Christ back into his life. So Daniel here in his ninth chapter is saying that the abomination of desolations will be upon the temple. And in chapter 12, and from a time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the allowance of the abomination of desolation, there shall be 1290 days. So God will allow this. The abomination of desolation will be permitted by God to occupy the temple for three and a half years. The Lord continues in Matthew 24, 15. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Here the Lord uses cryptic language. He does not use the word temple, but veils the holy temple of Solomon with the expression holy place. This information was for the faithful only. And the use of cryptic language was used to avoid panic and possibly a confrontation with the unbelievers who would condemn him for disturbing the peace. The Lord is prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem in these sentences, and most unbelievers, including the Sanhedrin, would not be pleased with such news. So when you see the sacrilege of the temple, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. This is a very serious matter indeed. So the faithful needed to be warned without creating chaos in the city. Now imagine what would happen in your city if your local newspaper declared on its first page that tomorrow at noontime there will be an earthquake in the magnitude of 8.5 Richter. Would this not create a massive exodus from a city? with huge traffic jams and mass confusion, of course, disturbances at gas stations and so on. A responsible publication such as the city newspaper would never publish such a declaration without the consent of the governing officials. So the Lord uses cryptic language to prophesy the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, what is this abomination of desolation? As we have stated in previous lessons, the way to interpret a prophecy and Holy Scripture in general is by the method of repetition. Some prophecies refer to the first or the second coming of Christ, and these historical events can only take place but once. And there we use the straight line theory of, or method rather, of interpretation. But in other matters, a prophecy does not exhaust itself. Most of the prophecies of the Old Testament have not been totally fulfilled, but these prophecies repeat themselves. And while they are, their interpretation applied to old Israel in the Old Testament, these prophecies continue to find their fulfillment in the New Testament, in the New Israel, which is the church. This is why it is imperative that we study the Old Testament. A prophecy can be repeated once, twice, three, and even many times, numerous times. Don't let this surprise you. The Lord said to Israel, if you keep my commandments, you will consume the fruits of the earth. You will live off the fat of the land, let's say. If you do not keep my commandments, you will be consumed by the sword. Now, some people may look at this as a threat. They think that the God of the Old Testament uses fear tactics to compel his people to stay obedient. Not necessarily. The Lord is simply stating that people who do not heal themselves by the divine medicine call commandments will sooner or later become desolate from the grace of God. They will be filled with demonic passions and evil desires, which are the cause of fights, battles, wars, pestilences, and hunger. So this prophecy of the Lord repeats itself every century and will continue till the end of times. The abomination of desolation spoken by prophet Daniel in the 
6th century BC is such a prophecy. Each realization will be a copy of the next one. This is a most valuable key if we want to know how to unlock the Word of God and the and to enhance our understanding. This prophecy of Daniel will have its first realization after 430 years, and this will become the type or the typos of a second realization at 70 AD. The second realization will be the typology of a third realization. Amazingly enough, the prophetic eye of Daniel captures all three realizations of this abominable desolation of the Temple of Solomon. The first realization took place around 168 BC with Antiochus IV the Epiphanes, one of the descendants of Alexander the Great. Daniel describes Antiochus as type of the Antichrist in chapters 10 and 11 and 12. But the prophecy goes beyond Antiochus and captures the very end times, the end of the end, with the ultimate Antichrist, the one that many people are expecting in our days. In his ninth chapter, Daniel spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem in the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And after the 62 weeks, the anointed one, the Christ, shall be cut off. The Messiah, the King of the Jews, will be condemned to death by Pontius Pilate, who could not stand up to the treachery of the murderer Sanhedrin. He knew that they handed him over because of envy and malice. Yes, he washed his hands, but this does not exonerate him. Pilate was a religious man, but not a man of faith. His wife Procla, on the other hand, was a faithful woman, and she warned her husband repeatedly, have nothing to do with this innocent man. Now, a religious man cannot sacrifice his status, his wealth, his position, his well-being for the truth. Only a faithful person will sacrifice. He cannot live with himself without the truth. Procla became a saint of our church. While her pitiful husband's name is read daily in our creed and held in contempt throughout the centuries because our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified under Pontius Pilate. The Jews, in order to absolve Pilate, uttered a horrendous utterance that forever sends chills on the spine of every God-fearing human being. His blood on our heads and our children's head. His blood on our heads and our children's heads. And since they asked for this so emphatically, the Lord does not want to disappoint them. And we read in Daniel 9.26 about the second realization of the desolation, also referred to by Christ in Matthew 24.15. And the people of the prince who is to come, the Romans that is, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. It said, shall come with a flood. The destruction of Jerusalem was unprecedented. The blood of slain Hebrews flooded the streets. Over one million were killed, according to Josephus, the historian. Thousands were crucified. A hundred thousand were sold to slavery. Jerusalem was literally turned into a farm, with the exception of some towers of the greatest eminence. The number of slain exceeded that of the slayers. The legionaries had to clamber over heaps of dead bodies to complete the work of extermination, which they carried out with such an inexplicable mania that astonished even Titus. Titus himself, who had never witnessed such a killing mania in his troops, was very troubled by this. And that's why he refused to accept a wreath of victory, saying that this victory did not come through his hands, through his own efforts. He had merely served as an instrument of God's wrath. During the second realization and before the destruction of the temple, 
the Romans placed their flags and insignia inside the temple, along with a statue of the Roman emperor. So the first sacrilege took place with Antiochus the Epiphanes, who reportedly sacrificed swine upon the altar. The second sacrilege actualized at 70 AD by the Roman legions of Titus. Much insight to the first abomination can be found in the books of 1st Maccabees, 2nd Mac Maccabees, and 4th uh, Maccabees. I will now read a few verses from the first chapter of 1st Maccabees. Then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and that each should give up his customs. All the Gentiles accepted the command of the king. Many even from Israel gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. And the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. He directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in a sanctuary, to profane Sabbaths and feasts, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. They were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane, so that they should forget the law and change all the ordinances. And whoever does not obey the command of the king shall die. They also built altars in the surrounding cities of Judah and burned incense at the doors of their houses and in the streets. The books of the law which they found they tore to pieces and burned with fire. Where the book of the covenant was found in the possession of anyone, or if anyone adhered to the law, the decree of the king condemned him to death. According to the decree, they put to death the women who had their children circumcised and their families and those who circumcised them. But many in Israel stood firm and were resolved in their hearts not to eat unclean food. They chose to die rather than to be defiled by food or to profane the holy covenant. And in 2 Maccabees chapter 6, we read, Not long after this, the king sent an Athenian senator to compel the Jews to forsake the laws of their fathers and cease to live by the laws of God and also to pollute the temple in Jerusalem and call it the temple of Olympian Zeus. So we can see that the temple was profaned by the abomination of the desolation, and that would be the Olympian Zeus on the altar of the temple, and also by polluting the temple with swine and unclean animals. In the books of Maccabees, we find glorious types of martyrs, martyrdom not unlike Christian martyrdom of a few centuries later. The martyrdom of the seven brothers, their teacher Eleazar, and their mother Solomonie is a prefigurement of the martyrdom of the end times. Antiochus is a precursor of the Antichrist, and these martyrs are the typology of the Christian martyrs during the reign of the Antichrist. On the monthly celebration of the king's birthday, the Jews were taken under bitter constraint to partake in the sacrifices of Dionysus, the god of wine, and eat swine's flesh. Eleazar, the scribe, was 90 years old and highly esteemed by some of the acquaintances of the Greek king. He advised him to go bring his own kosher meat. He would simply pretend that he was eating the meat of the Gentiles, but in reality he would be eating kosher meat. Now let's listen to his saintly response. Such pretense is not worthy of our time of life, lest many of the young suppose that Eliezer in his 90th year has gone over to an alien religion, and through this pretense, for the sake of living a brief moment longer, they should be led astray because of me, while I defile and disgrace my old age. For even if for the present I should avoid the punishment of men, I shall not escape the hands of the Almighty. Therefore, 
by manfully giving up my life now, I will show myself worthy of my old age and leave to the young a noble example how to die a good death willingly and nobly for the revered and holy laws. And blessed Eliezer did just that. His martyrdom galvanized the resolve of the seven brothers who were tortured in the most inhumane manner, but none of them betrayed their faith. Their story becomes the central topic of Four Maccabees, a glorious account of pre-Christian martyrdom. Antiochus then becomes the first realization of the abomination of desolation of Daniel. And this first realization will serve as type of the second realization, which took place at 70 AD. The Lord said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets, you've refused the messengers of God, you chose evil over good, and now your place will become desolate. The holy temple will, will not only be destroyed, but it will be desolate, desolate from the grace of God. The conscience of the scribes and the Pharisees was more dead than the tombstone of Lazarus. They knew about the resurrection of Lazarus. They knew about the resurrection of many dead people in Jerusalem during the crucifixion. They saw the curtain of the temple rent in two from top to bottom. They were told about the resurrection of Christ by the guards, but the lawless Jews did not want to reconsider. They were that fruitless fig tree that would never produce any fruit, ever. And the Lord rested the ground underneath it. He destroyed it at once to free the ground from its presence. So the second realization of the abomination of desolation would tarry another 37 years from the prophecy of the Lord. Now, this was necessary for the Christian community of Jerusalem to become established and for the apostles to spread the gospel to the nearby communities and nations and to the end of the earth. Thomas took the gospel to India, Mark in Alexandria, in Egypt, St. Paul to Greece and all the way to Rome, Cyprus and Antioch, Byzantium, and the five ancient patriarchates were already established. And then the destruction of Jerusalem took place. Of course, they were not called patriarchates back then. This honor was bestowed upon them much later. Now, the Lord included a cryptogram in his repetition of the prophecy of Daniel for the sake of the church of Jerusalem. It would not be fair to punish the believers along with the unbelievers. Those who read the gospel, the Christians, that is, they were forewarned. When you see the armies of the enemy surround Jerusalem, immediately exit the city. So when you see the desolation sacrilege spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on a housetop not go down to take with him what is in the house, and so on. And all this for the brevity of time. It is commonly known that people in the east dry their grapes on the rooftop. The roofs are flat, generally, and people dry their sesame, their figs, their almonds on top of the roof since it hardly ever rains during the harvest months. I remember doing this in my very early years on the island of Kos. Now, now this prophecy was repeated but, and refreshed in the minds of the Christians by the leaders of Jerusalem. If you see the Roman army surround the city, if you see them coming from the country, advancing toward Jerusalem, do not waste a second. Don't even enter your home. Run for your life. Forget your wallet, your money, or extra clothing. Run. Get off the roof and run toward the gates of the walls. Historians who recorded these events noticed people running two different directions. All Christians were rushing out of the city, and all Jews were running into the city to be protected by the walls. The Lord also gave the sign of Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Keep fresh in your minds what happened to the wife of Lot. She turned back to take a final look and she turned to stone. Don't do that. 
Don't look back because you will not be saved. This was key to the salvation of all the Christians who lived in Jerusalem around 70 AD. All this was said for the second realization of the prophecy of Daniel about the destruction of Jerusalem by Christ himself. So the Christians were forewarned. They believed the cryptic language of the Lord and they were spared. Now, will there be such cryptic language, such a clear warning for the Christians of our days? If we happen to live during the horrible years of the final Antichrist and the final realization of the prophecy of Daniel, what could this be? Well, this is not very easy to say, but we believe that Christians will be informed. The holy bishops of our church and our holy people will be forewarned and they will in turn guide the faithful. The book of the Revelation tells us that we will flee into the desert. The Lord said to those in Jerusalem, run to the mountains. Jerusalem is a typology, a type of the church of the end times. So how must the Christians of the end times act? They must live by the admonition of the Lord, remember Lot's wife. In other words, don't say I have real estate, investments, unfinished business, how can I go anywhere? Forget these things because you will not only lose all these things, but you but you will also lose your soul as well. If you try to keep all these things, you will compromise and rationalize the acceptance of the mark, which is already being developed and used voluntarily by some departments of the world governments. Only yesterday I received an email by my good friend ML about a scientist openly claiming that human microchip implants will become not so optional in the future. Technologies designed specifically to track and monitor human beings have been in development for two decades, according to this article. Of course, we don't want to believe this. Of course, people are not going to agree with this kind of thing, you may say. Yet, you may not be aware that every one of our cell phones after year 2000 has one of those RFID chips inside of it. This chip can be activated by the government at any time, at will, to act as a microphone. Now, try to take the cell phone from one of your teenagers. You can take their food away, you can possibly take their bed away, take whatever you want from them, but do not touch their cell phone. A similar craze characterized the people of the generation of Noah and the generation of Lot. People sneered at Noah and Lot. Only a few believe Lot's wife didn't make it. Now, I'm not 100% sure, but this seems to be the code for the days of the Antichrist. Do not look back. Remember Lot's wife. In other words, abandon the internet, the cell phone, and all your possessions and exit Babylon because she will go down with the Antichrist. But how am I going to live in the desert, in the hills, in the mountains? Well, the Bible assures us that God will feed the woman, the church, and her children for three and a half years in the desert, just like he fed his people in the desert for 40 years with manna. Who could ever believe back then that food would fall from heaven? And yet it happened. For 40 years, this is precisely the reason why these historical typologies were recorded so we cannot question God's ability to feed us for three and a half years. God promises this for his people, the people who trust him. So leave when that time comes. Do not become entangled in the web of the Antichrist. Many ask, well, how should we secure our money during that time? Should we change it to gold or silver? No, my friends, remember Lot's wife. Remember the Christians of Jerusalem at 70 AD. Leave as you are and trust your existence in the hands of God, who promised that I will never leave you and never forsake you. So let's abandon the idols of this age so we can enthrone the God of Daniel in our hearts. Because no one knows how to save like the God of Daniel does. So Christ warned the Christians of his generation about the second phase of the abomination of desolation. But his prophecy also extends to the third phase of the abomination of desolation, being that the destruction of Jerusalem is a historical prefigurement or a type of the end times and the end of history. Many academic theologians have difficulty with this, 
and they simply limit the coming of the Antichrist to some past years, like with Nero and some of the forerunners of the Antichrist. They assert that the Antichrist already came in a person of the Roman emperors, or they believe that he will not be a real person. He may be the age of the computer, and God knows what else. Do not listen to this. Christ himself clearly told the Jews in John 5, 43, I came in my father's name and you rejected me. You did not accept me. When another one comes in his own name, him you will receive. And thank God for the Thessalonians, we have the undeniable testimony of St. Paul about the man of lawlessness. The man of lawlessness who will appear once again to desecrate the Holy Temple. The same place, Temple of Solomon. The Jews have been writing and speaking about the building of the Temple of Solomon for years now. We have seen full-page ads in the New York Times. It is not a secret matter that this is a major concern of the contemporary rabbis and temple enthusiasts. Supposedly, they already have the stones cut, so it is only a matter of time that the temple will be built. But this time, it will not be desecrated by the statue of the Olympian Zeus or the statue of a Roman emperor, but the one prophesied by the Lord. You rejected me. When the other one comes, you will receive him. And St. Paul expands on this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And then the man of lawlessness will be revealed the son of perdition, who exalts himself. So we are not dealing with a ghost here or some innominate system or some idea or the incarnation of Satan. Angels and demons do not have that option. They cannot incarnate as we have repeatedly stated. The man of lawlessness is exactly that, 100% human, a man, the son of perdition, who opposes God and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. His pride will not be the common passion of pride that assaults almost every one of us. His pride will be unmatched. His delusion will be so great that he will believe himself to be above every so-called God or object of worship. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. St. Paul says, and then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Please hold on to this. He will be revealed. Revealed means he will appear very suddenly. We reveal something that has been hidden, presented for the first time. Famous sculptors cover their statues or their works of art with a cloth. They schedule the day of Apocalypteria, the day of revelation, to reveal their years of work to the public. So when St. Paul says that he will be revealed, this means that the Antichrist will not be a public figure. He will be an unknown. Based on this, we can never agree with some voices today who often claim that the Antichrist is born or he was born in the 60s or the 70s or the 80s. Revealed means that his past will remain sealed by him who now restrains. He will appear when the one who restrains is out of the way. Now, this is a very hazy verse with many interpretations. One of the most prominent interpretations has to do with the will and the plan of God. In other words, the Antichrist is not in charge here. You may think he is, but he will be revealed only when the Spirit of God allows him to. That's why we will never agree with our contemporaries who are in a hurry to place dates and times on these events. We need to reject all these suggestions. If the disciples were denied this knowledge, Daniel and the rest of the prophets were denied this knowledge of the time of the end. It only means that we will know who the Antichrist is only when he appears and never before. The revelation of the Antichrist means just that. He will appear suddenly as the most loyal human servant of Satan. He will be puffed up with extreme pride, demonic pride. And in his Luciferian drunkenness, he will exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship. He will consider himself 
the God of the universe, and obviously above his patron, the devil. Now, other leaders and kings on the planet often became the objects of worship. As we saw in the book of Daniel, the Roman emperors were divine figures to some, but they never claimed sovereignty. Confucius and Buddha never claimed divinity. They were deified by their followers and many others. But the men of lawlessness will dare to say that I am above Buddha, above Confucius, above Muhammad, above Jesus Christ, and above Yahweh, who created the heavens and the earth. I am above all these. Needless to say, not a single deified human ever spoke with such audacity. Like the devil, he will attempt to place his throne above the throne of the Most High, according to Isaiah. That's why these two beasts share the same characteristics in the book of the Revelation. The one beast comes from the air and the other from the ocean or the bottomless pit. These are two different entities, two different persons. The devil is spirit and the Antichrist is a man born of a woman. The Antichrist will rebuild the temple of Solomon. He will enter it and assume upon himself the title of the only God. Again, many emperors have claimed divinity to unify nations, to unify their empire and different peoples for political gain, but none of them dare to claim that I am the creator of the heaven and the earth. Not one. The Antichrist will take his seat in the temple of God to proclaim himself to be God, and he will try to prove himself as God. St. Cyril, in his catechism, in his catechisms, asks, what temple? A Christian temple of the resurrection? That's where he was teaching his catechumens. God forbid, no, he will sit at the temple of Solomon after he rebuilds it, proclaiming and proving himself to be God. He will display all kinds of supernatural delusions and false miracles works of demons, that is, to convince the populace. So he will be the ultimate abomination of desolation in history and the third and final realization of the prophecy of Daniel. The two have already materialized during 168 BC with Antiochus the Epiphanes and 70 AD with the Romans. And the third one is awaited. We spoke about various signs of the end times, but this is a major sign. And if you ever wake up one day and see in the news that the Jews are completing the Temple of Solomon, ask yourselves, who is building this temple and why? Let's keep in mind that the Temple of Solomon cannot function as a temple of the Jewish faith, regardless of what people may think. There is no priesthood in Judaism. The tribe of uh, Levi is not existent. The priesthood was transferred by Christ, the archpriest, to the New Testament. You are a priest, not according to the order of Aaron, but according to Melchizedek. Jesus Christ is the archpriest who transferred his covenant to the New Testament church. Now, do you believe that it's so difficult for the Zionists to build their temple? Not at all. They have all the human power necessary to do it. No doubt, but they are restrained by him who now restrains. And who is he who now restrains? Otutheu Oros, according to St. Andrew, the overall plan of God. None of these things supersede the universal plan of God. God rules the nations. He sets their boundaries and the final word belongs to him. Let's never forget this. This knowledge will keep us from developing unnecessary phobias and anxieties, which will abound in the heart of those unprepared. And St. Paul gives us a most valuable account on this in his second chapter once again in Thessalonians. And I will close with reading a few of these verses. And then the lawless one will be revealed and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by his appearing and his coming. The coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan will be with all power and with pretended signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are to perish because they refuse to love the truth and so 
be saved. Therefore, God sends upon them a strong delusion to make them believe what is false, so that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Here it seems like God is causing all this, but this is really, again, an anthropomorphic expression. This is what the people wanted. They chose pleasure over the law of God. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. During the last session, we briefly looked at the verses referring to the fourth beast in the seventh chapter of Daniel. The fourth beast represents the Roman Empire and its God opposing emperors. The ten kings are representatives of all the future Roman type governments and world leaders who will take an inimical stand against the church and the gospel. These are all precursors or forerunners of the Antichrist who serve the mystery of lawlessness. Herod, Nero, Maximinus, Julian, the apostate, the leaders of atheism, communism, and Marxism who fought the church are also forerunners and in the service of the Antichrist. The reign of the final Antichrist will coincide with the end of history, and irrespective of how horrible that time may be, Daniel tells us that it will only last 1260 days or approximately three and a half years. Time will be shortened for the sake of the elect. The expectation of the glorious second appearance of Christ in three and a half years will give the faithful the the stamina, courage, and the patience to overcome those unprecedented days of distress. Towards the end of his seventh chapter, Daniel sees the judgment of the Antichrist. In 726, we read, But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it. After three and a half years, and at the second and after the second coming of Christ, the devil and the Antichrist will be thrown into the lake of fire along with their servants who supported the mystery of lawlessness. For Christians who stay vigilant and informed, this time could be most exciting. They will practice total detachment by being fully aware of the saving words of the Lord. Remember Lot's wife. This will be the key to survival during the dark days of the Antichrist. Run for your soul. If you stay behind to get married or to complete your college education or to manage your real estate holdings, you will not be able to do so without compromising your faith and worshiping the Antichrist. There's much more detail on this in our Apocalypse Lecture Series, numbered 50 to 60, available on our St. Nicodemus website. God, in his great compassion, cut those days short. Three and a half years is less than a four-year military service or the four years needed for our young people to receive their college degree. Those years, the vigilant Christians will do whatever it takes to make sure that they graduate from this earthly, mundane state to the portals of the kingdom of God. If we educate ourselves along these lines, then we will not be paralyzed by phobias or anxieties, but we will be bursting with joy because In just a few months, we will become eternally blissful in the company of the saints and the angels and forever beholding the infinite blessedness of the face of Christ. On the other hand, Christians who cannot go for more than a day without refrigeration, without a pre-course meal, without Facebook, big screen TV, without the internet, Skype, and Twitter, they will be caught in the web of the Antichrist to the eternal detriment of their souls and bodies. But let's now return to Daniel's account 
of the day of judgment in chapter 7 verse 9. I was watching till the thrones were put in place and the ancient of the days was seated. I am translating from the Septuagint which says the thrones, a specific number of thrones. As we will explain promptly, the ancient of days, the oldest entity in existence, refers to God. The ancient of days is an anthropomorphic image purposed to explain that which is inconceivable or indescribable because God is timeless, beginningless, immaterial, does not age. He always is the immutable. But our, but our church uses images to capture part of the great, part of this great mystery. So God is called the ancient of days. And in some 19th century icons, he's portrayed with white hair, although this particular icon did not emerge from the East. The more dogmatic icons of the Holy Trinity are the ones with the three angels depicting the hospitality of Abraham in Genesis. The image with the white hair wants to show that God exists before anything else. So God seated on his throne and around him there were other thrones and these thrones belong to the royal priesthood. Christ made us kings and priests unto God his Father, as we read in Revelation 1.6. In a Gospel of Judgment, in Matthew 25.34, the king said, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This was the primary will of God. The perfect will of God was for all creation to share in the kingdom of God from the foundation of the world. So the dead in Christ are not in the kingdom of God, but in paradise. And there's not much difference, of course. The only difference is that the soul, their souls are under the altar, which means that they are awaiting to reunite with their bodies at the general resurrection. And then they will sit on the thrones. The throne is the symbol of rest and the symbol of royal authority. Now, God rests on his saints. The souls will be at their ultimate rest when they reunite with their bodies, thus having constant and uninterrupted communion with the uncreated light of God and the source of all blessedness, the ever sweet face of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, hell was not set from the foundation of the world. This is why God is not responsible for our hell. God does not take part in evil, although he will not go against people's free will. Satan is not evil. Satan is all good in his nature, but he has become the epitome of evil by choice. Satan is physicalos, progeresicacos. He is good in his nature, but very nasty in his disposition. So God's primary will was a kingdom for all his creation. But the devil and his followers, demons and people, refused the open arms of the Father. In a final analysis, the devil, the demons, and the victims of apostasy all through the ages refused the love of the Father out of their own choice. The imagery in a gospel of judgment and in a hymnography is expressed in such a way to cater to all states, to all spiritual states of Christians. And some of these images are very helpful to the simple souls, according to St. Basil. These austere images are beneficial to the Christians who are at the level of the slave and not a son. For most Christians, fear is a valuable tool until they mature. So the image of the river of fire, the fire that never ends, Gehenna, all these images want to show the excruciating real pain of the soul that separates itself from God. But these are not real fires. There's no such thing as a purgatorial fire. The fiery river of Daniel is the uncreated light of God and the eternal blessedness for all those who prepare themselves to commune with this uncreated light. In other words, those who purified their hearts. 
Now the same uncreated light of God will burn and sizzle all of those who turned their back on God and became children of wrath and children of darkness. Those who condemn God to death will now be self-condemned to eternal suffering and the gnashing of teeth by the burning quality of the very same uncreated light. I used an example years ago with a summer sun. For those who condition themselves with suntan lotions and a daily exposure to the summer sun, the beach becomes very delightful. But to the person who never looked at the sun, someone who spent 30 years in a dungeon, in a prison, if they now lay on the beach with a bathing suit, they will certainly feel excruciating pain. They will suffer tremendously from the same sun. So God does not change on the day of judgment. He is immutable. He does not stop being the God of love. He does not all of a sudden become this ruthless judge as portrayed by the erroneous religious art of the Sistine Chapel, where Christ seems to be sadistically enjoying the catapulting of sinners in hell. These are human misconceptions. Again, these images in the Bible cater to all different spiritual levels, those who draw near to God by fear, faith, or love. Now, if the fear of hell will keep us from becoming a criminal, well, it is not the perfect way, but it is acceptable to God. But I believe we can all see the orthodox understanding of hell and who really causes it in the last verses of the parable of the prodigal son. The father in a parable prepared a royal supper fit for royalty. He killed the most choice calf, fed by wheat only, meaning a sacrificial calf. Love, joy, and blessedness reigned in the living room of the father who reunited with his dead son, who was reconnected to the father by the tears of repentance and humility. Now, the oldest son, the one who expected his father to be righteous, harsh, and austere with a younger riffraff of a son, became very angry, enraged, bitter, and unyielding. He refused to enter into the joy of his Lord and Father because he failed to develop any of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, any of the virtues, any of the virtues of the Father, forbearance, mercy, forgiveness, sympathy, love. And the Father pleaded with him, but the older son exited the paradise of his father because he no longer felt at home. His brother became his hell. This was also the outcry of the French atheist existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre. My neighbor is my hell. The man next to me is my hell. So in the final analysis, we will condemn ourselves by the position we now hold towards the gospel and the person of Jesus Christ. And we continue now with the ancient of the days of Daniel. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery river issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. These are all symbolic numbers to show the innumerable number of holy angels. The court was seated and the books were open. The court was now in session and the files of the accused were open. These verses of Daniel have inspired all our hymnographers and melodists over the centuries. Every other hymn of the Vespers and Matins of Meat Fair Sunday are based on the river of fire and on the opening of these heavenly books stated in Daniel. So here Daniel is seeing the judgment seat of Christ and the lot of the greatest of all sinners, the beast, who spoke the greatest blasphemies. I watched until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. The book of the Revelation says that the beast was thrown alive in the ever-burning lake with fire and sulfur, eternal hell, that is, which is the second death. 
As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominions taken away. Verse 13, I was watching in a night visions and behold one like a son of men coming with the clouds of heaven and it came to the ancient of days. This someone likened to the son of men came all the way to the throne of the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. In other words, he was escorted there by the holy angels. St. Cyril of Jerusalem writes, The Son of Man is coming towards the Father. The title Son of Man was chosen by Christ himself in the New Testament, and it is used in very many instances in the Gospels, especially in the three synoptic writers. We can see now that Christ did not come up with that title in those days, but he used the pre-existing title from the book of Daniel and other areas of the Old Testament. This, like a son of man, does not question the human nature, but beautifully captures the two natures of Christ. He's a man, but not merely a man. One, like a son of man, is equivalent to the title, the God-man. Being the pre-eternal God, he now appears as a son of man. The precision of Daniel's expression here is astounding. I said, Daniel, but no man can be so perfectly precise. It is the work of the pre-eternal Holy Spirit working through the pure heart of Daniel. Christ embraced this title for a number of reasons. The first and foremost being that he, being God, truly became man through the unhewn mountain of Daniel called Theotokos. He lowered himself. He emptied himself, he lowered the heavens, he brought heaven on earth by his incarnation, he lowered himself to our earthly existence out of his immense love and the works of his hands, the very people that he came to save condemned him to death. They crucified the Lord of glory. And now the Son of Man will come to judge. Behold, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will lament on account of him. And that's in Revelation 1.7. People will lament, saying, Look, he's Jesus of Nazareth, the one we ridiculed, the one we verbally abused all through history, the one we dishonored and blasphemed and underestimated. We are all doomed. We made a huge mistake. Yes, he's coming as a judge, and there's no other name under heaven given among men by which they are saved. What name is there above heaven? The name of God, of course. Under heaven, the only name is the name of the Son of Man, the God-Man, Jesus Christ. He's under heaven because he incarnated. He took our human nature, which once belonged under the heaven. He's coming towards the Father on the clouds of the heavens. There are two movements in this very same verse of Daniel that we would miss in the absence of the work of our Holy Fathers. Their input is invaluable. In this very verse, St. Cyril of Jerusalem sees the first coming, and more specifically, the ascension of Christ. The word and wisdom of God the discarnate Logos who took his body from the most holy Theotokos in a hypostatic union, the union of the two natures, he now raises this body, which is always united with the divine nature, to the Father. So the first movement here is the ascension of the Son of Man, the god Man, who ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of the Father. St. Stephen saw him standing because our Lord needed to show young Stephen that here I am with you, I'm on my way to help you. But in reality, he sits at the right hand of the Father. In other words, he rests on a throne, the throne that Daniel saw in his vision. He assumed our human nature, deified it, and raised it all the way to the throne of God, and he sits next to God the Father with our human nature. He opened the path for every believer who becomes co-planted and one in blood with his body. 
The dead in Christ in Thessalonians refers to the body of the believers who slept in Christ, who died, and their soul is already in paradise. But their body will resurrect with the sound of the last trumpet, and the soul will reconnect with the body and meet the Lord in the air to be enthroned in the kingdom of God. And listen to the glory of the victors in Revelation 3.21. To the one who becomes victorious, to the one who overcomes the temptations of this life, I will grant him a throne next to mine as I became victorious and sat with my father on his throne. How often do we forget this great truth? Christ did not come to save us and throw us at some cozy corner in paradise, as many people may think. Those who enter will be given a throne next to Christ. This was the prayer of Christ to his father. The glory that you gave me, I will give to them. Not only the 12 disciples, but all his faithful followers all through the centuries. So the Son of Man is coming towards the Father. But God does not need to come and go. We need to go from point A to point B. But God does not need to move. He's everywhere and fillest all things. He's the immovable mover. He makes everything else move, but he does not need to move. So when Daniel says the Son of Man is coming through the clouds towards the Father, he's seen the incarnation, the human nature of God, the Logos. The Logos is everywhere. But now the Logos, the Word becomes flesh and opens the path for the human nature. He opens and prepares the path that we will follow during the resurrection of the dead. This would be impossible for us if Christ had not opened this path with his ascension. Ignorant humanity is still trying to open a path to heaven, to the material heaven, which is nothing but the footstool of spiritual heaven. Billions or trillions of dollars have evaporated in the last several decades in the futile attempt of our leading nations to travel to the stars, to a few nearby planets, money that could have easily fed all the hungry people of humanity. These are futile attempts of people who never believe in the great news of the gospel. And the great news is that heaven has been opened. There's no need to waste space shuttle fuel and jet fuel. The road is open and there's an easy pass. The easy pass is the acceptance of the salvation provided by the crucified, resurrected, and ascended Lord Jesus Christ. His ascension has been seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses, as many as 500, St. Paul says, in the Acts of the Apostles, 40 days after the resurrection. And shortly after that, it was seen by St. Stephen. And shortly after that, by St. Paul, who was present at the stoning of St. Stephen, on the road to Damascus, St. Paul saw the resurrected and ascended Lord in his celestial glory. He saw the human nature in the uncreated light. St. Stephen saw the glorified, deified human nature, since no one can see God and live. And they brought him near before him. Of course, the angels who were amazed by the incarnation, they are the royal guards, the glorious escorts of the master of the universe. The angels were invisible during the ascension because the scene with myriads of angels would be overwhelming for the eyes of the eyewitnesses, especially disciples, who needed to have a final last image of Christ ascending in slow motion and blessing them. But the hymns of our ascension service are quite profound. And I quote from one of the Vesper hymns. While you were ascending, O Christ, the powers of the heavens, the angels, were saying, He's the mighty and all-powerful. He's the invincible in battle. He truly is the king of glory. And why is his raiment red? Why the red garments? This He's coming from Bosor. Bosor may have been a place known for red dye, perhaps. This red belongs to the human nature. This red in our icons is symbolic of his most holy precious blood that stained his body and fell on the skull of Adam, the blood that saved humanity. And in Psalm 23, 
we have the prophetic words of King David. Lift up your gates, O ye archons. Sounds like archangels to me. Be lifted up, ye everlasting gates. What are these everlasting gates? The doors of paradise that once closed and were guarded by a revolving flaming sword. This is symbolic language indicating the impossibility of the fallen man to bust through the gates of paradise. Paradise would be eternally shut for humanity. Not the earthly paradise, of course, because it was filled with thorns and thistles like the rest of the earth, but the heavenly paradise, the kingdom of God. The flaming sword guarding the eternal gates refers to the impossibility of men to enter paradise and consists of three things. The mortality of men, death enter into the world. The material nature of men, we cannot make it outside of this universe. And the sinfulness of men because heaven cannot accept anything sinful. So these three consist of the everlasting shut doors that kept men in exile. That's why now the holy angels are startled when they see one like a son of man bust through the gates. Who is this, they ask. Perhaps the lower angels asked the archangels, at least in the minds of the hymnographers. Who is this who broke the eternal gates for the first time? And the archangels who witnessed the resurrection answer, the king of glory, the one mighty and powerful in battle, the one who destroyed the bonds of Hades. Now, how did Christ do all this? He took our human nature without sin. Christ could not sin because the human nature was assumed from the Theotokos without the ancestor of sin. When she said, yes, let it be done to me according to your will, the Holy Spirit instantly cleansed the Theotokos from every stain of the ancestor of sin. And immediately after that, the Logos, the Word of God, fashioned his own impersonal human nature from the pure blood of the Theotokos. How much do we owe to our most holy Theotokos? She gave us Christ, and Christ gave us the church, his body. And all of us who become members of his body can use his passport to break through these doors. So Christ took a material body and he defied it. He died voluntarily and conquered death by death as we sing during Pascha and for 40 days after that. And now the angels are amazed at this awesome cosmohistorical event. Someone from earth with human nature is heaven bound and the archangels instruct the lower angels open the gates for the king of glory is coming towards the father. Such beautiful theology, which needs to be taught to all of our teenagers. Theology that fills the voids of today's despondent men. Eternal theology. When we grasp all these truths, then we can easily overcome all our existential challenges. The lack of the experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ the ignorance of these eternal truths regarding the work of our Savior leaves people dry, despondent, empty, unable to cope with the eternal questions. Who am I and why do I exist? What is this life all about? What's the reason for all this pain, suffering, and untimely death? The absence of the orthodox perspective to all these leave today's men exposed to dangerous substitutes of paradise, such as drugs, alcohol, painkillers, and crime, and even suicide, which often seems much more merciful than the daily torture of a fruitless and aimless existence in a loveless society. Our faith is backed by facts and not some philosophical theories. The ascension of Christ is prophesied nearly six centuries before the fact. His birth 
baptism, healing ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, have been the preoccupation of all the prophets for centuries. Prophecy of the Old Testament solidifies and cements the historical facts of the New Testament and proves the solidity and truth of our faith. So the Son of Man came to the Father. This was the first movement, his ascension. And now the Son of Man is ready for the second movement, his return, when he shall come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Here Daniel sees both movements as one, being that the calendar ceases in the heavenly realm. Calendars and time is of this earthly age. We read in the Acts of the Apostles, where Apostle Peter becomes a fisher of men and converts thousands of Jews to Christianity. Repent, therefore, and be converted. Return to God, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until a time of restoration of all things God spoke about by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. And one of these holy prophets is our beloved prophet Daniel. St. Peter sheds a little bit more light on the same event prophesied by Daniel 600 years before. Here, under the light of the New Testament, we see the presence of the three persons of the Holy Trinity at work to redeem the fallen men. Your sins may be blotted out, and a refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, the presence of the grace of the Holy Spirit. You will receive during your baptism and chrismation the grace and the seal of the Holy Spirit, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you. Who sends Christ? God the Father, who sends the Son and the Holy Spirit. This Christ you have been waiting for is Jesus, the one you crucified and who resurrected. Jesus refers to the human nature, and this human nature will now be taken into heaven to mediate for all humanity. The very presence of the human nature at the right hand of the Father becomes the mediator for all mankind. And the name of Jesus is the only door, the only path to heaven. And now Apostle Peter, full of the Holy Spirit of Pentecost, reveals these eternal truths by interpreting the prophecy of Moses. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up a prophet from your brethren. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul that does not listen to that prophet shall be exterminated from the people of God. Very strong language, you may say. St. Peter continues to preach to the Jews and to all those who erroneously believe that all religions are the same, that there's only one prophet with a capital P, who is the culmination, the expectation, and fulfillment of all prophets of the Old Testament. The God-man Jesus Christ, we spoke about the three offices of Christ in Revelations, the royal, the prophetic, and the priestly. Christ is the king of all, the archprophet of all, and the archpriest of all. In his earthly humble presence, he permitted subhuman existences like Annas and Caiaphas, Heron and Pilate to judge him and condemn him. But in his second glorious descent, he will take his throne as the judge of all. And Daniel writes in verse 26, the court sat in judgment, and the books were open, as we saw in verse 10 of the same chapter. And this court will expose the recorded actions of all people. St. Cyril will add to this, your prayers and your chanting is recorded, but your fornications and lusts are also recorded. Everything is recorded. Sins that remain unconfessed, that is, sins that we repent for, are blotted out, of course. So Christ will come back again, escorted by his myriads of angels with the clouds of heaven. 
St. Paul says in his Epistle Thessalonians, and something we repeat at every funeral service, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, the bodies of all the generations of all Christians and all those liberated by the descent of Christ in Hades will rise first. The bodies will resurrect and assume their eternal, perfect, spiritualized state. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them. Our bodies will instantly go from corruption to incorruption to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. He will be descending, and we will be ascending. All the righteous of the Old Testament, from Adam and Eve and Abel, and all those who live the life of God will become the spoils of the victorious king who entered history to claim his own. Now he takes all his loyal subjects, all his human treasure, and ascends towards the Father, and the scripture says, when the son brings everything under his submission, then he will submit to the father. In the Old Testament, in Psalm 45, the Messiah appears as a warrior preparing for battle. You are the fairest of the sons of men. Gird your sword upon your thigh, almighty one, in your glory and majesty. Your arrows are sharp. In the heart of the king's enemies, the people fall under you. Christ the king enter history to do battle with the king's enemies, the demons and the devil, to free Adam and his posterity. Having done all this, now the victorious king is entering heaven with the work of his hands, all those who became his allies against the world and the works of darkness, all those who became members of his body, all the faithful through history, and Prophet Daniel here in this chapter sees the entire history of Christ. His first coming with his ascension and now the second glorious coming and restoration of all things. He describes the two movements of Christ with amazing accuracy in only one sentence. He first saw one like a son of man coming through the clouds, first movement, and they brought him to the Father. And then the books were opened. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Now, how can you have a kingdom without loyal subjects? All this refers to the human nature of Christ, the God-man, the king of all. And now he's brought to the Father, not only with his incorrupt human nature, but brings he also brings along all saved humanity, all his trophies throughout human history, the souls and bodies of those saved, all those who were tested by the river of fire. St. Paul explains this beautifully in 1 Corinthians 3.12. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation called Christ, if anyone builds with gold, silver, precious stones, then these precious elements will shine by the fire. Those who have golden works, according to St. Cyril, this gold will shine brighter than the sun when tested through the fire of Daniel, the fire of God, the river of fire. Those who have works of straw, works without substance, fruitless works, will be totally burned by that fire. We often forget that our daily works become the building blocks of the house of our salvation. If we build with gold, silver, granite, marble, our house will survive through fire. But when we build with wood, straw, hay, then these works will be burned and vanish on the day of the Lord. Now, if any man's work is burned up, then he will suffer loss, though he himself will be preserved as through fire. This is a very difficult verse indeed, but the man who did not have works of love and of a godly quality will be found naked, just like those who suffer a total loss after a house fire. In case of a huge fire, we don't think of our belongings. We run out of the home without sleepwear. 
bereft of all of our possessions. What this means is that we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ with empty hands. If our works were self-centered and self-serving, and this is a terrible reality for a soul to discover on that very moment that their lives' activities were totally meaningless. People who spent their lives and expended all their energy on different causes only to find out that their efforts were human and totally disconnected with eternity. The mayor of our city, let's say, may work for 16 hours a day to renovate streets and large roads, promote industry. All this activity will help the livelihood of some of his citizens, no doubt. Now, if the motive behind this great effort was the betterment of human lives, the concern, love, and care for fellow citizens, and the glory of God, then this effort will stand. However, if the motive was political gain, so the mayor can advance to his next goal, which may be being the state governor or the vice president or the other president, then this is totally self-serving and disconnected from eternity. This seemingly great activity will have the substance of hay and will be considered less valuable than a glass of water given in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ has given us dozens of examples to teach us these great truths. When you fast, try not to be seen by men. So you're not praised by them because the thief called vainglory will cash in your reward. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Do not seek the praise of men. The law of love does not permit you to let the world know that you had to pay your unemployed neighbor's mortgage. These things you must do in secret. And you must also demand that your neighbor does not publicize them. Christ repeatedly warned his beneficiaries, see to it that no one finds out about this. But the fact remains that God does not want us to appear in front of him with empty hands. It is not enough to confess in complete ignorance, Father, I never harmed anyone. I tried to be good. I never bothered anyone. And even if this is the case, yes, you never bothered with anyone, that's true, but your hands are empty. Did you not hear that faith without works of love is dead? Did you not hear what happened to the lazy man who buried his talent in the ground? His works were self-serving and mundane works of hay, which cannot resist the fire of God and the fiery river of Daniel. When our life is imbued with truth and love, then our works will be imperishable to the test of God's eternal uncreated river of fire, which is the uncreated and eternal glory of God.